This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, in April 2006. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or The Preservation of Favored Races and the Struggle for Life. Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin. Introduction When on board H.M.S. Beagle, as a naturalist, I was much struck with certain facts in the distribution of the organic beings inhabiting South America, and in the geological relations of the present to the past inhabitants of that continent. These facts, as will be seen in the latter chapters of this volume, seem to throw some light on the origin of species, that mystery of mysteries, as it has been called by one of our greatest philosophers. On my return home, it occurred to me, in 1837, that something might perhaps be made out on this question by patiently accumulating and reflecting on all sorts of facts which could possibly have any bearing on it. After five years' work, I allowed myself to speculate on the subject, and drew up some short notes. These I enlarged in 1844 into a sketch of the conclusions which then seemed to me probable. From that period to the present day, I have steadily pursued the same object. I hope that I may be excused for entering on these personal details, as I give them to show that I have not been hasty in coming to a decision. My work is now, 1859, nearly finished, but as it will take me many more years to complete it, and as my health is far from strong, I have been urged to publish this abstract. I have more especially been induced to do this, as Mr. Wallace, who is now studying the natural history of the Malay archipelago, has arrived at almost exactly the same general conclusions that I have on the origin of species. In 1858 he sent me a memoir on this subject, with a request that I would forward it to Sir Charles Lyell, who sent it to the Linnean Society, and it is published in the third volume of the journal of that society. Sir C. Lyell and Dr. Hooker, who both knew of my work, the latter having read my sketch of 1844, honored me by thinking it advisable to publish, with Mr. Wallace's excellent memoir, some brief extracts from my manuscripts. This abstract, which I now publish, must necessarily be imperfect. I cannot here give references and authorities for my several statements, and I must trust to the reader reposing some confidence in my accuracy. No doubt errors may have crept in, though I hope I have always been cautious in trusting to good authorities alone. I can here give only the general conclusions at which I have arrived, with a few facts in illustration, but which I hope in most cases will suffice. No one can feel more sensible than I do of the necessity of hereafter publishing in detail all the facts, with references, on which my conclusions have been grounded, and I hope in a future work to do this for I am well aware that scarcely a single point is discussed in this volume on which facts cannot be adduced, often apparently leading to conclusions directly opposite to those at which I have arrived. A fair result can be obtained only by fully stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides of each question, and this is here impossible." I much regret that want of space prevents my having the satisfaction of acknowledging the generous assistance which I have received from very many naturalists, some of them personally unknown to me. I cannot, however, let this opportunity pass without expressing my deep obligations to Dr. Hooker, who, for the last fifteen years, 
has aided me in every possible way by his large stores of knowledge and his excellent judgment. In considering the origin of species, it is quite conceivable that a naturalist, reflecting on the mutual affinities of organic beings, on their embryological relations, their geographical distribution, geological succession, and other such facts, might come to the conclusion that species had not been independently created, but had descended, like varieties, from other species. Nevertheless, such a conclusion, even if well-founded, would be unsatisfactory, until it could be shown how the innumerable species inhabiting this world have been modified, so as to acquire that perfection of structure and co-adaptation which justly excites our admiration. Naturalists continually refer to external conditions, such as climate, food, etc., as the only possible cause of variation. In one limited sense, as we shall hereafter see, this may be true, but it is preposterous to attribute to mere external conditions the structure, for instance, of the woodpecker, with its feet, tail, beak, and tongue so admirably adapted to catch insects under the bark of trees. In the case of the mistletoe, which draws its nourishment from certain trees, which has seeds that must be transported by certain birds, and which has flowers with separate sexes absolutely requiring the agency of certain insects to bring pollen from one flower to the other, it is equally preposterous to account for the structure of this parasite, with its relations to several distinct organic beings, by the effects of external conditions, or of habit, or of the volition of the plant itself. It is therefore of the highest importance to gain a clear insight into the means of modification and co-adaptation. At the commencement of my observations, it seemed to me probable that a careful study of domesticated animals and of cultivated plants would offer the best chance of making out this obscure problem. Nor have I been disappointed. In this and in all other perplexing cases, I have invariably found that our knowledge, imperfect though it may be, of variation under domestication, afforded the best and safest clue. I may venture to express my conviction of the high value of such studies, although they have been very commonly neglected by naturalists. From these considerations I shall devote the first chapter of this abstract to variation under domestication. We shall thus see that a large amount of hereditary modification is at least possible, and what is equally or more important, we shall see how great is the power of man in accumulating by his selection successive slight variations. I will then pass on to the variability of species in a state of nature, but I shall, unfortunately, be compelled to treat this subject far too briefly, as it can be treated properly only by giving long catalogues of facts. We shall, however, be enabled to discuss what circumstances are most favorable to variation. In the next chapter, the struggle for existence among all organic beings throughout the world, which inevitably follows from the high geometrical ratio of their increase, will be considered. This is the doctrine of Malthus, applied to the whole animal and vegetable kingdoms. As many more individuals of each species are born that can possibly survive, and as, consequently, there is a frequently recurring struggle for existence, it follows that any being, if it vary, however slightly, in any manner profitable to itself, under the complex and sometimes varying conditions of life, will have a better chance of surviving, and thus be naturally selected. From the strong principle of inheritance, any selected variety will tend to propagate its new and modified form. This fundamental subject of natural selection will be treated at some length in the fourth chapter, and we shall then see how natural selection almost inevitably causes much extinction of 
of the less improved forms of life, and leads to what I have called divergence of character. In the next chapter I shall discuss the complex and little-known laws of variation. In the five succeeding chapters, the most apparent and gravest difficulties in accepting the theory will be given, namely, first, the difficulties of transitions, or how a simple being or a simple organ can be changed and perfected into a highly developed being or into an elaborately constructed organ. Secondly, the subject of instinct or the mental powers of animals. Thirdly, hybridism or the infertility of species and the fertility of varieties when intercrossed. And fourthly, the imperfection of the geological record. In the next chapter I shall consider the geological succession of organic beings throughout time. In the twelfth and thirteenth, their geographical distribution throughout space. In the fourteenth, their classification or mutual affinities, both when mature and in an embryonic condition. In the last chapter, I shall give a brief recapitulation of the whole work, and a few concluding remarks. No one ought to feel surprise at much remaining as yet unexplained in regard to the origin of species and varieties, if he make due allowance for our profound ignorance in regard to the mutual relations of the many beings which live around us. Who can explain why one species ranges widely and is very numerous, and why another allied species has a narrow range and is rare? Yet these relations are of the highest importance, for they determine the present welfare, and, as I believe, the future success and modification of every inhabitant of this world. Still less do we know of the mutual relations of the innumerable inhabitants of the world during the many past geological epochs in its history. Although much remains obscure, and will long remain obscure, I can entertain no doubt, after the most deliberate study and dispassionate judgment of which I am capable, that the view which most naturalists until recently entertained, and which I formerly entertained, namely that each species has been independently created, is erroneous. I am fully convinced that species are not immutable, but that those belonging to what are called the same genera are lineal descendants of some other and generally extinct species, in the same manner as the acknowledged varieties of any one species are the descendants of that species. Furthermore, I am convinced that natural selection has been the most important, but not the exclusive, means of modification. End of Introduction Chapter 1, Part A. Variation Under Domestication Contents of this chapter include Causes of Variability Effects of Habit and the Use and Disuse of Parts Correlated Variation Inheritance Character of Domestic Varieties Difficulty of Distinguishing between varieties and species. Origin of domestic varieties from one or more species. Domestic pigeons, their differences and origin. Principles of selection anciently followed, their effects. Methodical and unconscious selection. Unknown origin of our domestic productions. Circumstances favorable to man's power of selection. End of contents. Causes of variability. When we compare the individuals of the same variety or sub-variety of our older cultivated plants and animals, one of the first points which strikes us is that they generally differ more from each other than do the individuals of any one species or variety in a state of nature. And if we reflect on the vast diversity of the plants and animals 
which have been cultivated, and which have varied during all ages, under the most different climates and treatment, we are driven to conclude that this great variability is due to our domestic productions, having been raised under conditions of life not so uniform as, and somewhat different from, those to which the parent species had been exposed under nature. There is also some probability in the view propounded by Andrew Knight, that this variability may be partly connected with excess of food. It seems clear that organic beings must be exposed during several generations to new conditions to cause any great amount of variation, and that when the organization has once begun to vary, it generally continues varying for many generations. No case is on record of a variable organism ceasing to vary under cultivation. Our oldest cultivated plants, such as wheat, still yield new varieties. Our oldest domesticated animals are still capable of rapid improvement or modification. As far as I am able to judge, after long attending to the subject, the conditions of life appear to act in two ways, directly on the whole organization, or on certain parts alone and indirectly by affecting the reproductive system. With respect to the direct action, we must bear in mind that in every case, as Professor Weissman has lately insisted, and as I have incidentally shown in my work on variation under domestication, there are two factors— namely, the nature of the organism and the nature of the conditions. The former seems to be much the more important, for nearly similar variations sometimes arise under, as far as we can judge, dissimilar conditions. And, on the other hand, dissimilar variations arise under conditions which appear to be nearly uniform. The effects on the offspring are either definite or indefinite. They may be considered as definite when all or nearly all the offspring of individuals exposed to certain conditions during several generations are modified in the same manner. It is extremely difficult to come to any conclusion in regard to the extent of the changes which have been thus definitely induced. There can, however, be little doubt about many slight changes, such as size from the amount of food. COLOR FROM THE NATURE OF THE FOOD, THICKNESS OF THE SKIN AND HAIR FROM CLIMATE, ETC. EACH OF THE ENDLESS VARIATIONS WHICH WE SEE IN THE PLUMAGE OF OUR FOWLS MUST HAVE HAD SOME EFFICIENT CAUSE, AND IF THE SAME CAUSE WERE TO ACT UNIFORMLY DURING A LONG SERIES OF GENERATIONS ON MANY INDIVIDUALS, ALL PROBABLY WOULD BE MODIFIED IN THE SAME MANNER. Such facts as the complex and extraordinary outgrowths which variably follow from the insertion of a minute drop of poison by a gall-producing insect shows us what singular modifications might result in the case of plants from a chemical change in the nature of the sap. Indefinite variability is a much more common result of change conditions than definite variability and has probably played a more important part in the formation of our domestic races. We see indefinite variability in the endless slight peculiarities which distinguish the individuals of the same species, and which cannot be accounted for by inheritance from either parent or from some more remote ancestor. Even strongly marked differences occasionally appear in the young of the same litter, and in seedlings from the same seed capsule. At long intervals of time, out of millions of individuals reared in the same country and fed on nearly the same food, deviations of structure so strongly pronounced as to deserve to be called monstrosities arise. But monstrosities cannot be separated by any distinct line from slighter variations. All such changes of structure whether extremely slight or strongly marked, which appear among many individuals living together, may be considered as the indefinite effects of the conditions of life on each individual organism in nearly the same manner 
as the chill affects different men in an indefinite manner, according to their state of body or constitution, causing coughs or colds, rheumatism or inflammation of various organs. With respect to what I have called the indirect action of changed conditions, namely through the reproductive system of being affected, we may infer that variability is thus induced, partly from the fact of this system being extremely sensitive to any change in the conditions, and partly from the similarity, as Kohlreuter and others have remarked, between the variability which follows from the crossing of distinct species, and that which may be observed with plants and animals when reared under new or unnatural conditions. Many facts clearly show how eminently susceptible the reproductive system is to very slight changes in the surrounding conditions. Nothing is more easy than to tame an animal, and few things more difficult than to get it to breed freely under confinement, even when the male and female unite. How many animals there are which will not breed, though kept in an almost free state in their native country? This is generally, but erroneously, attributed to vitiated instincts. Many cultivated plants display the utmost rigor, and yet rarely or never seed. In some few cases it has been discovered that a very trifling change, such as a little more or less water at some particular period of growth, will determine whether or not a plant will produce seeds. I cannot here give the details which I have collected and elsewhere published on this curious subject, but to show how singular the laws are which determine the reproduction of animals under confinement, I may mention that carnivorous animals, even from the tropics, breed in this country pretty freely under confinement, with the exception of the plantigrades, or bear family, which seldom produce young whereas carnivorous birds, with the rarest exception, hardly ever lay fertile eggs. Many exotic plants have pollen utterly worthless, in the same condition as in the most sterile hybrids. When on the one hand we see domesticated animals and plants, though often weak and sickly, breeding freely under confinement, and when on the other hand we see individuals though taken young from a state of nature perfectly tamed, long-lived and healthy, of which I could give numerous instances, yet having their reproductive system so seriously affected by unperceived causes as to fail to act, we need not be surprised at this system, when it does act under confinement, acting irregularly, and producing offspring somewhat unlike their parents." I may add that as some organisms breed freely under the most unnatural conditions, for instance rabbits and ferrets kept in hutches, showing that their reproductive organs are not easily affected, so will some animals and plants withstand domestication or cultivation, and vary very slightly, perhaps hardly more than in a state of nature." Some naturalists have maintained that all variations are connected with the act of sexual reproduction, but this is certainly an error, for I have given in another work a long list of sporting plants, as they are called by gardeners, that is, of plants which have suddenly produced a single bud with a new and sometimes widely different character from that of the other buds on the same plant." These bud variations, as they may be named, can be propagated by grafts, offsets, etc., and sometimes by seed. They occur rarely under nature, but are far from rare under culture. As a single bud out of many thousands produced year after year on the same tree, under uniform conditions, has been known suddenly to assume a new character— and, as buds on distinct trees, growing under different conditions, have sometimes yielded nearly the same variety, for instance, buds on peach trees producing nectarines, and buds on common roses producing moss roses, we clearly see that the nature of the conditions is of subordinate importance in comparison with the nature of the organism 
in determining each particular form of variation, perhaps of not more importance than the nature of the spark by which a mass of combustible matter is ignited, has in determining the nature of the flames. Effects of habit and of the use or disuse of parts, correlated variation, inheritance. Changed habits produce an inherited effect, as in the period of the flowering of plants when transported from one climate to another. With animals, the increased use or disuse of parts has had a more marked influence. Thus, I find in the domestic duck that the bones of the wing weigh less and the bones of the leg more in proportion to the whole skeleton than do the same bones in the wild duck. And this change may be safely attributed to the domestic duck flying much less and walking more than its wild parents. The great and inherited development of the udders in cows and goats in countries where they are habitually milked, in comparison with these organs in other countries, is probably another instance of the effects of use. Not one of our domestic animals can be named which has not in some country drooping ears, and the view which has been suggested that the drooping is due to disuse of the muscles of the ear from the animals being seldom much alarmed, seems probable. Many laws regulate variation, some few of which can be dimly seen, and will hereafter be briefly discussed. I will here only allude to what may be called correlated variation. Important changes in the embryo or larva will probably entail changes in the mature animal. In monstrosities, the correlations between quite distinct parts are very curious, and many instances are given in Isidore Geoffrey St. Hilaire's great work on this subject. Breeders believe that long limbs are almost always accompanied by an elongated head. Some instances of correlation are quite whimsical. Thus cats which are entirely white and have blue eyes are generally deaf but it has lately been stated by Mr. Tate that this is confined to the males. Color and constitutional peculiarities go together, of which many remarkable cases could be given among animals and plants. From facts collected by Husinger, it appears that white sheep and pigs are injured by certain plants, while dark-colored individuals escape. Professor Wyman has recently communicated to me a good illustration of this fact, on asking some farmers in Virginia how it was that all their pigs were black. They informed him that the pigs ate the paint root, lacnanthes, which colored their bones pink, and which caused the hoofs of all but the black varieties to drop off, and one of the crackers, i.e. Virginia squatters, added, we select the black members of a litter for raising, as they alone have a good chance of living. Hairless dogs have imperfect teeth. Long-haired and coarse-haired animals are apt to have, as is asserted, long or many horns. Pigeons with feathered feet have skin between their outer toes. Pigeons with short beaks have small feet, and those with long beaks large feet. Hence, if man goes on selecting, and thus augmenting, any peculiarity, he will almost certainly modify unintentionally other parts of the structure, owing to the mysterious laws of correlation. The results of the various, unknown, or but dimly understood laws of variation are infinitely complex and diversified. It is well worth while, carefully to study, the several treaties on some of our old cultivated plants, as on the hyacinth, potato, even the dahlia, etc., and it is really surprising to note the endless points of structure and constitution in which the varieties and sub-varieties differ slightly from each other. The whole organization seems to have become plastic, and departs in a slight degree from that of the parental type. 
Any variation which is not inherited is unimportant for us. But the number and diversity of inheritable deviations of structure, both those of slight and those of considerable physiological importance, are endless. Dr. Prosper Lucas's treatise, in two large volumes, is the fullest and the best on this subject. No breeder doubts how strong is the tendency to inheritance. That like produces like is his fundamental belief. Doubts have been thrown on this principle only by theoretical writers. When any deviation of structure often appears, and we see it in the father and child, we cannot tell whether it may not be due to the same cause having acted on both. But when among individuals, apparently exposed to the same conditions, any very rare deviation, due to some extraordinary combination of circumstances, appears in the parent, say once among several million individuals, and it reappears in the child, the mere doctrine of chances almost compels us to attribute its reappearance to inheritance. Everyone must have heard of cases of albinism, prickly skin, hairy bodies, etc., appearing in several members of the same family. If strange and rare deviations of structure are truly inherited, less strange and commoner deviations may be freely admitted to be inheritable. Perhaps the correct way of viewing the whole subject would be to look at the inheritance of every character whatever as the rule, and non-inheritance as the anomaly. The laws governing inheritance are for the most part unknown. No one can say why the same peculiarity in different individuals of the same species, or in different species, is sometimes inherited, and sometimes not so. Why the child often reverts in certain characteristics to its grandfather, or grandmother, or more remote ancestor. Why a peculiarity is often transmitted from one sex to both sexes, or to one sex alone, more commonly but not exclusively to the like sex. It is a fact of some importance to us that peculiarities appearing in the males of our domestic breeds are often transmitted, either exclusively or in a much greater degree, to the males alone. A much more important rule, which I think may be trusted, is that at whatever period of life a peculiarity first appears, it tends to reappear in the offspring at a corresponding age, though sometimes earlier. In many cases this could not be otherwise. Thus the inherited peculiarities in the horns of cattle could appear only in the offspring when nearly mature. Peculiarities in the silkworm are known to appear at the corresponding caterpillar or cocoon stage. But hereditary diseases, and some other facts, make me believe that the rule has a wider extension, and that, when there is no apparent reason why a peculiarity should appear at any particular age, yet that it does tend to appear in the offspring at the same period at which it first appeared in the parent. I believe this rule to be of the highest importance in explaining the laws of embryology. These remarks are of course confined to the first appearance of the peculiarity, and not to the primary cause, which may have acted on the ovules, or on the male element, in nearly the same manner, as the increased length of the horns in the offspring, from a short-horned cow, by a long-horned bull, though appearing late in life, is clearly due to the male element. Having alluded to the subject of reversion, I may here refer to a statement often made by naturalists, namely that our domestic varieties, when run wild, gradually but invariably revert in character to their aboriginal stocks. Hence it has been argued that no deductions can be drawn from domestic races to species in a state of nature. I have in vain endeavored to discover on what decisive facts the above statement has so often and so boldly been made. There would be great difficulty in proving its truth. We may safely conclude 
that very many of the most strongly marked domestic varieties could not possibly live in a wild state. In many cases we do not know what the aboriginal stock was, and so could not tell whether or not nearly perfect reversion has ensued. It would be necessary, in order to prevent the effects of intercrossing, that only a single variety should be turned loose in its new home. Nevertheless, as our varieties certainly do occasionally revert in some of their characteristics to ancestral forms, it seems to me not improbable that if we could succeed in naturalizing, or were to cultivate during many generations the several races, for instance of the cabbage in very poor soil, in which case, however, some effect would have to be attributed to the definite action of the poor soil, that they would, to a large extent, or even wholly, revert to the wild aboriginal stock. Whether or not the experiment would succeed is not of great importance for our line of argument, for by the experiment itself the conditions of life are changed. If it could be shown that our domestic varieties manifested a strong tendency to reversion, that is, to lose their acquired characters, while kept under the same conditions, and while kept in a considerable body, so that free intercrossing might check, by blending together, any slight deviations in their structure, in such case I grant that we could deduce nothing from domestic varieties in regard to species. But there is not a shadow of evidence in favor of this view— to assert that we could not breed our cart and race horses, long and short horned cattle, and poultry of various breeds, and esculent vegetables, for an unlimited number of generations, would be opposed to all experience. Character of Domestic Varieties Difficulty of Distinguishing Between Varieties and Species Origin of Domestic Varieties from One or More Species When we look to the hereditary varieties or races of our domestic animals and plants and compare them with closely allied species, we generally perceive in each domestic race, as already remarked, less uniformity of character than in true species. Domestic races often have a somewhat monstrous character, by which I mean that, although differing from each other and from other species of the same genus, in several trifling respects, they often differ in an extreme degree in some one part, both when compared one with another, and more especially when compared with the species under nature to which they are nearest allied. With these exceptions, and with that of the perfect fertility of varieties when crossed, a subject hereafter to be discussed, domestic varieties of the same species differ from each other in the same manner as do the closely allied species of the same genus in a state of nature, but the differences in most cases are less in degree. This must be admitted as true, for the domestic races of many animals and plants have been ranked by some competent judges as the descendants of aboriginally distinct species, and by other competent judges, as mere varieties. If any well-marked distinction existed between a domestic race and a species, this source of doubt would not so perpetually recur. It has often been stated that domestic races do not differ from each other in characters of generic value. It can be shown that this statement is not correct but naturalists differ much in determining what characters are of generic value, all such valuations being at present empirical. When it is explained how genera originate under nature, it will be seen that we have no right to expect often to find a generic amount of difference in our domesticated races. In attempting to estimate the amount of structural difference between allied domestic races, we are soon involved in doubt, from not knowing whether they are descended from one or several parent species. This point, if it could be cleared up, would be interesting. 
If, for instance, it could be shown that the greyhound, bloodhound, terrier, spaniel, and bulldog, which we all know propagate their kind truly, were the offspring of any single species, then such facts would have great weight in making us doubt about the immutability of the many closely allied natural species, for instance, of the many foxes inhabiting the different quarters of the world. I do not believe, as we shall presently see, that the whole amount of difference between the several breeds of the dog has been produced under domestication. I believe that a small part of the difference is due to their being descended from distinct species. In the case of strongly marked races of some other domesticated species, there is presumptive or even strong evidence that all are descended from a single wild stock. It has often been assumed that man has chosen for domestication animals and plants having an extraordinary inherent tendency to vary, and likewise to withstand diverse climates. I do not dispute that these capacities have added largely to the value of most of our domesticated productions. But how could a savage possibly know, when he first tamed an animal, whether it would vary in succeeding generations, and whether it would endure other climates? Has the little variability of the ass and the goose, or the small power of endurance of warmth by the reindeer, or of cold by the common camel, prevented their domestication? I cannot doubt that if other animals and plants equal in number to our domesticated productions, and belonging to equally diverse classes and countries, were taken from a state of nature, and could be made to breed for an equal number of generations under domestication, they would, on average, vary as largely as the parent species of our existing domesticated productions have varied. In the case of most of our anciently domesticated animals and plants, it is not possible to come to any definite conclusion whether they are descended from one or several wild species. The argument mainly relied on by those who believe in the multiple origin of our domestic animals is that we find in the most ancient times, on the monuments of Egypt, and in the lake habitations of Switzerland, much diversity in the breeds, and that some of these ancient breeds closely resemble, or are even identical with, those still existing. But this only throws far backward the history of civilization, and shows that animals were domesticated at a much earlier period than has hitherto been supposed. The lake inhabitants of Switzerland cultivated several kinds of wheat and barley, the pea, the poppy for oil and flax, and they possessed several domesticated animals. They also carried on commerce with other nations. All this clearly shows, as here has remarked, that they had at this early age progressed considerably in civilization, and this again implies a long-continued previous period of less advanced civilization, during which the domesticated animals, kept by different tribes in different districts, might have varied and given rise to distinct races. Since the discovery of flint tools and the superficial formations of many parts of the world, all geologists believe that barbarian men existed at an enormously remote period, and we know that at the present day there is hardly a tribe so barbarous as not to have domesticated at least the dog. The origin of most of our domestic animals will probably forever remain vague, but I may here state that, looking to the domestic dogs of the whole world, I have, after a laborious collection of all known facts, come to the conclusion that several wild species of Canidae have been tamed, and that their blood, in some cases mingled together, flows in the veins of our domestic breeds. In regard to sheep and goats, I can form no decided opinion. From facts communicated to me by Mr. Blythe, on the habits, voice, constitution, and structure of the humped Indian cattle, it is almost certain that they are descended from a different aboriginal stock from our European cattle and some competent judges believe that these latter have had two or three 
wild progenitors, whether or not these deserve to be called species. This conclusion, as well as that of the specific distinction between the humped and common cattle, may indeed be looked upon as established by the admirable researches of Professor Rutemeyer. With respect to horses, from reasons which I cannot give here, I am doubtfully inclined to believe, in opposition to several authors, that all the races belong to the same species. Having kept nearly all the English breeds of the fowl alive, having bred and crossed them and examined their skeletons, it appears to me almost certain that all are the descendants of the wild Indian fowl, Gallus bankiva, and this is the conclusion of Mr. Blythe and of others who have studied this bird in India. In regard to ducks and rabbits, some breeds of which differ much from each other, the evidence is clear that they are all descended from the common duck and wild rabbit. The doctrine of the origin of our several domestic races from several aboriginal stocks has been carried to an absurd extreme by some authors. They believe that every race which breeds true, let the distinctive characters be ever so slight, has had its wild prototype. At this rate there must have existed at least a score of species of wild cattle, as many sheep and several goats in Europe alone, and several even within Great Britain. One author believes that there formerly existed eleven wild species of sheep peculiar to Great Britain. When we bear in mind that Britain has now not one peculiar mammal, and France but few distinct from those of Germany, and so with Hungary, Spain, etc., but that each of these kingdoms possesses several peculiar breeds of cattle, sheep, etc., we must admit that many domestic breeds must have originated in Europe, for whence otherwise could they have been derived? So it is in India. Even in the case of the breeds of the domestic dog throughout the world, which I admit are descended from several wild species, it cannot be doubted that there has been an immense amount of inherited variation. For who will believe that animals closely resembling the Italian greyhound, the bloodhound, the bulldog, pug dog, or Blenheim spaniel, etc., so unlike all wild canidae, ever existed in a state of nature? It has often been loosely said that all our races of dogs have been produced by the crossing of a few aboriginal species. But by crossing we can only get forms in some degree intermediate between their parents. And if we account for our several domestic races by this process, we must admit the former existence of the most extreme forms, as the Italian greyhound, bloodhound, bulldog, etc., in the wild state. Moreover, the possibility of making distinct races by crossing has been greatly exaggerated. Many cases are on record showing that a race may be modified by occasional crosses, if aided by the careful selection of the individuals which present the desired character. But to obtain a race intermediate between two quite distinct races would be very difficult. Sir J. Seabright expressly experimented with this object, and failed. The offspring from the first cross between two pure breeds is tolerably, and sometimes, as I have found with pigeons, quite uniform in character, and everything seems simple enough. But when these mongrels are crossed one with another for several generations, hardly two of them are alike, and then the difficulty of the task becomes manifest. End of chapter 1, section A This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, in April 2006. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or The Preservation of Favored Races by 
and the Struggle for Life. Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin. Chapter One, Part B. Breeds of the Domestic Pigeon, Their Differences and Origin. Believing that it is always best to study some special group, I have, after deliberation, taken up domestic pigeons. I have kept every breed which I could purchase or obtain, and have been most kindly favored with skins from several quarters of the world, more especially by the Honorable W. Elliot from India, and by the Honorable C. Murray from Persia. Many treaties in different languages have been published on pigeons, and some of them are very important as being of considerable antiquity. I have associated with several eminent fanciers, and have been permitted to join two of the London Pigeon Clubs. The diversity of the breeds is something astonishing. Compare the English carrier and the short-faced tumbler, and see the wonderful difference in their beaks, entailing corresponding differences in their skulls. The carrier, more especially the male bird, is also remarkable, from the wonderful development of the corunculated skin about the head, and this is accompanied by greatly elongated eyelids, very large external orifices to the nostrils, and a wide gape of mouth. The short-faced tumbler has a beak in outline almost like that of a finch, and the common tumbler has the singular inherited habit of flying at a great height in a compact flock. And tumbling in the air head over heels. The runt is a bird of great size, with long, massive beak and large feet. Some of the subbreeds of runts have very long necks, others have very long wings and tails, others singularly short tails. The barb is allied to the carrier, but instead of a long beak has a very short and broad one. The pouter has a much elongated body, wings, and legs, and its enormously developed crop, which it glories in inflating, may well excite astonishment and even laughter. The turbot has a short and conical beak, with a line of reversed feathers down the breast, and it has the habit of continually expanding slightly the upper part of the esophagus. The Jacobin has the feathers so much reversed along the back of the neck that they form a hood, and it has, proportionally to its size, elongated wings and tail feathers. The trumpeter and laugher, as their names express, utter a very different coo from the other breeds. The fantail has thirty or even forty tail feathers instead of twelve or fourteen. The normal number in all the members of the great pigeon family. These feathers are kept expanded and are carried so erect that in good birds the head and tail touch, the oil gland is quite aborted. Several other less distinct breeds might be specified. In the skeletons of the several breeds, the development of the bones of the face in length and breadth and curvature. Differs enormously. The shape, as well as the breadth and length of the ramus of the lower jaw, varies in a highly remarkable manner. The caudal and sacral vertebrae vary in number, as does the number of the ribs, together with their relative breadth and the presence of processes. The size and shapes of the apertures in the sternum are highly variable. So is the degree of divergence and relative size of the two arms of the furcula. The proportional width of the gape of mouth, the proportional length of the eyelids, of the orifice of the nostrils, of the tongue, not always in strict correlation with the length of beak, the size of the crop and of the upper part of the esophagus, the development and abortion of the oil gland, the number of the primary wing and caudal feathers. The relative length of the wing and tail to each other and to the body, the relative length of the leg and foot, the number of scutellae on the toes, the development of skin between the toes, are all points of structure which are variable.
The period at which the perfect plumage is acquired varies, as does the state of the down, with which the nestling birds are clothed when hatched. The shape and size of the eggs vary, the manner of flight, and in some breeds the voice and disposition differ remarkably. Lastly, in certain breeds, the males and females have come to differ in a slight degree from each other. Altogether, at least a score of pigeons might be chosen, which, if shown to an ornithologist, and he were told that they were wild birds, would certainly be ranked by him as well defined species. Moreover, I do not believe that any ornithologist would in this case place the English carrier, the short faced tumbler, the runt, the barb, pouter, and fantail in the same genus. More especially, as in each of these breeds, several truly inherited subbreeds, or species as he would call them, could be shown him. Great as are the differences between the breeds of the pigeon, I am fully convinced that the common opinion of naturalists is correct, namely, that all are descended from the rock pigeon, Columba livia including under this term several geographical races or subspecies, which differ from each other in the most trifling respects. As several of the reasons which have led me to this belief are in some degree applicable in other cases, I will here briefly give them. If the several breeds are not varieties, and have not proceeded from the rock pigeon, they must have descended from at least seven or eight aboriginal stocks, for it is impossible to make the present domestic breeds by the crossing of any lesser number. How, for instance, could a pouter be produced by crossing two breeds unless one of the parent stocks possessed the characteristic enormous crop? The supposed aboriginal stocks must all have been rock pigeons, that is, they did not breed or willingly perch on trees. But besides Columba livia, with its geographical subspecies, only two or three other species of rock pigeons are known, and these have not any of the characters of the domestic breeds. Hence, the supposed aboriginal stocks must either still exist in the countries where they were originally domesticated, and yet be unknown to ornithologists, and this, considering their size, habits, and remarkable characters seems improbable, or they must have become extinct in the wild state. But birds breeding on precipices and good flyers are unlikely to be exterminated, and the common rock pigeon, which has the same habits with the domestic breeds, has not been exterminated even on several of the smaller British islets or on the shore of the Mediterranean. Hence the supposed extermination of so many species having similar habits with the rock pigeon seems a very rash assumption. Moreover, the several above-named domesticated breeds have been transported to all parts of the world, and therefore some of them must have been carried back again into their native country, but not one has become wild or feral, though the dovecote pigeon which is the rock pigeon in a very slightly altered state, has become feral in several places. Again, all recent experience shows that it is difficult to get wild animals to breed freely under domestication. Yet, on the hypothesis of the multiple origin of our pigeons, it must be assumed that at least seven or eight species were so thoroughly domesticated in ancient times by half-civilized man as to be quite prolific under confinement. An argument of great weight, and applicable in several other cases, is that the above specified breeds, though agreeing generally with the wild rock pigeon in constitution, habits, voice, coloring, and in most parts of their structure, yet are certainly highly abnormal in other parts, we may look in vain through the whole family of Columbidae for a beak like that of the English carrier, or that of the short-faced tumbler or barb, for reversed feathers like those of the Jacobin, for a crop like that of the pouter, for tail-feathers like those of the fan-tail, 
Hence it must be assumed, not only that half-civilized man succeeded in thoroughly domesticating several species, but that he intentionally, or by chance, picked out extraordinarily abnormal species, and further, that these very species have since all become extinct or unknown. So many strange contingencies are improbable in the highest degree. Some facts in regard to the coloring of pigeons well deserve consideration. The rock pigeon is of a slaty blue, with white loins. But the Indian subspecies, Columba intermedia of Strickland, has this part bluish. The tail has a terminal dark part, with the outer feathers externally edged at the base with white. The wings have two black bars. Some semi-domestic breeds, and some truly wild breeds, have, besides the two black bars, the wings checkered with black. These several marks do not occur together in any other species of the whole family. Now, in every one of the domestic breeds, taking thoroughly well-bred birds, all the above marks, even to the white edging of the outer tail feathers, sometimes concur perfectly developed. Moreover, when birds belonging to two or more distinct breeds are crossed, none of which are blue or have any of the above specified marks, the mongrel offspring are very apt suddenly to acquire these characters. To give one instance out of several which I have observed, I crossed some white fantails, which breed very true, with some black barbs, and it so happens that blue varieties of barbs are so rare that I never heard of an instance in England, and the mongrels were black, brown, and mottled. I also crossed a barb with a spot, which is a white bird with a red tail and red spot on the forehead, and which notoriously breeds very true. The mongrels were dusky and mottled. I then crossed one of the mongrel barb fantails with a mongrel barb spot, and they produced a bird of as beautiful a blue color, with the white loins, double black wing bar, and barred and white edge tail feathers, as any wild rock pigeon. We can understand these facts on the well-known principle of reversion to ancestral characters, if all the domestic breeds are descended from the rock pigeon. But if we deny this, we must make one of the two following highly improbable suppositions. Either first, that all of the several imagined aboriginal stocks were colored and marked like the rock pigeon, although no other existing species is thus colored and marked, so that in each separate breed there might be a tendency to revert to the very same colors and markings. Or secondly, that each breed, even the purest, has within a dozen, or at most within a score, of generations, been crossed by the rock pigeon. I say within a dozen or twenty generations, for no instance is known of crossed descendants reverting to an ancestor of foreign blood, removed by a greater number of generations. In a breed which has been crossed only once, the tendency to revert to any character derived from such a cross will naturally become less and less, as in each succeeding generation there will be less of the foreign blood. But when there has been no cross, and there is a tendency in the breed to revert to a character which was lost during some former generation, this tendency, for all that we can see to the contrary, may be transmitted undiminished for an indefinite number of generations. These two distinct cases of reversion are often confounded together by those who have written on inheritance. Lastly, the hybrids, or mongrels, from between all the breeds of the pigeon are perfectly fertile, as I can state from my own observations, purposely made, on the most distinct breeds. Now, hardly any cases have been ascertained with certainty of hybrids from two quite distinct species of animals being perfectly fertile. Some authors believe that long-continued domestication eliminates this strong tendency to sterility in species. From the history of the dog, and of some other domestic animals, 
This conclusion is probably quite correct, if applied to species closely related to each other. But to extend it so far as to suppose that species, aboriginally as distinct as carriers, tumblers, pouters, and fantails now are, should yield offspring perfectly fertile, inter se, seems to me rash in the extreme. From these several reasons, namely, the improbability of man having formerly made seven or eight supposed species of pigeons to breed freely under domestication, these supposed species being quite unknown in a wild state, and their not having become anywhere feral, these species presenting certain very abnormal characters, as compared with all other columbidae, though so like the rock pigeon in most other respects, the occasional reappearance of the blue color and various black marks in all the breeds, both when kept pure and when crossed, and lastly the mongrel offspring being perfectly fertile, from these several reasons taken together, we may safely conclude that all our domestic breeds are descended from the rock pigeon, or columba livia, with its geographical subspecies. In favor of this view, I may add, firstly, that the wild columba livia has been found capable of domestication in Europe and in India, and that it agrees in habitats and in a great number of points of structure with all the domestic breeds. Secondly, that although an English carrier or a short-faced tumbler differs immensely in certain characters from the rock pigeon, yet that by comparing the several sub-breeds of these two races, more especially those brought from distant countries, we can make between them and the rock pigeon an almost perfect series, so we can in some other cases, but not with all the breeds. Thirdly, those characters which are mainly distinctive of each breed are in each eminently variable, for instance, the wattle and length of beak of the carrier, the shortness of that of the tumbler, and the number of tail feathers in the fantail, and the explanation of this fact will be obvious when we treat of selection. Fourthly, pigeons have been watched and tended with the utmost care and loved by many people. They have been domesticated for thousands of years in several quarters of the world. The earliest known record of pigeons is in the 5th Egyptian dynasty, about 3000 B.C., as was pointed out to me by Professor Lepsius. But Mr. Birch informs me that pigeons are given in a bill of fare in the previous dynasty. In the time of the Romans, as we hear from Pliny, immense prices were given for pigeons. Nay, they are come to this pass, that they can reckon up their pedigree and race. Pigeons were much valued by Agpur Khan in India, about the year 1600. Never less than 20,000 pigeons were taken with the court. The monarchs of Iran and Tehran sent him some very rare birds, and, continues the courtly historian, His Majesty, by crossing the breeds, which method was never practiced before, has improved them astonishingly. About this same period, the Dutch were as eager about pigeons as were the old Romans. The paramount importance of these considerations in explaining the immense amount of variation which pigeons have undergone will likewise be obvious when we treat of selection. We shall then also see how it is that the several breeds so often have a somewhat monstrous character. It is also a most favorable circumstance for the production of distinct breeds that male and female pigeons can be easily mated for life, and thus different breeds can be kept together in the same aviary. I have discussed the probable origin of domestic pigeons at some yet quite insufficient length, because when I first kept pigeons and watched the several kinds, well knowing how truly they breed, I felt fully as much difficulty in believing that since they had been domesticated, they had all proceeded from a common parent, as any naturalist could in coming to a similar conclusion in regard to the many species of finches or other groups of birds in nature. One circumstance has struck me much, namely, 
that nearly all the breeders of the various domestic animals and the cultivators of plants with whom I have conversed, or whose treaties I have read, are firmly convinced that the several breeds to which each has attended are descended from so many aboriginally distinct species. Ask, as I have asked, a celebrated razor of Hereford cattle, whether his cattle might not have descended from longhorns, or both from a common parent stock, and he will laugh you to scorn. I have never met a pigeon, or poultry, or duck, or rabbit fancier, who is not fully convinced that each main breed was descended from a distinct species. Van Mons, in his treatise on pears and apples, shows how utterly he disbelieves that the several sorts, for instance a ribston pippin or codlin apple, could ever have proceeded from the seeds of the same tree. Innumerable other examples could be given. The explanation, I think, is simple. From long-continued study they are strongly impressed with the differences between the several races, and though they well know that each race varies slightly, for they win their prizes by selecting such slight differences, yet they ignore all general arguments, and refuse to sum up in their minds slight differences accumulated during many successive generations. May not those naturalists, who, knowing far less of the laws of inheritance than does the breeder, and knowing no more than he does of the intermediate links in the long lines of descent, yet admit that many of our domestic races are descended from the same parents? May they not learn a lesson of caution, when they deride the idea of species in a state of nature being lineal descendants of other species? Principles of Selection Anciently Followed, and Their Effects Let us now briefly consider the steps by which domestic races have been produced, either from one or from several allied species. Some effect may be attributed to the direct and definite action of the external conditions of life, and some to habit, but he would be a bold man who would account by such agencies for the differences between a dray and racehorse, a greyhound and bloodhound, a carrier and tumbler pigeon. One of the most remarkable features in our domesticated races is that we see in them adaptation, not indeed to the animal's or plant's own good, but to man's use or fancy. Some variations useful to him have probably arisen suddenly, or by one step. Many botanists, for instance, believe that the fuller's teasel, with its hooks, which cannot be rivaled by any mechanical contrivance, is only a variety of the wild dipsicus, and this amount of change may have suddenly arisen in a seedling. So it has probably been with the turnspit dog, and this is known to have been the case with the ancon sheep. But when we compare the dray horse and race horse, the dromedary and camel, the various breeds of sheep fitted either for cultivated land or mountain pasture, with the wool of one breed good for one purpose, and that of another breed for another purpose, when we compare the many breeds of dogs, each good for man in different ways, when we compare the gamecock, so pertinacious in battle with other breeds, so little quarrelsome, with everlasting layers, which never desire to sit, and with the bantam, so small and elegant, when we compare the host of agricultural, culinary, orchard, and flower-garden races of plants, most useful to man at different seasons, and for different purposes, or so beautiful in his eyes, we must, I think, look further than to mere variability." We cannot suppose that all the breeds were suddenly produced as perfect and as useful as we now see them. Indeed, in many cases we know that this has not been their history. The key is man's power of accumulative selection. Nature gives successive variations. Man adds them up in certain directions useful to him. In this sense... He may be said to have made for himself useful breeds. <laughs>
the great power of this principle of selection is not hypothetical. It is certain that several of our eminent breeders have, even within a single lifetime, modified to a large extent their breeds of cattle and sheep. In order fully to realize what they have done, it is almost necessary to read several of the many treaties devoted to this subject, and to inspect the animals. Breeders habitually speak of an animal's organization as something plastic, which they can model almost as they please. If I had space I could quote numerous passages to this effect from highly competent authorities. Uat, who is probably better acquainted with the works of agriculturalists than almost any other individual, and who was himself a very good judge of animals, speaks of the principle of selection as that which enables the agriculturalist not only to modify the character of his flock, but to change it altogether. It is the magician's wand, by means of which he may summon into life whatever form and mold he pleases. Lord Somerville, speaking of what breeders have done for sheep, says, It would seem as if they had chalked out upon a wall a form perfect in itself, and then had given its existence. In Saxony, the importance of the principle of selection in regard to merino sheep is so fully recognized that men follow it as a trade. The sheep are placed on a table and are studied, like a picture by a connoisseur. This is done three times at intervals of months, and the sheep are each time marked and classed, so that the very best may ultimately be selected for breeding. What English breeders have actually effected is proved by the enormous prices given for animals with a good pedigree and these have been exported to almost every quarter of the world. The improvement is by no means generally due to crossing different breeds. All the best breeders are strongly opposed to this practice, except sometimes among closely allied sub-breeds, and when a cross has been made, the closest selection is far more indispensable even than in ordinary cases. If selection consisted merely in separating some very distinct variety and breeding from it, the principle would be so obvious as hardly to be worth notice. But its importance consists in the great effect produced by the accumulation in one direction, during successive generations, of differences absolutely inappreciable by an uneducated eye, differences which I, for one, have vainly attempted to appreciate." Not one man in a thousand has accuracy of eye and judgment sufficient to become an eminent breeder. If gifted with these qualities, and he studies his subject for years, and devotes his lifetime to it with indomitable perseverance, he will succeed, and may make great improvements. If he wants any of these qualities, he will assuredly fail." Few would readily believe in the natural capacity and years of practice requisite to become even a skillful pigeon fancier. The same principles are followed by horticulturalists, but the variations are here often more abrupt. No one supposes that our choicest productions have been produced by a single variation from the aboriginal stock. We have proofs that this is not so in several cases, in which exact records have been kept. Thus, to give a very trifling instance, the steadily increasing size of the common gooseberry may be quoted. We see an astonishing improvement in many florists' flowers, when the flowers of the present day are compared with drawings made only twenty or thirty years ago. When a race of plants is once pretty well established, the seed-raisers do not pick out the best plants, but merely go over their seed-beds, and pull up the rogues, as they call the plants that deviate from the proper standard. With animals, this kind of selection is, in fact, likewise followed, for hardly any one is so careless as to breed from his worst animals. In regard to plants, there is another means of observing the accumulated effects of selection, namely, by comparing the diversity of flowers in the different varieties of the same species in the flower-garden, the diversity of leaves, pods, or tubers, 
or whatever part is valued in the kitchen garden, in comparison with the flowers of the same varieties, and the diversity of fruit of the same species in the orchard, in comparison with the leaves and flowers of the same set of varieties. See how different the leaves of the cabbage are, and how extremely alike the flowers, how unlike the flowers of the heartsease are, and how alike the leaves, how much the fruit of the different kinds of gooseberries differ in size, color, shape, and hairiness, and yet the flowers present very slight differences. It is not that the varieties which differ largely in some one point do not differ at all in other points, this is hardly ever, I speak after careful observation, perhaps never the case. The law of correlated variation, the importance of which should never be overlooked, will ensure some differences. But, as a general rule, it cannot be doubted that the continued selection of slight variations, either in the leaves, the flowers, or the fruit, will produce races differing from each other, chiefly in these characters. It may be objected that the principle of selection has been reduced to methodical practice for scarcely more than three-quarters of a century. It has certainly been more attended to of late years, and many treaties have been published on the subject, and the result has been, in a corresponding degree, rapid and important. But it is very far from true that the principle is a modern discovery. I could give several references to works of high antiquity in which the full importance of the principle is acknowledged. In rude and barbarous periods of English history, choice animals were often imported, and laws were passed to prevent their exportation. The destruction of horses under a certain size was ordered, and this may be compared to the roguing of plants by nurserymen. The principle of selection I find distinctly given in an ancient Chinese encyclopedia. Explicit rules are laid down by some of the Roman classical writers. From passages in Genesis, it is clear that the color of domestic animals was at that early period attended to. Savages now sometimes cross their dogs with wild canine animals to improve the breed, and they formerly did so, as is attested by passages in Pliny. The savages in South Africa match their draft cattle by color, as do some of the Eskimo their teams of dogs. Livingstone states that good domestic breeds are highly valued by the Negroes in the interior of Africa, who have not associated with Europeans. Some of these facts do not show actual selection, but they show that the breeding of domestic animals was carefully attended to in ancient times, and is now attended to by the lowest savages. It would indeed have been a strange fact, had attention not been paid to breeding, for the inheritance of good and bad qualities is so obvious. Unconscious Selection At the present time, eminent breeders try, by methodical selection, with a distinct object in view, to make a new strain or sub-breed superior to anything of the kind in the country. But for our purpose... A form of selection which may be called unconscious, and which results from every one trying to possess and breed from the best individual animals, is more important. Thus, a man who intends keeping pointers naturally tries to get as good dogs as he can, and afterwards breeds from his own best dogs. But he has no wish or expectation of permanently altering the breed. Nevertheless, we may infer that this process, continued during centuries, would improve and modify any breed, in the same way as Bakewell, Collins, etc., by this very same process, only carried on more methodically, did greatly modify, even during their lifetimes, the forms and qualities of their cattle. Slow and insensible changes of this kind could never be recognized, unless actual measurements or careful drawings of the breeds in question have been made long ago, which may serve for comparison. End 
In some cases, however, unchanged or but little changed, individuals of the same breed exist in less civilized districts where the breed has been less improved. There is reason to believe that King Charles's spaniel has been unconsciously modified to a large extent since the time of that monarch. Some highly competent authorities are convinced that the setter is directly derived from the spaniel and has probably been slowly altered from it. It is known that the English pointer has been greatly changed within the last century, and in this case the change has, it is believed, been chiefly affected by crosses with the foxhound. But what concerns us is that the change has been effected unconsciously and gradually, and yet so effectually that, though the old Spanish pointer certainly came from Spain, Mr. Barrow has not seen, as I am informed by him, any native dog in Spain like our pointer. By a similar process of selection, and by careful training, English racehorses have come to surpass in fleetness and size the parent Arabs, so that the latter, by the regulations for the Goodwood races, are favored in the weights which they carry. Lord Spencer and others have shown how the cattle of England have increased in weight and in early maturity, compared with the stock formerly kept in this country. By comparing the accounts given in various old treaties of the former and present state of carrier and tumbler pigeons in Britain, India, and Persia, we can trace the stages through which they have insensibly passed, and come to differ so greatly from the rock pigeon. Uat gives an excellent illustration of the effects of a course of selection which may be considered as unconscious, in so far that the breeders could never have expected, or even wished, to produce the results which ensued, namely the production of the distinct strains. The two flocks of Leicester sheep, kept by Mr. Buckley and Mr. Burgess, as Mr. Uat remarks, have been purely bred from the original stock of Mr. Bakewell for upwards of fifty years. There is not a suspicion existing in the mind of any one at all acquainted with the subject that the owner of either of them has deviated in any one instance from the pure blood of Mr. Bakewell's flock. And yet the difference between the sheep possessed by these two gentlemen is so great that they have the appearance of being quite different varieties." If there exist savages, so barbarous as never to think of the inherited character of the offspring of their domestic animals, yet any one animal particularly useful to them for any special purpose would be carefully preserved during famines and other accidents to which savages are so liable, and such choice animals would thus generally leave more offspring than the inferior ones, so that in this case there would be a kind of unconscious selection going on. We see the value set on animals even by the barbarians of Tierra del Fuego, by their killing and devouring their old women in times of dearth, as of less value than their dogs. In plants the same gradual process of improvement through the occasional preservation of the best individuals, whether or not sufficiently distinct to be ranked at their first appearance as distinct varieties, and whether or not two or more species or races have become blended together by crossing, may plainly be recognized in the increased size and beauty which we now see in the varieties of the heartsees, rose, pelargonium, dahlia, and other plants, and when compared with the older varieties or with their parent stocks. No one would ever expect to get a first-rate heartsease or dahlia, from the seed of a wild plant. No one would expect to raise a first-rate melting pear from the seed of a wild pear, though he might succeed from a poor seedling growing wild if it had come from a garden stock. The pear, though cultivated in classical times, appears, from Pliny's description, to have been a fruit of very inferior quality. I have seen great surprise expressed in horticultural works at the wonderful skill of gardeners in having produced such splendid results from such poor materials. But the art has been simple, 
and as far as the final result is concerned, has been followed almost unconsciously. It has consisted in always cultivating the best-known variety, sowing its seeds, and, when a slightly better variety chanced to appear, selecting it, and so onwards. But the gardeners of the classical period, who cultivated the best pears which they could procure, never thought what splendid fruit we should eat, though we owe our excellent fruit, in some small degree, to their having naturally chosen and preserved the best varieties they could anywhere find. A large amount of change, thus slowly and unconsciously accumulated, explains, as I believe, the well-known fact that in a number of cases we cannot recognize, and therefore do not know, the wild parent stocks of the plants which have been longest cultivated in our flower and kitchen gardens. If it has taken centuries, or thousands of years, to improve or modify most of our plants, up to their present standard of usefulness to man, we can understand how it is that neither Australia, the Cape of Good Hope, nor any other region inhabited by quite uncivilized man, has afforded us a single plant worth culture. It is not that these countries, so rich in species, do not by a strange chance possess the aboriginal stocks of any useful plants, but that the native plants have not been improved by continued selection up to a standard of perfection comparable with that acquired by the plants in countries anciently civilized. In regard to the domestic animals kept by uncivilized man, it should not be overlooked that they almost always have to struggle for their own food, at least during certain seasons. And in two countries very differently circumstanced, individuals of the same species, having slightly different constitutions or structure, would often succeed better in the one country than in the other, and thus, by a process of natural selection, as will hereafter be more fully explained, two sub-breeds might be formed. This, perhaps, partly explains why the varieties kept by savages, as has been remarked by some authors, have more of the character of true species than the varieties kept in civilized countries. On the view here given of the important part which selection by man has played, it becomes at once obvious how it is that our domestic races show adaptation in their structure, or in their habits, to man's wants or fancies. We can, I think, further understand the frequently abnormal character of our domestic races, and likewise their differences being so great in external characters, and relatively so slight in internal parts or organs. Man can hardly select, or only with much difficulty, any deviation of structure, excepting such as is externally visible, and indeed he rarely cares for what is internal. He can never act by selection, excepting on variations which are first given to him in some slight degree by nature. No man would ever try to make a fan-tail, till he saw a pigeon with a tail developed in some slight degree in an unusual manner, or a pouter till he saw a pigeon with a crop of somewhat unusual size. And the more abnormal or unusual any character was when it first appeared, the more likely it would be to catch his attention. But to use such an expression as trying to make a fantail is, I have no doubt, in most cases, utterly incorrect. The man who first selected a pigeon with a slightly larger tail never dreamed what the descendants of that pigeon would become through long-continued, partly unconscious and partly methodical, selection. Perhaps the parent bird of all fantails had only fourteen tail feathers, somewhat expanded, like the present Java fantail, or like individuals of other and distinct breeds, in which as many as seventeen tail feathers have been counted. Perhaps the first powder pigeon did not inflate its crop much more than the turbot now does the upper part of its esophagus, a habit which is disregarded by all fanciers, as it is not one of the points of the breed. Nor let it be thought that some great deviation of structure would be necessary to catch the fancier's eye. 
he perceives extremely small differences, and it is in human nature to value any novelty, however slight, in one's own possession. Nor must the value which would formerly have been set on any slight differences in the individuals of the same species be judged of by the value which is now set on them after several breeds have fairly been established. It is known that with pigeons many slight variations now occasionally appear, but these are rejected as faults or deviations from the standard of perfection in each breed. The common goose has not given rise to any marked varieties, hence the Toulouse and the common breed, which differ only in color, that most fleeting of characters, have lately been exhibited as distinct at our poultry shows. These views appear to explain what has sometimes been noticed, namely, that we know hardly anything about the origin or history of any of our domestic breeds. But, in fact, a breed, like a dialect of a language, can hardly be said to have a distinct origin. A man preserves and breeds from an individual with some slight deviation of structure, or takes more care than usual in matching his best animals, and thus improves them and the improved animals slowly spread in the immediate neighborhood. But they will as yet hardly have a distinct name, and from being only slightly valued, their history will have been disregarded. When further improved by the same slow and gradual process, they will spread more widely, and will be recognized as something distinct and valuable, and will then probably first receive a provincial name. In semi-civilized countries, with little free communication, the spreading of a new sub-breed will be a slow process. As soon as the points of value are once acknowledged, the principle, as I have called it, of unconscious selection will always tend, perhaps more at one period than at another, as the breed rises or falls in fashion, perhaps more in one district than in another, according to the state of civilization of the inhabitants, slowly to add to the characteristic features of the breed, whatever they may be. But the chance will be infinitely small of any record having been preserved of such slow, varying, and insensible changes. Circumstances favorable to man's power of selection. I will now say a few words on the circumstances, favorable or the reverse, to man's power of selection. A high degree of variability is obviously favorable, as freely giving the materials for selection to work on. Not that mere individual differences are not amply sufficient, with extreme care, to allow of the accumulation of a large amount of modification in almost any desired direction but as variations manifestly useful or pleasing to man appear only occasionally, the chance of their appearance will be much increased by a large number of individuals being kept. Hence, number is of the highest importance for success. On this principle, Marshall formally remarked with respect to the sheep of part of Yorkshire, as they generally belong to poor people and are mostly in small lots, they never can be improved. On the other hand, nurserymen, from keeping large stocks of the same plant, are generally far more successful than amateurs in raising new and valuable varieties. A large number of individuals of an animal or plant can be reared only where the conditions for its propagation are favorable. When the individuals are scanty, all will be allowed to breed, whatever their quality may be and this will effectually prevent selection. But probably the most important element is that the animal or plant should be so highly valued by man that the closest attention is paid to even the slightest deviations in its qualities or structure. Unless such attention be paid, nothing can be effected. I have seen it gravely remarked that it was most fortunate that the strawberry began to vary just when gardeners began to attend to this plant. No doubt the strawberry had always varied since it was cultivated, but the slight varieties had been neglected, 
As soon, however, as gardeners picked out individual plants with slightly larger, earlier, or better fruit, and raised seedlings from them, and again picked out the best seedlings and bred from them, then, with some aid by crossing distinct species, those many admirable varieties of the strawberry were raised which have appeared during the last half century. With animals, facility in preventing crosses is an important element in the formation of new races, at least in a country which is already stocked with other races. In this respect, enclosure of the land plays a part. Wandering savages or the inhabitants of open plains rarely possess more than one breed of the same species. Pigeons can be mated for life, and this is a great convenience to the fancier, for thus many races may be improved and kept true, though mingled in the same aviary, and this circumstance must have largely favored the formation of new breeds. Pigeons, I may add, can be propagated in great numbers and at a very quick rate, and inferior birds may be freely rejected, as when killed they serve for food. On the other hand, cats, from their nocturnal rambling habits, cannot be easily matched, and, although so much valued by women and children, we rarely see a distinct breed long kept up. Such breeds as we do sometimes see are almost always imported from some other country. Although I do not doubt that some domestic animals vary less than others, Yet the rarity or absence of distinct breeds of the cat, the donkey, peacock, goose, etc., may be attributed in main part to selection not having been brought into play, in cats for the difficulty in pairing them, in donkeys from only a few being kept by poor people and little attention paid to their breeding, for recently in certain parts of Spain and of the United States, This animal has been surprisingly modified and improved by careful selection. In peacocks, from not being very easily reared, and a large stock not kept. In geese, from being valuable only for two purposes, food and feathers, and more especially from no pleasure having been felt in the display of distinct breeds. But the goose, under the conditions to which it is exposed when domesticated, seems to have a singularly inflexible organization, though it has varied to a slight extent, as I have elsewhere described. Some authors have maintained that the amount of variation in our domestic productions is soon reached, and can never afterward be exceeded. It would be somewhat rash to assert that the limit has been attained in any one case. For almost all our animals and plants have been greatly improved in many ways within a recent period, and this implies variation. It would be equally rash to assert that characters, now increased to their utmost limit, could not, after remaining fixed for many centuries, again vary under new conditions of life. No doubt, as Mr. Wallace has remarked with much truth, a limit will be at last reached. For instance, there must be a limit to the fleetness of any terrestrial animal, as this will be determined by the friction to be overcome, the weight of the body to be carried, and the power of contraction in the muscular fibers. But what concerns us is that the domestic varieties of the same species differ from each other in almost every character, which man has attended to and selected, more than do the different species of the same genera. Isidore Geoffrey St. Hilaire has proved this in regard to size, and so it is with color, and probably with the length of hair. With respect to fleetness, which depends on many bodily characters, Eclipse was far fleeter, and a dray horse is comparably stronger than any two natural species belonging to the same genus. So with plants, the seeds of the different varieties of the bean or maize probably differ more in size than do the seeds of the distinct species in any one genus in the same two families. The same remark holds good in regard to the fruit of the several varieties of the plum, and still more strongly with the melon, as well as in many other analogous cases.
To sum up on the origin of our domestic races of animals and plants. Changed conditions of life are of the highest importance in causing variability, both by acting directly on the organization and indirectly by affecting the reproductive system. It is not probable that variability is an inherent and necessary contingent under all circumstances. The greater or less force of inheritance and reversion determine whether variations shall endure. Variability is governed by many unknown laws, of which correlated growth is probably the most important. Something, but how much we do not know, may be attributed to the definite action of the conditions of life. Some, perhaps a great, effect may be attributed to the increased use or disuse of parts. The final result is thus rendered infinitely complex. In some cases, the intercrossing of aboriginally distinct species appears to have played an important part in the origin of our breeds. When several breeds have once been formed in any country, their occasional intercrossing, with the aid of selection, has no doubt largely aided in the formation of new sub breeds. But the importance of crossing has been much exaggerated, both in regard to animals and to those plants which are propagated by seed. With plants which are temporarily propagated by cuttings, buds, etc., the importance of crossing is immense, for the cultivator may here disregard the extreme variability both of hybrids and of mongrels, and the sterility of hybrids. But plants not propagated by seed. Are of little importance to us, for their endurance is only temporary. Over all these causes of change, the accumulative action of selection, whether applied methodically and quickly, or unconsciously and slowly, but more efficiently, seems to have been the predominant power. End of chapter one, part b. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin. Chapter Number Two Variation Under Nature. Contents of this chapter include Variability, Individual Differences, Doubtful Species, Wide Ranging, Much Diffused, and Common Species Very Most. Species of the larger genera in each country vary more frequently than the species of the smaller genera. Many of the species of the larger genera resemble varieties in being very closely but unequally related to each other, and in having restricted ranges. Before applying the principles arrived at in the last chapter to organic beings in a state of nature, we must briefly discuss whether these latter are subject to any variation. To treat this subject properly, a long catalogue of dry facts ought to be given, but these I shall reserve for a future work. Nor shall I here discuss the various definitions which have been given of the term species. No one definition has satisfied all naturalists. Yet every naturalist knows vaguely what he means when he speaks of a species. Generally, the term includes the unknown element of a distinct act of creation. The term variety is almost equally difficult to define, but here community of descent is almost universally implied, though it can rarely be proved. We have also what are called monstrosities. But they graduate into varieties. By a monstrosity, I presume, is meant some considerable deviation of structure, 
generally injurious, or not useful to the species. Some authors use the term variation in a technical sense, as implying a modification directly due to the physical conditions of life. And variations in this sense are supposed not to be inherited, but who can say that the dwarfed condition of shells in the brackish waters of the Baltic, or dwarfed plants on alpine summits, or the thicker fur of an animal from far northwards, would not in some cases be inherited for at least a few generations. And in this case I presume that the form would be called a variety. It may be doubted whether sudden and considerable deviations of structure, such as we occasionally see in our domestic productions, more especially with plants, are ever permanently propagated in a state of nature. Almost every part of every organic being is so beautifully related to its complex conditions of life, that it seems as improbable that any part should have been suddenly produced perfect, as that a complex machine should have been invented by man in a perfect state. Under domestication, monstrosities sometimes occur which resemble normal structures in widely different animals. Thus pigs have occasionally been born with a sort of proboscis, and if any wild species of the same genus had naturally possessed a proboscis, it might have been argued that this had appeared as a monstrosity. But I have as yet failed to find, after diligent search, cases of monstrosities resembling normal structures in nearly allied forms, and these alone bear on the question. If monstrous forms of this kind ever do appear in a state of nature, and are capable of reproduction, which is not always the case, as they occur rarely and singly, their preservation would depend on unusually favourable circumstances. They would, also, during the first and succeeding generations, cross with the ordinary form, and thus their abnormal character would almost inevitably be lost but I shall have to return in a future chapter to the preservation and perpetuation of single or occasional variations. INDIVIDUAL DIFFERENCES The many slight differences which appear in the offspring from the same parents, or which it may be presumed have thus arisen from being observed in the individuals of the same species inhabiting the same confined locality, may be called individual differences. No one supposes that all the individuals of the same species are cast in the same actual mould. These individual differences are of the highest importance for us, for they are often inherited, as must be familiar to every one, and they thus afford materials for natural selection to act on and accumulate, in the same manner as man accumulates in any given direction individual differences in his domesticated productions. These individual differences generally affect what naturalists consider unimportant parts, but I could show, by a long catalogue of facts, that parts which must be called important, whether viewed under a physiological or classificatory point of view, sometimes vary in the individuals of the same species. I am convinced that the most experienced naturalist would be surprised at the number of the cases of variability, even in important parts of structure, which he could collect on good authority, as I have collected, during a course of years. It should be remembered that systematists are far from being pleased at finding variability in important characters and that there are not many men who will laboriously examine internal and important organs, and compare them in many specimens of the same species. It would never have been expected that the branching of the main nerves close to the great central ganglion of an insect would have been variable in the same species. It might have been thought that changes of this nature could have been effected only by slow degrees, yet Sir J. Lubbock has shown a degree of variability in these main nerves in coccus, 
which may almost be compared to the irregular branching of the stem of a tree. This philosophical naturalist, I may add, has also shown that the muscles in the larvae of certain insects are far from uniform. Authors sometimes argue in a circle when they state that important organs never vary, for these same authors practically rank those parts as important, as some few naturalists have honestly confessed, which do not vary, and under this point of view no instance will ever be found of an important part varying, but under any other point of view many instances assuredly can be given. There is one point connected with individual differences which is extremely perplexing. I refer to those genera which have been called protean, or polymorphic, in which species present an inordinate amount of variation. With respect to many of these forms, hardly two naturalists agree whether to rank them as species or as varieties. We may instance rubus, rosa, and hieracium among plants, several genera of insects, and of brachiopod shells. In most polymorphic genera some of the species have fixed and definite characters. Genera which are polymorphic in one country seem to be, with a few exceptions, polymorphic in other countries, and, likewise, judging from brachiopod shells, at former periods of time. These facts are very perplexing, for they seem to show that this kind of variability is independent of the conditions of life. I am inclined to suspect that we see, at least in some of these polymorphic genera, variations which are of no service or disservice to the species, and which consequently have not been seized on, and rendered definite by natural selection, as hereafter to be explained. Individuals of the same species often present, as is known to every one, great differences of structure, independently of variation, as in the two sexes of various animals, in the two or three castes of sterile females or workers among insects, and in the immature and larval states of many of the lower animals. There are, also, cases of dimorphism and trimorphism, both with animals and plants. Thus Mr. Wallace, who has lately called attention to the subject, has shown that the females of certain species of butterflies, in the Malayan archipelago, regularly appear under two, or even three, conspicuously distinct forms, not connected by intermediate varieties. Fritz Muller has described analogous, but more extraordinary cases, with the males of certain Brazilian crustaceans. Thus the male of a Tanais regularly occurs under two distinct forms. One of these has strong and differently shaped pincers, and the other has antennae much more abundantly furnished with smelling hairs. Although in most of these cases the two or three forms, both with animals and plants, are not now connected by intermediate gradations, it is possible that they were once thus connected. Mr. Wallace, for instance, describes a certain butterfly, which presents in the same island a great range of varieties, connected by intermediate links, and the extreme links of the chain closely resemble the two forms of an allied dimorphic species, inhabiting another part of the Malay archipelago. Thus also with ants, the several worker castes are generally quite distinct, but in some cases, as we shall hereafter see, the castes are connected together by finely graduated varieties. So it is, as I have myself observed, with some dimorphic plants. It certainly at first appears a highly remarkable fact that the same female butterfly should have the power of producing at the same time three distinct female forms and a male. 
and that an hermaphrodite plant should produce from the same seed capsule three distinct hermaphrodite forms, bearing three different kinds of females, and three, or even six, different kinds of males. Nevertheless, these cases are only exaggerations of the common fact that the female produces offspring of two sexes which sometimes differ from each other in a wonderful manner. Doubtful Species The forms which possess in some considerable degree the character of species, but which are so closely similar to other forms, or are so closely linked to them by intermediate gradations, that naturalists do not like to rank them as distinct species, are in several respects the most important for us. We have every reason to believe that many of these doubtful and closely allied forms have permanently retained their characters for a long time. For as long, as far as we know, as have good and true species. Practically, when a naturalist can unite by means of intermediate links any two forms, he treats the one as a variety of the other, ranking the most common, but sometimes the one first described as the species, and the other as the variety. But cases of great difficulty, which I will not here enumerate, can sometimes arise in deciding whether or not to rank one form as a variety of another, even when they are closely connected by intermediate links. Nor will the commonly assumed hybrid nature of the intermediate forms always remove the difficulty. In very many cases, however, one form is ranked as a variety of another, not because the intermediate links have actually been found, but because analogy leads the observer to suppose either that they do now somewhere exist, or may formerly have existed, and here a wide door for the entry of doubt and conjecture is opened. Hence, in determining whether a form should be ranked as a species or a variety, the opinion of naturalists having sound judgment and wide experience seems the only guide to follow. We must, however, in many cases, decide by a majority of naturalists, for few well-marked and well-known varieties can be named which have not been ranked as species by at least some competent judges. That varieties of this doubtful nature are far from uncommon cannot be disputed. Compare the several floras of Great Britain, of France, or of the United States, drawn up by different botanists, and see what a surprising number of forms have been ranked by one botanist as good species, and by another as mere varieties. Mr. H. C. Watson, to whom I lie under deep obligation for assistance of all kinds, has marked for me 182 British plants, which are generally considered as varieties, but which have all been ranked by botanists as species, and in making this list he has omitted many trifling varieties, but which nevertheless have been ranked by some botanists as species, and he has entirely omitted several highly polymorphic genera. Under genera, including the most polymorphic forms, Mr. Babington gives 251 species, whereas Mr. Bentham gives only 112, a difference of 139 doubtful forms. Among animals which unite for each birth, and which are highly locomotive, doubtful forms, ranked by one zoologist as a species, and by another as a variety, can rarely be found within the same country, but are common in separated areas. How many of the birds and insects in North America and Europe, which differ very slightly from each other, have been ranked by one eminent naturalist as undoubted species, and by another as varieties, or, as they are often called, geographical races. Mr. Wallace, in several valuable papers on the various animals, 
especially on the Lepidoptera, inhabiting the islands of the great Malayan archipelago, shows that they may be classed under four heads, namely, as variable forms, as local forms, as geographical races or subspecies, and as true representative species. The first or variable forms vary much within the limits of the same island. The local forms are moderately constant, and distinct in each separate island. But when all from the several islands are compared together, the differences are seen to be so slight and graduated, that it is impossible to define or describe them, though at the same time the extreme forms are sufficiently distinct. The geographical races or subspecies are local forms completely fixed and isolated, but as they do not differ from each other by strongly marked and important characters, there is no possible test but individual opinion to determine which of them shall be considered as species and which as varieties. Lastly, representative species fill the same place in the natural economy of each island, as do the local forms and subspecies, but, as they are distinguished from each other by a greater amount of difference than that between the local forms and subspecies, they are almost universally ranked by naturalists as true species. Nevertheless, no certain criterion can possibly be given by which variable forms, local forms, subspecies, and representative species can be recognized. Many years ago, when comparing and seeing others compare the birds from the closely neighboring islands of the Galapagos archipelago, one with another, and with those from the American mainland, I was much struck how entirely vague and arbitrary is the distinction between species and varieties. On the islets of the little Madeira group there are many insects which are characterized as varieties, in Mr. Wollaston's admirable work, but which would certainly be ranked as distinct species by many entomologists. Even Ireland has a few animals, now generally regarded as varieties, but which have been ranked as species by some zoologists. Several experienced ornithologists consider our British red grouse as only a strongly marked race of a Norwegian species, whereas the greater number rank it as an undoubted species peculiar to Great Britain. A wide distance between the homes of two doubtful forms leads many naturalists to rank them as distinct species. But what distance, it has been well asked, will suffice? If that between America and Europe is ample, will that between Europe and the Azores, or Madeira, or the Canaries, or between the several islets of these small archipelagos, be sufficient? Mr. B. D. Walsh, a distinguished entomologist of the United States, has described what he calls phytophagic varieties and phytophagic species. Most vegetable-feeding insects live on one kind of plant, or on one group of plants. Some feed indiscriminately on many kinds, but do not in consequence vary. In several cases, however, Insects found living on different plants have been observed by Mr. Walsh to present in their larval or mature state, or in both states, slight, though constant, differences in color, size, or in the nature of their secretions. In some instances the males alone, in other instances both males and females, have been observed thus to differ in a slight degree. When the differences are rather more strongly marked, and when both sexes and all ages are affected, the forms are ranked by all entomologists as good species. But no observer can determine for another, even if he can do so for himself, which of these phytophagic forms ought to be called species, and which varieties. Mr. 
Mr. Walsh ranks the forms which it may be supposed would freely intercross as varieties, and those which appear to have lost this power as species. As the differences depend on the insects having long fed on distinct plants, it cannot be expected that intermediate links connecting the several forms should now be found. The naturalist thus loses his best guide in determining whether to rank doubtful forms as varieties or species. This likewise necessarily occurs with closely allied organisms which inhabit distinct continents or islands. When, on the other hand, an animal or plant ranges over the same continent, or inhabits many islands in the same archipelago, and presents different forms in the different areas, there is always a good chance that intermediate forms will be discovered which will link together the extreme states, and these are then degraded to the rank of varieties. Some few naturalists maintain that animals never present varieties, but then these same naturalists rank the slightest difference as of specific value, and when the same identical form is met with in two distant countries, or in two geological formations, they believe that two distinct species are hidden under the same dress. The term species thus comes to be a mere useless abstraction, implying and assuming a separate act of creation. It is certain that many forms, considered by highly competent judges to be varieties, resemble species so completely in character that they have been thus ranked by other highly competent judges. But to discuss whether they ought to be called species or varieties, before any definition of these terms has been generally accepted, is vainly to beat the air. Many of the cases of strongly marked varieties, or doubtful species, well deserve consideration, for several interesting lines of argument, from geographical distribution, analogical variation, hybridism, etc., have been brought to bear in the attempt to determine their rank, but space does not here permit me to discuss them. Close investigation, in many cases, will no doubt bring naturalists to agree how to rank doubtful forms. Yet it must be confessed that it is in the best-known countries that we find the greatest number of them. I have been struck with the fact that if any animal or plant in a state of nature be highly useful to man, or from any cause closely attracts his attention, varieties of it will almost universally be found recorded. These varieties, moreover, will often be ranked by some authors as species. Look at the common oak, how closely it has been studied, yet a German author makes more than a dozen species out of forms which are almost universally considered by other botanists to be varieties and in this country the highest botanical authorities and practical men can be quoted to show that the sessile and pedunculated oaks are either good and distinct species, or mere varieties. I may here allude to a remarkable memoir lately published by A. de Candolle on the oaks of the whole world. No one ever had more ample materials for the discrimination of the species, or could have worked on them with more zeal and sagacity. He first gives in detail all the many points of structure which vary in the several species, and estimates numerically the relative frequency of the variations. He specifies above a dozen characters which may be found varying even on the same branch, sometimes according to age or development, sometimes without any assignable reason. Such characters are not of course of specific value, but they are, as Asa Gray has remarked in commenting on this memoir, such as generally enter into specific definitions. De Candolle then goes on to say that he gives the rank of species to the forms that differ by characters never varying on the same tree, 
and never found connected by intermediate states. After this discussion, the result of so much labour, he emphatically remarks, They are mistaken, who repeat that the greater part of our species are clearly limited, and that the doubtful species are in a feeble minority. This seemed to be true, so long as a genus was imperfectly known, and its species were founded upon a few specimens, that is to say, were provisional. Just as we come to know them better, intermediate forms flow in, and doubts as to specific limits augment. He also adds that it is the best-known species which present the greatest number of spontaneous varieties and sub-varieties. Thus, Quercus rober has twenty-eight varieties, all of which, excepting six, are clustered round three subspecies, namely Q. pedunculata, Sessiliflora, and pubescens. The forms which connect these three subspecies are comparatively rare, and, as Asa Gray again remarks, if these connecting forms which are now rare were to become totally extinct, the three subspecies would hold exactly the same relation to each other as do the four or five provisionally admitted species which closely surround the typical Quercus rober. Finally, De Candol admits that, out of the three hundred species, which will be enumerated in his Prodromus as belonging to the oak family, at least two-thirds are provisional species, that is, are not known strictly to fulfil the definition above given of a true species. It should be added that De Candol no longer believes that species are immutable creations, but concludes that the derivative theory is the most natural one, and the most accordant with the known facts in paleontology, geographical botany, and zoology, of anatomical structure and classification. When a young naturalist commences the study of a group of organisms quite unknown to him, he is at first much perplexed in determining what differences to consider as specific, and what as varietal, for he knows nothing of the amount and kind of variation to which the group is subject, and this shows, at least, how very generally there is some variation. But if he confines his attention to one class within one country, he will soon make up his mind how to rank most of the doubtful forms. His general tendency will be to make many species, for he will become impressed, just like the pigeon or poultry fancier before alluded to, with the amount of difference in the forms which he is continually studying. And he has little general knowledge of analogical variation in other groups, and in other countries, by which to correct his first impressions. As he extends the range of his observations he will meet with more cases of difficulty, for he will encounter a greater number of closely allied forms. But if his observations be widely extended, he will in the end generally be able to make up his own mind, but he will succeed in this at the expense of admitting much variation, and the truth of this admission will often be disputed by other naturalists. When he comes to study allied forms brought from countries not now continuous, in which case he cannot hope to find intermediate links, he will be compelled to trust almost entirely to analogy, and his difficulties will rise to a climax. Certainly no clear line of demarcation has as yet been drawn between species and subspecies, that is, the forms which in the opinion of some naturalists come very near to, but do not quite arrive at, the rank of species, or, again, between subspecies and well-marked varieties, or between lesser varieties and individual differences. These differences blend into each other by an insensible series, 
and a series impresses the mind with the idea of an actual passage. Hence I look at individual differences, though of small interest to the systematist, as of the highest importance for us, as being the first step towards such slight varieties as are barely thought worth recording in works on natural history. And I look at varieties which are in any degree more distinct and permanent, as steps toward more strongly marked and permanent varieties, and, at the latter, as leading to subspecies, and then to species. The passage from one stage of difference to another may, in many cases, be the simple result of the nature of the organism, and of the different physical conditions to which it has long been exposed. But with respect to the more important and adaptive characters, the passage from one stage of difference to another may be safely attributed to the cumulative action of natural selection, hereafter to be explained, and to the effects of the increased use or disuse of parts. A well-marked variety may therefore be called an incipient species, but whether this belief is justifiable must be judged by the weight of the various facts and considerations to be given throughout this work. It need not be supposed that all varieties or incipient species attain the rank of species, they may become extinct, or they may endure as varieties for very long periods, as has been shown to be the case by Mr. Wollaston with the varieties of certain fossil land-shells in Madeira, and with plants by Gaston de Saporta. If a variety were to flourish so as to exceed in numbers the parent species, it would then rank as the species, and the species as the variety or it might come to supplant and exterminate the parent species, or both might coexist, and both rank as independent species. But we shall hereafter return to this subject. From these remarks it will be seen that I look at the term species, as one arbitrarily given, for the sake of convenience, to a set of individuals closely resembling each other, and that it does not essentially differ from the term variety, which is given to less distinct and more fluctuating forms. The term variety, again, in comparison with mere individual differences, is also applied arbitrarily, for convenience sake. Wide-ranging, much diffused, and common species vary most. Guided by theoretical considerations, I thought that some interesting results might be obtained in regard to the nature and relations of the species which vary most, by tabulating all the varieties in several well-worked floras. At first this seemed a simple task, but Mr. H. C. Watson, to whom I am much indebted for valuable advice and assistance on this subject, soon convinced me that there were many difficulties, as did subsequently Dr. Hooker, even in stronger terms. I shall reserve for a future work the discussion of these difficulties, and the tables of the proportional numbers of the varying species. Dr. Hooker permits me to add that, after having carefully read my manuscript, and examined the tables, he thinks that the following statements are fairly well established. The whole subject, however, treated as it necessarily here is with much brevity, is rather perplexing, and allusions cannot be avoided to the struggle for existence, divergence of character, and other questions hereafter to be discussed. Alphonse de Candolle and others have shown that plants which have very wide ranges generally present varieties and this might have been expected, as they are exposed to diverse physical conditions, and as they come into competition, which, as we shall hereafter see, is a far more important circumstance, with different sets of organic beings. But my tables further show that, in any limited country, 
the species which are the most common, that is, abound most in individuals, and the species which are most widely diffused within their own country, and this is a different consideration from wide range, and to a certain extent from commonness, oftenest give rise to varieties sufficiently well marked to have been recorded in botanical works. Hence it is the most flourishing, or, as they may be called, the dominant species, those which range widely, are the most diffused in their own country, and are the most numerous in individuals, which oftenest produce well-marked varieties, or, as I consider them, incipient species. And this, perhaps, might have been anticipated, for, as varieties, in order to become in any degree permanent, necessarily have to struggle with the other inhabitants of the country, the species which are already dominant will be the most likely to yield offspring, which, though in some slight degree modified, still inherit those advantages that enabled their parents to become dominant over their compatriots. In these remarks on predominance, it should be understood that reference is made only to the forms which come into competition with each other, and more especially to the members of the same genus or class having nearly similar habits of life. With respect to the number of individuals, or commonness of species, the comparison of course relates only to the members of the same group. One of the higher plants may be said to be dominant, if it be more numerous in individuals, and more widely diffused, than the other plants of the same country, which live under nearly the same conditions. A plant of this kind is not the less dominant because some conferva inhabiting the water, or some parasitic fungus, is infinitely more numerous in individuals, and more widely diffused. But if the conferva, or parasitic fungus, exceeds its allies in the above respects, it will then be dominant within its own class. Species of the larger genera in each country vary more frequently than the species of the smaller genera. If the plants inhabiting a country, as described in any flora, be divided into two equal masses, all those in the larger genera, i.e., those including many species, being placed on one side, and all those in the smaller genera on the other side, the former will be found to include a somewhat larger number of the very common and much diffused or dominant species. This might have been anticipated, for the mere fact of many species of the same genus inhabiting any country shows that there is something in the organic or inorganic conditions of that country favourable to the genus, and consequently we might have expected to have found in the larger genera or those including many species, a larger proportional number of dominant species. But so many causes tend to obscure this result, that I am surprised that my tables show even a small majority on the side of the larger genera. I will here allude to only two causes of obscurity. Fresh water and salt-loving plants generally have very wide ranges, and are much diffused, but this seems to be connected with the nature of the stations inhabited by them, and has little or no relation to the size of the genera to which the species belong. Again, plants low in the scale of organization are generally much more widely diffused than plants higher in the scale, and here again there is no close relation to the size of the genera. The cause of lowly organized plants ranging widely will be discussed in our chapter on geographical distribution. From looking at species as only strongly marked and well-defined varieties, I was led to anticipate that the species of the larger genera in each country would oftener present varieties than the species of the smaller genera. For wherever many closely related species, i.e., species of the same genus, have been formed, many varieties or incipient species ought, 
as a general rule, to be now forming. Where many large trees grow, we expect to find saplings. Where many species of a genus have been formed through variation, circumstances have been favourable for variation, and hence we might expect that the circumstances would generally still be favourable to variation. On the other hand, if we look at each species as a special act of creation, there is no apparent reason why more varieties should occur in a group having many species than in one having few. To test the truth of this anticipation, I have arranged the plants of twelve countries, and the coleopterous insects of two districts, into two nearly equal masses, the species of the larger genera on one side, and those of the smaller genera on the other side, and it has invariably proved to be the case that a larger proportion of the species on the side of the larger genera presented varieties, than on the side of the smaller genera. Moreover, the species of the larger genera which present any varieties, invariably present a larger average number of varieties than do the species of the small genera. Both these results follow when another division is made, and when all the least genera, with from only one to four species, are altogether excluded from the tables. These facts are of plain signification on the view that species are only strongly marked and permanent varieties, for wherever many species of the same genus have been formed, or where, if we may use the expression, the manufactory of species has been active, we ought generally to find the manufactory still in action, more especially as we have every reason to believe the process of manufacturing new species to be a slow one. And this certainly holds true, if varieties be looked at as incipient species, for my tables clearly show, as a general rule, that, wherever many species of a genus have been formed, the species of that genus present a number of varieties, that is, of incipient species, beyond the average. It is not that all large genera are now varying much, and are thus increasing in the number of their species, or that no small genera are now varying and increasing. For if this had been so, it would have been fatal to my theory, inasmuch as geology plainly tells us that small genera have in the lapse of time often increased greatly in size, and that large genera have often come to their maxima, declined, and disappeared. All that we want to show is, that where many species of a genus have been formed, on an average many are still forming, and this certainly holds good. Many of the species included within the larger genera resemble varieties in being very closely, but unequally, related to each other, and in having restricted ranges. There are other relations between the species of large genera and their recorded varieties, which deserve notice. We have seen that there is no infallible criterion by which to distinguish species and well-marked varieties, and when intermediate links have not been found between doubtful forms, naturalists are compelled to come to a determination by the amount of difference between them, judging by analogy whether or not the amount suffices to raise one or both to the rank of species. Hence the amount of difference is one very important criterion in settling whether two forms should be ranked as species or varieties. Now, Fries has remarked in regard to plants, and Westwood in regard to insects, that in large genera the amount of difference between the species is often exceedingly small. I have endeavoured to test this numerically by averages, and, as far as my imperfect results go, they confirm the view. I have also consulted some sagacious and experienced observers, and, after deliberation, they concur in this view. In this respect, therefore, the species of the larger genera resemble varieties, 
more than do the species of the smaller genera. Or, the case may be put in another way, and it may be said that in the larger genera, in which a number of varieties or incipient species greater than the average are now manufacturing, many of the species already manufactured still to a certain extent resemble varieties, for they differ from each other by a less than the usual amount of difference. Moreover, the species of the larger genera are related to each other in the same manner as the varieties of any one species are related to each other. No naturalist pretends that all the species of a genus are equally distinct from each other. They may generally be divided into subgenera, or sections, or lesser groups. As Fries has well remarked, little groups of species are generally clustered like satellites around other species. And what are varieties but groups of forms? unequally related to each other, and clustered round certain forms, that is, round their parent species. Undoubtedly there is one most important point of difference between varieties and species, namely, that the amount of difference between varieties, when compared with each other, or with their parent species, is much less than that between the species of the same genus. But when we come to discuss the principle, as I call it, of divergence of character, we shall see how this may be explained, and how the lesser differences between varieties tend to increase into the greater differences between species. There is one other point which is worth notice. Varieties generally have much restricted ranges. This statement is indeed scarcely more than a truism. For, if a variety were found to have a wider range than that of its supposed parent species, their denominations would be reversed. But there is reason to believe that the species which are very closely allied to other species, and in so far resemble varieties, often have much restricted ranges. For instance, Mr. H. C. Watson has marked for me, in the well-sifted London catalogue of plants, fourth edition, sixty-three plants, which are therein ranked as species, but which he considers as so closely allied to other species as to be of doubtful value. These sixty-three reputed species range on an average over six point nine of the provinces into which Mr. Watson has divided Great Britain. Now, in this same catalogue, fifty-three acknowledged varieties are recorded, and these range over 7.7 .7 provinces. Whereas, the species to which these varieties belong range over 14.3 provinces. So that the acknowledged varieties have very nearly the same restricted average range, as have the closely allied forms, marked for me by Mr. Watson as doubtful species, but which are almost universally ranked by British botanists as good and true species. Summary Finally, varieties cannot be distinguished from species, except, first, by the discovery of intermediate linking forms, and, secondly, by a certain indefinite amount of difference between them. For two forms, if differing very little, are generally ranked as varieties, notwithstanding that they cannot be closely connected. But the amount of difference considered necessary to give to any two forms the rank of species cannot be defined. In genera having more than the average number of species in any country, the species of these genera have more than the average number of varieties. In large genera the species are apt to be closely, but unequally, allied together, forming little clusters round other species. Species very closely allied to other species apparently have restricted ranges. In all these respects the species of large genera present a strong analogy with varieties. And we can clearly understand these analogies, 
if species once existed as varieties and thus originated, whereas these analogies are utterly inexplicable if species are independent creations. We have also seen that it is the most flourishing or dominant species of the larger genera within each class, which on an average yield the greatest number of varieties, and varieties, as we shall hereafter see, tend to become converted into new and distinct species. Thus the larger genera tend to become larger, and throughout nature the forms of life which are now dominant tend to become still more dominant, by leaving many modified and dominant descendants. But, by steps hereafter to be explained, the larger genera also tend to break up into smaller genera. And thus, the forms of life throughout the universe become divided into groups subordinate to groups. End of chapter 2 Read by Kara Schallenberg on February 9, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Chapter 3, Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection, 6th edition. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 3. The Struggle for Existence. It's bearing on natural selection, the term used in a wide sense, geometrical ratio of increase, rapid increase of naturalized animals and plants, nature of the checks to increase, competition universal, effects of climate, protection from the number of individuals, complex relations of all animals and plants throughout nature, struggle for life most severe between individuals and varieties of the same species, often severe between species of the same genus, the relation of organism to organism, the most important of all relations. Before entering on the subject of this chapter, I must make a few preliminary remarks on how the struggle for existence bears on natural selection. It has been seen in the last chapter that among organic beings in a state of nature there is some individual variability. Indeed, I am not aware that this has ever been disputed. It is immaterial for us whether a multitude of doubtful forms be called species or subspecies or varieties. What rank, for instance, the two or three hundred doubtful forms of British plants are entitled to hold if the existence of any well-marked varieties be admitted. But the mere existence of individual variability, and of some few well-marked varieties, though necessary as the foundation for the work, helps us but little in understanding how species arise in nature. How have all those exquisite adaptations of one part of the organization to another part, and to the conditions of life, and of one organic being to another being, been perfected? We see these beautiful co-adaptations most plainly in the woodpecker and the mistletoe, and only a little less plainly in the humblest parasite which clings to the hairs of a quadruped or feathers of a bird, in the structure of the beetle which drives through the water, in the plumed seed which is wafted by the gentlest breeze. In short, we see beautiful adaptations everywhere and in every part of the organic world. Again, it may be asked, how is it that varieties which I have called incipient species become ultimately converted into good and distinct species which in most cases obviously differ from each other far more than do the varieties of the same species how do those groups of species which constitute what are called distinct genera and which differ from each other more than do the species of the same genus arise all these results as we shall more fully see in the next chapter follow from the struggle for life Owing to this struggle, variations, however slight, and from whatever cause proceeding, if they may be in any degree profitable to the individuals of a species, in their infinitely complex relations to other organic beings, and to their physical conditions of life, will tend to the preservation of such individuals, and will generally be inherited by the offspring. 
The offspring also will thus have a better chance of surviving, for of the many individuals of any species which are periodically born, but a small number can survive. I have called this principle, by which each slight variation, if useful, is preserved, by the term natural selection, in order to mark its relation to man's power of selection. But the expression is often used by Mr. Herbert Spencer of the survival of the fittest is more accurate, and is sometimes equally convenient. We have seen that man by selection can certainly produce great results and can adapt organic beings to his own uses through the accumulation of slight but useful variations given to him by the hand of nature. But natural selection, we shall hereafter see, is a power incessantly ready for action, and is as immeasurably superior to man's feeble efforts as the work of nature are to those of art. We will now discuss in a little more detail the struggle for existence. In my future work this subject will be treated, as it well deserves, at greater length. The ed elder de Candole and Lyell have largely and philosophically shown that all organic beings are exposed to severe competition. In regard to plants, no one has treated this subject with more spirit and ability than W. Herbert, Dean of Manchester, evidently the result of his great horticultural knowledge. Nothing is easier than to admit, in words, the truth of the universal struggle for life, or more difficult, at least I found it so, than constantly to bear this conclusion in mind. Yet unless it be thoroughly ingrained in the mind, the whole economy of nature, with every fact on distribution, rarity, abundance, extinction, and variation, will be dimly seen or quite misunderstood. We behold the face of nature bright with gladness. We often see superabundance of food. We do not see, or we forget, that the birds which are idly singing round us mostly live on insects or seeds, and are thus constantly destroying life. Or we forget how largely these songsters, or their eggs, or their nestlings, are destroyed by birds and beasts of prey. We do not always bear in mind that, though food may be now superabundant, it is not so at all seasons of each recurring year. The term struggle for existence used in a large sense. I should premise that I use this term in a large and metaphorical sense, including independence of one being on another, and including, which is more important, not only the life of the individual, but success in leaving progeny. Two canine animals, in a time of death, may be truly said to struggle with each other, which shall get food and live. But a plant on the edge of a desert is said to struggle for life against drought, though more, though more properly it should be said to be dependent on the moisture. A plant which annually produces a thousand seeds, of which only one of an average comes to maturity, may be more truly said to struggle with the plants of the same kind, and other kinds which are already clothing the ground. The mistletoe is dependent on the apple and a few other trees, but can only, in a far-fetched sense, be said to struggle with these trees. For, if too many of these parasites grow on the same tree, it languishes and dies. But several seedling mistletoes, growing close together on the same branch, may more truly be said to struggle with each other. As the mistletoe is disseminated by birds, its existence depends on them, and it may metaphorically be said to struggle with other fruit-bearing plants in tempting the birds to devour and thus disseminate its seed. In these several senses which pass into each other, I use for convenience sake the general term struggle for existence. Geometrical Ratio of Increase a struggle for existence inevitably follows from the high rate at which all organic beings tend to increase. Every being which during its natural lifetime produces several eggs or seeds must suffer destruction during the same period of its life, and during some season or occasional year. Otherwise, on the principle of geometrical increase, its numbers would quickly become so inordinately great that no country could support the product. Hence, as more individuals are produced than can possibly survive, there must in every case be a struggle for existence, either one individual with another of the same species, or with the individuals of distinct species, or with the physical conditions of life. 
It is the doctrine of Malthus, applied with manifold force to the whole animal and vegetable kingdoms. For in this case there can be no artificial increase of food and no prudential restraint from marriage, although some species may be now increasing more or less rapidly in numbers, all cannot do so, for the world would not hold them. There is no exception to the rule that every organic being naturally increases at so high a rate, that, if not destroyed, the earth would soon be covered by the progeny of a single pair. Even slow-breeding man has doubled in twenty-five years, and at this rate, in less than a thousand years, there would literally not be standing room for this progeny. Linnaeus has calculated that if an annual plant produced only two seeds, and there is no plant so unproductive as this, and their seedlings next year produced two, and so on, then in twenty years there would be a million plants. The elephant is reckoned the slowest breeder of all known animals, and I have taken some pains to estimate its probable minimum rate of natural increase. It will be safest to assume that it begins breeding when thirty years old, and goes on breeding till ninety years old, bringing forth six young in the interval, and surviving till one hundred years old. If this be so, after a period from 740 to 750 years, there would be nearly 19 million elephants alive descended from the first pair. But we have better evidence on this subject than mere theoretical calculations, namely the numerous recorded cases of the astonishingly rapid increase of various animals in a state of nature, when circumstances have been favorable to them during two or three following seasons. Still more striking is the evidence from our domestic animals of many kinds which have run wild in several parts of the world. If the statements of the rate of increase of slow-breeding cattle and horses in South America, and latterly Australia, had not been well authenticated, they would have been incredible. So it is with plants. Cases could be given of introduced plants which have become common throughout whole islands in a period of less than ten years. Several of the plants, such as the cardoon and tall thistle, which are now the commonest over the wide plains of La Plata, clothing square leagues of surface almost to the exclusion of every other plant, have been introduced from Europe. And there are plants which now range in India, as I hear from Dr. Falconer, from Cape Comorin, to the Himalaya, which have been imported from America since its discovery. In such cases, and endless others could be given, no one supposes that the fertility of the animals or plants has been suddenly and temporarily increased in any sensible degree. The obvious explanation is that the conditions of life have been highly favorable, and that there has consequently been less destruction of the old and young, and that nearly all the young have been enabled to breed. Their geometrical ratio of increase, the result of which never fails to be surprising, simply explains their extraordinarily rapid increase and wide diffusion in their new homes. In a state of nature, almost every full-grown plant annually produces seed, and among animals there are very few which do not annually pair. Hence we may confidently assert that all plants and animals are tending to increase at a geometrical ratio that all would rapidly stock every station in which they could anyhow exist, and that this geometrical tendency to increase must be checked by destruction at some period of life. Our familiarity with the larger domestic animals tends, I think, to mislead us. We see no great destruction falling on them, and we do not keep in mind that thousands are annually slaughtered for food, and that in a state of nature an equal number would have somehow to be disposed of. The only difference between organisms which annually produce eggs or seeds by the thousand and those which produce extremely few is that the slow breeders would require a few more years to people, under favorable conditions, a whole district, let it be ever so large. The condor lays a couple of eggs and the ostrich a score, and yet in the same country the condor may be the most numerous of the two. The fulmar petrel lays but one egg, it is believed to be the most numerous bird in the world. One fly deposits hundreds of eggs, and another, like the hippobosca, a single one. But this difference does not determine how many individuals of the two species can be supported in a district. A large number of eggs is of some importance to those species which depend on a fluctuating amount of food, for it allows them to rapidly increase in number. 
but the real importance of a large number of eggs or seeds is to make up for much destruction at some period of life and this period in the great majority of cases is an early one if an animal can in any way protect its own eggs or young a small number may be produced and yet the average stock be fully kept up but if many eggs or young are destroyed many must be produced or the species will become extinct it would suffice to keep up the full number of a tree which lived on average for a thousand years if a single seed were produced once in a thousand years supposing that this seed were never destroyed and could be ensured to germinate in a fitting place so that in all cases the average number of any animal or plant depends only indirectly on the number of its eggs or seeds in looking at nature it is most necessary to keep the foregoing considerations always in mind never to forget that every single organic being may be said to be striving to the utmost to increase their numbers that each lives by a struggle at some period of its life that heavy destruction inevitably falls either on the young or old during each generation or at recurrent intervals lighten any check mitigate the destruction ever so little and the number of the species will almost instantaneously increase to any amount nature of the checks to increase the causes which check the natural tendency of each species to increase are most obscure look at the most vigorous species by as much as it swarms in numbers by so much it will tend to increase still further we know not exactly what the checks are in a single instance nor will this surprise any one who reflects on how ignorant we are on this head even in regard to mankind although so incomparably better known than any other animal this subject of the checks to increase has been ably treated by several authors and i hope in a future work to discuss it at considerable length more especially in regard to the feral animals of south america here i will make only a few remarks just to recall the reader's mind some of the chief points eggs or very young animals seem generally to suffer most but this is not invariably the case with plants there is a vast destruction of seeds but from some observations which i have made it appears that the seedlings suffer most from germinating in ground already thickly stocked with other plants seedlings also are destroyed in vast numbers by various enemies for instance on a piece of ground three feet long and two wide dug and cleared where there could be no choking from other plants i marked all the seedlings of our native weeds as they came up and out of three hundred and fifty seven no less than two hundred and ninety five were destroyed chiefly by slugs and insects if turf which has long been mown and the case would be the same with turf closely browsed by quadrupeds be let to grow the more vigorous plants gradually kill the less vigorous though fully grown plants thus out of twenty species grown on a little plot of mown turf three feet by four nine species perished from the other species being allowed to grow up freely the amount of food for each species of course gives the extreme limit to which each can increase but very frequently it is not the obtaining food but the serving as prey to other animals which determines the average number of a species thus there seems to be little doubt that the stock of partridges grouse and hares on any large estate depends chiefly on the destruction of vermin if not one head of game were shot during the next twenty years in england and at the same time if no vermin were destroyed there would in all probability be less game than at present although hundreds of thousands of game animals are now annually shot on the other hand in some cases as with the elephant none are destroyed by beasts of prey for even the tiger in india most rarely dares to attack a young elephant protected by its dam climate plays an important part in determining the average numbers of a species and periodical seasons of extreme cold or drought seem to be the most effective of all checks i estimated chiefly from the greatly reduced numbers of nests in the spring that the winter of eighteen fifty four fifty five destroyed four-fifths of the birds in my own grounds and this is a tremendous destruction when we remember that ten per cent is an extraordinarily severe mortality from epidemics with man the action of climate seems at first sight to be quite independent of the struggle for existence 
but in so far as climate chiefly acts in reducing food it brings on the most severe struggle between the individuals whether of the same district species which subsist on the same kind of food even when climate for instance extreme cold acts directly it will be the least vigorous individuals or those which have got least food through the advancing winter which will suffer the most when we travel from south to north or from a damp region to a dry we invariably see some species gradually getting rarer and rarer and finally disappearing and the change of climate being conspicuous we are tempted to attribute the whole effect to its direct action but this is a false view we forget that each species even where it most abounds is constantly suffering enormous destruction at some period of its life from enemies or from competitors for the same place in food and if these enemies or competitors be in the least degree favored by any slight change of climate they will increase in numbers and as each area is already fully stocked with inhabitants the other species must decrease when we travel southward and see a species decreasing in numbers we may feel sure that the cause lies quite as much in other species being favored as in this one being hurt so it is when we travel northward but in a somewhat lesser degree for the number of species of all kinds and therefore of competitors decreases northwards hence in going northward or in ascending a mountain we far oftener meet with stunted forms due to the directly injurious action of climate than we do in proceeding southward or in descending a mountain when we reach the arctic regions or snow-capped summits or absolute deserts the struggle for life is almost exclusively with the elements that climate acts in main part indirectly by favoring other species we clearly see in the prodigious number of plants which in our gardens can perfectly well endure our climate but which never become naturalized for they cannot compete with our native plants nor resist destruction by our native animals when a species owing to highly favorable circumstances increases inordinately in numbers in a small tract epidemics at least this seems generally to occur with our game animals often ensue and here we have a limiting check independent of the struggle for life but even some of these so-called epidemics appear to be due to parasitic worms which have from some cause possibly in part through facility of diffusion among the crowded animals been disproportionately favored and here comes in a sort of struggle between the parasite and its prey on the other hand in many cases a large stock of individuals of the same species relatively to the numbers of its enemies is absolutely necessary for its preservation thus we can easily raise plenty of corn and rapeseed etc in our fields because the seeds are in great excess compared with the number of birds which feed on them nor can the birds though having a superabundance of food at this one season increase in number proportionately to the supply of seed as their numbers are checked during the winter but any one who has tried knows how troublesome it is to get seed from a few wheat and other such plants in a garden i have in this case lost every single seed this view of the necessity of a large stock of the same species for its preservation explains i believe some singular facts in nature such as that of very rare plants being sometimes extremely abundant in the few spots where they do exist and that of some social plants being social that is abounding in individuals even on the extreme verge of their range for in such cases we may believe that a plant could exist only where the conditions of its life were so favorable that many could exist together and thus save the species from utter destruction i should add that the good effects of intercrossing and the ill effects of close inbreeding no doubt come into play in many of these cases but i will not here enlarge on this subject complex relations of all animals and plants to each other in the struggle for existence many cases are on record showing how complex and unexpected are the checks and relations between organic beings which have to struggle together in the same country i will give only a single instance which though a simple one interested me in staffordshire on the estate of a relation where i had ample means of investigation there was a large and extremely barren heath which had never been touched by the hand of man but several hundred acres of exactly the same nature had been enclosed twenty-five years previously and planted with scotch fir the change in the native vegetation of the planted part of the heath was most remarkable 
more than is generally seen in passing from one quite different soil to another. Not only the proportional numbers of the heath plants were wholly changed, but twelve species of plants, not counting grasses and carices, flourished in the plantations, which could not be found in the heath. The effect on the insects must have been still greater, for six insectivorous birds were very common in the plantations, which were not to be seen on the heath, and the heath was frequented by two or three distinct insectivorous birds. Here we see how potent has been the effect of the introduction of a single tree, nothing whatever else having been done, with the exception of the land having been enclosed, so that cattle could not enter. But how important an element enclosure is, I plainly saw near Farnham in Surrey. Here there are extensive heaths, with a few clumps of old Scotch firs on the distant hilltops. Within the last ten years large spaces have been enclosed, and self-sown firs are now springing up in multitudes, so close together that all cannot live. When I ascertained that these young trees had not been sown or planted, I was so much surprised at their numbers that I went to several points of view, whence I could examine hundreds of acres of the enclosed heath, and literally I could not see a single scotch fir except the old planted clumps. But on looking closely between the stems of a heath, I found a multitude of seedlings and little trees, which had been perpetually browsed down by the cattle. In one square yard, at a point some hundred yards distance from the old clumps, I counted thirty-two little trees, and one of them, with twenty-six rings of growth, had, during many years, tried to raise its head above the stems of the heath, and had failed. No wonder that as soon as the land was enclosed it became thickly clothed with vigorously growing young firs, yet the heath was so extremely barren and so extensive that no one would ever have imagined that cattle would have so closely and effectually searched it for food. Here we see that cattle absolutely determine the existence of the Scotch fir, but in several parts of the world insects determine the existence of cattle. Perhaps Paraguay offers the most curious instance of this, for here neither cattle nor horses nor dogs have ever run wild, though they swarm southward and northward in a feral state. And Azara and Renegar have shown that this is caused by the greater number in Paraguay of a certain fly which lays its eggs in the navels of these animals when first born. The increase of these flies, numerous as they are, must be habitually checked by some means, probably by other parasitic insects. Hence, if certain insectivorous birds were to decrease in Paraguay, the parasitic insects would probably increase, and this would lessen the number of the navel frequenting flies, then cattle and horses would become feral, and this would certainly greatly alter, as indeed I have observed in parts of South America, the vegetation. This again would largely affect the insects, and this, as we have just seen in Staffordshire, the insectivorous birds, and so onwards in ever-increasing circles of complexity. Not that under nature the relations will ever be as simple as this, Battle within battle must be continually recurring with varying success, and yet in the long run the forces are so nicely balanced that the face of nature remains for long periods of time uniform, though assuredly the merest trifle would give the victory to one organic being over another. Nevertheless, so profound is our ignorance and so high our presumption that we marvel when we hear of the extinction of an organic being and as we do not see the cause we invoke cataclysms to desolate the world or invent laws on the duration of the forms of life i am tempted to give one more instance showing how plants and animals remote in the scale of nature are bound together by a web of complex relations i shall hereafter have occasion to show that the exotic lobelia fulgens is never visited in my garden by insects and consequently from its particular structure never sets a seed Nearly all our orchidaceous plants absolutely require the visits of insects to remove their pollen masses and thus to fertilize them. I find from experiments that humble bees are almost indispensable to the fertilization of the heart seas, viola tricolor, for other bees do not visit this flower. I have also found that the visits of bees are necessary for the fertilizations of some kinds of clover, for instance, twenty heads of Dutch clover, trifolium repens yielded two thousand two hundred and ninety seeds but twenty other heads protected from bees produced not one again a hundred heads of red clover t pratens 
produced 2,700 seeds, but the same number of protected heads produced not a single seed. Humble bees alone visited red clover, as other bees cannot reach the nectar. It has been suggested that moths may fertilize the clovers, but I doubt whether they could do so in the case of the red clover, from their weight not being sufficient to depress the wing petals. Hence we may infer as highly probable that, if the whole genus of humble-bees came extinct or very rare in England, the heartsees and red clover would become very rare or wholly disappear. The number of humble-bees in any district depends in a great measure upon the number of field-mice which destroy their combs and nest. And Colonel Newman, who has long attended to the habits of humble-bees, believes that more than two-thirds of them are thus destroyed all over England. Now the number of mice is largely dependent, as everyone knows, on the number of cats. And Colonel Newman says, near villages and small towns I have found the nests of humble bees more numerous than elsewhere, which I attribute to the number of cats that destroy the mice. Hence it is quite credible that the presence of a feline animal in large numbers in a district might determine, through the intervention first of mice and then of bees, the frequency of certain flowers in that district. In the case of every species, many different checks, acting at different periods of life and during different seasons of the year, probably come into play. Some one check, or some few being generally the most potent, but all will concur in determining the average number or even the existence of species. In some cases it can be shown that widely different checks act on the same species in different districts. When we look at the plants and bushes clothing an ent entangled bank, we are tempted to attribute their proportional numbers and kinds to what we call chance. But how false a view is this? Everyone has heard that when an American forest is cut down, a very different vegetation springs up. But it has been observed that ancient Indian ruins in the southern United States, which must formerly have been cleared of trees, now display the same beautiful diversity and proportion of kinds as in the surrounding virgin forests. What a struggle must have gone on during long centuries between several kinds of trees, each annually scattering its seed by the thousand. What war between insect and insect, between insects, snails, and other animals with birds and beasts of prey, all striving to increase, all feeding on each other, or on the trees, their seeds and seedlings, or on the other plants which first clothed the ground and thus checked the growth of trees. Throw up a handful of feathers, and all fall to the ground according to definite laws. But how simple is the problem of where each shall fall compared to that of the action and reaction of the innumerable plants and animals, which have determined in the course of centuries the proportional numbers and kinds of trees now growing on the old Indian ruins. The dependency of one organic being on another, as a parasite on its prey, lies generally between beings remote in the scale of nature. This is likewise sometimes the case with those which may strictly be said to struggle with each other for existence, as in the case of locusts and grass-feeding quadrupeds but the struggle will almost invariably be most severe between the individuals of the same species, for they frequent the same districts, require the same food, and are exposed to the same dangers. In the case of varieties of the same species, the struggle will generally be almost equally severe, and we sometimes see the contest soon decided. For instance, if several varieties of wheat be sown together, and the mixed seed be re-sown, some of the varieties which best suit the soil or climate, or are naturally the most fertile, will beat the others and so yield more seed, and will consequently, in a few years, supplant the other varieties. To keep up a mixed stock of even such extremely close varieties as the variously colored sweet peas, they must be each year harvested separately, and the seed then mixed in due proportion otherwise the weaker kinds will steadily decrease in number and disappear. So again with the varieties of sheep. It has been asserted that certain mountain varieties will starve out other mountain varieties so that they cannot be kept together. The same result has followed from keeping together different varieties of medicinal leech. It may even be doubted whether the varieties of any of our domestic plants or animals have so exactly the same strength, habits, and constitution that the original proportions of a mixed stock, crossing being prevented, could be kept up for half a dozen generations. 
if they were allowed to struggle together in the same manner as beings in a state of nature, and if the seed or young were not annually preserved in due proportion. Struggle for life most severe between individuals and varieties of the same species. As the species of the same genus usually have, though by no means invariably, much similarity in habits and constitution, and always in structure, the struggle will generally be more severe between them, if they come into competition with each other, than between the species of district genera. We see this in the recent extension over parts of the United States of one species of swallow having caused the decrease of another species. The recent increase of the missile thrush in parts of Scotland has caused the decrease of the song thrush. How frequently we hear of one species of rat taking the place of another species under the most different climates. In Russia, the small Asiatic cockroach has everywhere driven before it its great cogener. In Australia, the imported hive bee is rapidly exterminating the small stingless native bee. One species of charlock has been known to supplant another species. And so, in other cases, we can dimly see why the competition should be most severe between allied forms, which fill nearly the same place in the economy of nature. But probably in no one case could we precisely say why one species has been victorious over another in the great battle of life. A corollary of the highest importance may be deduced from the foregoing remarks, namely, that the structure of every organic being is related, in the most essential yet often hidden manner, to that of all other organic beings, with which it comes into competition for food or resilience, or from which it has to escape, or on which it preys. This is obvious in the structure of the teeth and talons of the tiger, and in that of the legs and claws of the parasite which clings to the hair of the tiger's body. But in the beautifully plumed seed of the dandelion, and in the flattened and fringed legs of the water beetle, the relation seems at first confined to the elements of air and water. Yet the advantage of the plumed seeds no doubt stands in the closest relation to the land being already thickly clothed with other plants, so that the seed may be widely distributed and fall on unoccupied ground. In the water beetle, the structure of its legs, so well adapted for diving, allows it to compete with other aquatic insects, to hunt for its own prey, and to escape serving as prey to other animals. The store of nutriment laid up within the seeds of many plants seem at first sight to have no sort of relation to other plants, but from the strong growth of young plants produced from such seeds as peas and beans, when sown in the midst of long grass, it may be suspected that the chief use of the nutriment in the seed is to favor the growth of the seedlings while struggling with other plants growing vigorously all around. Look at a plant in the midst of its range. Why does it not double or quadruple its numbers? We know that it can perfectly well withstand a little more heat or cold, dampness or dryness, for elsewhere it ranges into slightly hotter or colder, damper or drier districts. In this case, we can clearly see that if we wish, in imagination, to give the plant the power of increasing in numbers, we should have to give it some advantage over its competitors, or over the animals which prey on it. On the confines of its geographical range, a change of constitution with respect to climate would clearly be an advantage to our plant. But we have reason to believe that only a few plants or animals range so far that they are destroyed exclusively by the rigor of the climate. Not until we reach the extreme confines of life in the Arctic regions or on the borders of an utter desert will competition cease. The land may be extremely cold or dry, yet there will be competition between some few species or between the individuals of the same species for the warmest or dampest spots. Hence we can see that when a plant or animal is placed in a new country, among new competitors, the conditions of its life will generally be changed in an essential manner, although the climate may be exactly the same as in its former home. If its average numbers are to increase in its new home, we should have to modify it in a different way to what we should have had to do in its native country, for we should have to give it some advantage over a different set of competitors or enemies. It is good thus to try in imagination to give one species an advantage over another. Probably in no single instance should we know what to do, 
This ought to convince us of our ignorance on the mutual relations of all organic beings, a conviction necessary as it is difficult to acquire. All that we can do is keep steadily in mind that each organic being is striving to increase in a geometrical ratio, that each, at some period of its life, during some season of the year, during each generation, or at intervals, has to struggle for life and to suffer great destruction. When we reflect on this struggle, we may console ourselves with the full belief that the war of nature is not incessant, that no fear is felt, that death is generally prompt, and that the vigorous, the healthy, and the happy survive and multiply. End of chapter 3「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or the Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life. Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin. Chapter Number Four. Natural Selection, or the Survival of the Fittest. Section 1 of 3. Contents of this chapter include Natural Selection, its power compared with man's selection, its power on characters of trifling importance, its power at all ages and on both sexes. Sexual Selection. On the generality of intercrosses between the individuals of the same species. Circumstances favourable and unfavourable to the results of natural selection, namely, intercrossing, isolation, number of individuals. Slow action. Extinction caused by natural selection. Diversity of character related to the diversity of inhabitants of any small area, and to naturalization. Action of natural selection, through divergence of character and extinction, on the descendants from a common parent. Explains the grouping of all organic beings. Advance in organization. Low forms preserved. Convergence of character indefinite multiplication of species, and summary. How will the struggle for existence, briefly discussed in the last chapter, act in regard to variation? Can the principle of selection, which we have seen is so potent in the hands of man, apply under nature? I think we shall see that it can act most efficiently. Let the endless number of slight variations and individual differences occurring in our domestic productions, and in a lesser degree in those under nature, be borne in mind, as well as the strength of the hereditary tendency. Under domestication, it may truly be said that the whole organization becomes in some degree plastic. But the variability which we almost universally meet with in our domestic productions, is not directly produced, as Hooker and Asa Gray have well remarked, by man. He can neither originate varieties nor prevent their occurrence. He can only preserve and accumulate such as do occur. Unintentionally, he exposes organic beings to new and changing conditions of life, and variability ensues. But similar changes of conditions might and do occur under nature. Let it also be borne in mind how infinitely complex and close-fitting are the mutual relations of all organic beings to each other and to their physical conditions of life and consequently what infinitely varied diversities of structure might be of use to each being under changing conditions of life. Can it then be thought improbable 
seeing that variations useful to man have undoubtedly occurred, that other variations useful in some way to each being in the great and complex battle of life should occur in the course of many successive generations. If such do occur, can we doubt, remembering that many more individuals are born than can possibly survive, that individuals having any advantage, however slight, over others, would have the best chance of surviving and procreating their kind. On the other hand, we may feel sure that any variation in the least degree injurious would be rigidly destroyed. This preservation of favourable individual differences and variations and the destruction of those which are injurious, I have called natural selection, or the survival of the fittest. Variations neither useful nor injurious would not be affected by natural selection, and would be left either a fluctuating element, as perhaps we see in certain polymorphic species, or would ultimately become fixed, owing to the nature of the organism and the nature of the conditions. Several writers have misapprehended or objected to the term natural selection. Some have even imagined that natural selection induces variability, whereas it implies only the preservation of such variations as arise and are beneficial to the being under its conditions of life. No one objects to agriculturists speaking of the potent effects of man's selection, and in this case the individual differences given by nature, which man for some object selects, must of necessity first occur. Others have objected that the term selection implies conscious choice in the animals which become modified, and it has even been urged that, as plants have no volition, natural selection is not applicable to them. In the literal sense of the word, no doubt, natural selection is a false term. But whoever objected to chemists speaking of the elective affinities of the various elements? And yet an acid cannot strictly be said to elect the base with which it in preference combines. It has been said that I speak of natural selection as an active power or deity. But who objects to an author speaking of the attraction of gravity as ruling the movements of the planets? Everyone knows what is meant and is implied by such metaphorical expressions, and they are almost necessary for brevity. So again it is difficult to avoid personifying the word nature, and I mean by nature only the aggregate action and product of many natural laws, and by laws the sequence of events as ascertained by us. With a little familiarity, such superficial objections will be forgotten. We shall best understand the probable course of natural selection by taking the case of a country undergoing some slight physical change, for instance of climate. The proportional numbers of its inhabitants will almost immediately undergo a change, and some species will probably become extinct. We may conclude, from what we have seen of the intimate and complex manner in which the inhabitants of each country are bound together, that any change in the numerical proportions of the inhabitants, independently of the change of climate itself, would seriously affect the others. If the country were open on its borders, new forms would certainly immigrate, and this would likewise seriously disturb the relations of some of the former inhabitants. Let it be remembered how powerful the influence of a single introduced tree or mammal has been shown to be. But in the case of an island, 
or of a country partly surrounded by barriers, into which new and better adapted forms could not freely enter, we should then have places in the economy of nature which would assuredly be better filled up if some of the original inhabitants were in some manner modified. For had the area been open to immigration, these same places would have been seized on by intruders. In such cases, slight modifications, which in any way favoured the individuals of any species, by better adapting them to their altered conditions, would tend to be preserved, and natural selection would have free scope for the work of improvement. We have good reason to believe, as shown in the first chapter, that changes in the conditions of life give a tendency to increased variability, and in the foregoing cases the conditions changed, and this would manifestly be favourable to natural selection, by affording a better chance of the occurrence of profitable variations. Unless such occur, natural selection can do nothing. Under the term of variations, it must never be forgotten that mere individual differences are included. As man can produce a great result with his domestic animals and plants by adding up in any given direction individual differences, so could natural selection, but far more easily from having incomparably longer time for action. Nor do I believe that any great physical change, as of climate, or any unusual degree of isolation to check immigration, is necessary in order that new and unoccupied places should be left for natural selection to fill up by improving some of the varying inhabitants. For as all the inhabitants of each country are struggling together with nicely balanced forces, extremely slight modifications in the structure or habits of one species would often give it an advantage over others, and still further modifications of the same kind would often still further increase the advantage, as long as the species continued under the same conditions of life and profited by similar means of subsistence and defence. No country can be named in which all the native inhabitants are now so perfectly adapted to each other and to the physical conditions under which they live that none of them could be still better adapted or improved. For in all countries the natives have been so far conquered by naturalised productions that they have allowed some foreigners to take firm possession of the land. And as foreigners have thus in every country beaten some of the natives, we may safely conclude that the natives might have been modified with advantage, so as to have better resisted the intruders. As man can produce, and certainly has produced, a great result by his methodical and unconscious means of selection, what may not natural selection effect? Man can act only on external and visible characters. Nature, if I may be allowed to personify the natural preservation or survival of the fittest, cares nothing for appearances, except in so far as they are useful to any being. She can act on every internal organ, on every shade of constitutional difference, on the whole machinery of life. Man selects only for his own good, nature only for that of the being which she tends. Every selected character is fully exercised by her, as is implied by the fact of their selection. Man keeps the natives of many climates in the same country. He seldom exercises each selected character in some peculiar and fitting manner. He feeds a long and a short-beaked pigeon on the same food. He does not exercise a long-backed, 
or long-legged quadruped in any particular manner. He exposes sheep with long and short wool to the same climate, does not allow the most vigorous males to struggle for the females. He does not rigidly destroy all inferior animals, but protects during each varying season, as far as lies in his power, all his productions. He often begins his selection by some half-monstrous form, or at least by some modification prominent enough to catch the eye, or to be plainly useful to him. Under nature, the slightest differences of structure or constitution may well turn the nicely balanced scale in the struggle for life, and so be preserved. How fleeting are the wishes and efforts of man! How short his time, and consequently how poor will be his results, compared with those accumulated by nature! during whole geological periods. Can we wonder, then, that nature's productions should be far truer in character than man's productions, that they should be infinitely better adapted to the most complex conditions of life, and should plainly bear the stamp of far higher workmanship? It may metaphorically be stated that natural selection is daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world the slightest variations, rejecting those that are bad, preserving and adding up all that are good, silently and insensibly working, whenever and wherever opportunity offers, at the improvement of each organic being in relation to its organic and inorganic conditions of life we see nothing of these slow changes in progress, until the hand of time has marked the long lapse of ages, and then so imperfect is our view into long-past geological ages that we see only that the forms of life are now different from what they formerly were. In order that any great amount of modification should be effected in a species, a variety, when once formed, must again, perhaps after a long interval of time, vary or present individual differences of the same favourable nature as before. And these must again be preserved, and so onward, step by step. Seeing that individual differences of the same kind perpetually recur, this can hardly be considered as an unwarrantable assumption. But whether it is true, we can judge only by seeing how far the hypothesis occurs with and explains the general phenomena of nature. On the other hand, the ordinary belief that the amount of possible variation is a strictly limited quantity is likewise a simple assumption. Although natural selection can act only through and for the good of each being, yet characters and structures, which we are apt to consider as of very trifling importance, may thus be acted on. When we see leaf-eating insects green, and bark-feeders mottled grey, the alpine ptarmigan white in winter, the red grouse the colour of heather, we must believe that these tints are of service to these birds and insects in preserving them from danger. Grouse, if not destroyed at some period of their lives, would increase in countless numbers. They are known to suffer largely from birds of prey, and hawks are guided by eyesight to their prey. So much so, that on parts of the continent persons are warned not to keep white pigeons as being the most liable to destruction. Hence natural selection might be effective in giving the proper colour to each kind of grouse, and in keeping that colour, when once required, true and constant. <laughs>
nor ought we to think that the occasional destruction of an animal of any particular colour would produce little effect. We should remember how essential it is, in a flock of white sheep, to destroy a lamb with the faintest trace of black. We have seen how the colour of hogs, which feed on the paint root in Virginia, determines whether they shall live or die. In plants, the down on the fruit and the colour of the flesh are considered by botanists as characters of the most trifling importance. Yet we hear from an excellent horticulturist, Downing, that in the United States, smooth-skinned fruits suffer far more from a beetle, a curculio, than those with down, that purple plums suffer far more from a certain disease than yellow plums, whereas another disease attacks yellow-fleshed peaches far more than those with other coloured flesh. If, with all the aids of art, these slight differences make a great difference in cultivating the several varieties, assuredly in a state of nature, where the trees would have to struggle with other trees, and with a host of enemies, such differences would effectually settle which variety, whether a smooth or downy, a yellow or a purple-fleshed fruit, should succeed. In looking at many small points of difference between species, which, as far as our ignorance permits us to judge, seem quite unimportant, we must not forget that climate, food, etc., have no doubt produced some direct effect. It is also necessary to bear in mind that, owing to the law of correlation, when one part varies and the variations are accumulated through natural selection, other modifications, often of the most unexpected nature, will ensue. As we see that those variations which, under domestication, appear at any particular period of life, tend to reappear in the offspring at the same period, for instance, in the shape, size, and flavour of the seeds of the many varieties of our culinary and agricultural plants, in the caterpillar and cocoon stages of the varieties of the silkworm, in the eggs of poultry, and in the colour of the down of their chickens, in the horns of our sheep and cattle when nearly adult. So, in a state of nature, natural selection will be enabled to act on and modify organic beings at any age, by the accumulation of variations profitable at that age, and by their inheritance at a corresponding age. If it profit a plant, to have its seeds more and more widely disseminated by the wind, I can see no greater difficulty in this being effected through natural selection than in the cotton planter increasing and improving by selection the down in the pods on his cotton trees. Natural selection may modify and adapt the larva of an insect to a score of contingencies wholly different from those which concern the mature insect. And these modifications may affect, through correlation, the structure of the adult. So, conversely, modifications in the adult may affect the structure of the larva. But in all cases, natural selection will ensure that they shall not be injurious, for if they were so, the species would become extinct. Natural selection will modify the structure of the young in relation to the parent, and of the parent in relation to the young. In social animals it will adapt the structure of each individual for the benefit of the whole community, if the community profits by the selected change. What natural selection cannot do is to modify the structure of one species without giving it any advantage for the good of another species. 
and those statements to this effect may be found in works of natural history, I cannot find one case which will bear investigation. A structure used only once in an animal's life, if of high importance to it, might be modified to any extent by natural selection. For instance, the great jaws possessed by certain insects, used exclusively for opening the cocoon, or the hard tip to the beak of unhatched birds, used for breaking the eggs. It has been asserted that of the best short-beaked tumbler pigeons, a greater number perish in the egg than are able to get out of it, so that fanciers assist in the act of hatching. Now, if nature had to make the beak of a full-grown pigeon very short for the bird's own advantage, the process of modification would be very slow, and there would be simultaneously the most rigorous selection of all the young birds within the egg which had the most powerful and hardest beaks. For all with weak beaks would inevitably perish, or more delicate and more easily broken shells might be selected, the thickness of the shell being known to vary like every other structure. It may be well here to remark that with all beings there must be much fortuitous destruction, which can have little or no influence on the course of natural selection. For instance, a vast number of eggs or seeds are annually devoured, and these could be modified through natural selection only if they varied in some manner which protected them from their enemies. Yet many of these eggs or seeds would perhaps, if not destroyed, have yielded individuals better adapted to their conditions of life than any of those which happened to survive. So again, a vast number of mature animals and plants, whether or not they be the best adapted to their conditions, must be annually destroyed by accidental causes, which would not be in the least degree mitigated by certain changes of structure or constitution, which would in other ways be beneficial to the species. But let the destruction of the adults be ever so heavy, if the number which can exist in any district be not wholly kept down by such causes, or again let the destruction of eggs or seeds be so great that only a hundredth or a thousandth part are developed, yet of those which do survive, the best adapted individuals, supposing that there is any variability in a favourable direction, will tend to propagate their kind in larger numbers than the less well adapted. If the numbers be wholly kept down by the causes just indicated, as will often have been the case, natural selection will be powerless in certain beneficial directions, but this is no valid objection to its efficiency at other times and in other ways, for we are far from having any reason to suppose that many species ever undergo modification and improvement at the same time in the same area. Sexual Selection Inasmuch as peculiarities often appear under domestication, in one sex, and become hereditarily attached to that sex, so no doubt it will be under nature. Thus it is rendered possible for the two sexes to be modified, through natural selection, in relation to different habits of life, as is sometimes the case, or for one sex to be modified in relation to the other sex, as commonly occurs. This leads me to say a few words on what I have called sexual selection. This form of selection depends not on a struggle for existence in relation to other organic beings or to external conditions, but on a struggle between the individuals of one sex, generally the males, for the possession of the other sex. The result is not death to the unsuccessful competitor, but few or no offspring. 
sexual selection is therefore less rigorous than natural selection. Generally, the most vigorous males, those which are best fitted for their places in nature, will leave most progeny. But in many cases, victory depends not so much on general vigour, but on having special weapons confined to the male sex. A hornless stag or spurless cock would have a poor chance of leaving numerous offspring. Sexual selection, by always allowing the victor to breed, might surely give indomitable courage, length of spur, and strength to the wing to strike in the spurred leg, in nearly the same manner as does the brutal cockfighter by the careful selection of his best cocks. How low in the scale of nature the law of battle descends, I know not. Male alligators have been described as fighting, bellowing and whirling around, like Indians in a war dance, for the possession of the females. Male salmons have been observed fighting all day long. Male stag beetles sometimes bear wounds from the huge mandibles of other males. The males of certain hymenopterous insects have been frequently seen by that inimitable observer, M. Fabre, fighting for a particular female who sits by, an apparently unconcerned beholder of the struggle, and then retires with the conqueror. The war is, perhaps, severest between the males of polygamous animals, and these seem oftenest provided with special weapons. The males of carnivorous animals are already well armed, though to them, and to others, special means of defence may be given through means of sexual selection, as the mane of the lion and the hooked jaw to the male salmon, for the shield may be as important for victory as the sword or spear. Among birds the contest is often of a more peaceful character. All those who have attended to the subject believe that there is the severest rivalry between the males of many species to attract by singing the females. The rock thrush of Guyana, birds of paradise, and some others, congregate and successive males display with the most elaborate care and show off in the best manner their gorgeous plumage. They likewise perform strange antics before the females, which, standing by as spectators, at last choose the most attractive partner. Those who have closely attended to birds in confinement will know that they often take individual preferences and dislikes. Thus Sir R. Heron has described how a pied peacock was eminently attractive to all his hen-birds. I cannot here enter on the necessary details, but if man can in a short time give beauty and an elegant carriage to his bantams, according to his standard of beauty, I can see no good reason to doubt that female birds, by selecting, during thousands of generations, the most melodious or beautiful males, according to their standard of beauty, might produce a marked effect. Some well-known laws, with respect to the plumage of male and female birds, in comparison with the plumage of the young, can partly be explained through the action of sexual selection on variations occurring at different ages, and transmitted to the males alone, or to both sexes at corresponding ages. But I have not space here to enter on this subject. Thus it is, as I believe, that when the males and females of any animal have the same general habits of life, but differ in structure, colour, or ornament, such differences have been mainly caused by sexual selection, that is, by individual males having had, in successive generations, some slight advantage over other males, in their weapons, means of defence, or charms, 
which they have transmitted to their male offspring alone. Yet I would not wish to attribute all sexual differences to this agency. For we see in our domestic animals peculiarities arising and becoming attached to the male sex, which apparently have not been augmented through selection by man. The tuft of hair on the breast of the wild turkey cock cannot be of any use, and it is doubtful whether it can be ornamental in the eyes of the female bird. Indeed, had the tuft appeared under domestication, it would have been called a monstrosity. Illustrations of the Action of Natural Selection or the survival of the fittest. In order to make it clear how, as I believe, natural selection acts, I must beg permission to give one or two imaginary illustrations. Let us take the case of a wolf, which preys on various animals, securing some by craft, some by strength, and some by fleetness. And let us suppose that the fleetest prey, a deer for instance, had from any change in the country increased in numbers, or that other prey had decreased in numbers during that season of the year when the wolf was hardest pressed for food. Under such circumstances the swiftest and slimmest wolves have the best chance of surviving, and so be preserved or selected provided always that they retained strength to master their prey at this or some other period of the year when they were compelled to prey on other animals. I can see no more reason to doubt that this would be the result than that man should be able to improve the fleetness of his greyhounds by careful and methodical selection, or by that kind of unconscious selection which follows from each man trying to keep the best dogs, without any thought of modifying the breed. I may add that, according to Mr. Pierce, there are two varieties of the wolf inhabiting the Catskill Mountains in the United States, one with a light greyhound-like form which pursues deer, and the other more bulky with shorter legs which more frequently attacks the shepherd's flocks. Even without any change in the proportional numbers of the animals on which our wolf preyed, a cub might be born with an innate tendency to pursue certain kinds of prey. Nor can this be thought very improbable, for we often observe great differences in the natural tendencies of our domestic animals, one cat, for instance, taking to catching rats, another mice, one cat, according to Mr. St. John, bringing home winged game, another hares or rabbits, and another hunting on marshy ground, and almost nightly catching woodcocks or snipes. The tendency to catch rats rather than mice is known to be inherited. Now, if any slight innate change of habit or of structure benefited an individual wolf, it would have the best chance of surviving and of leaving offspring. Some of its young would probably inherit the same habits or structure, and by the repetition of this process a new variety might be formed, which would either supplant or coexist with the parent form of wolf. Or, again, the wolves inhabiting a mountainous district and those frequenting the lowlands would naturally be forced to hunt different prey, and from the continued preservation of the individuals best fitted for the two sites, two varieties might slowly be formed. These varieties would cross and blend where they met, but to this subject of intercrossing we shall soon have to return. It should be observed that in the above illustration I speak of the slimmest individual wolves, and not of any single strongly marked variation having been preserved. In former editions of this work I sometimes spoke as if this latter alternative had frequently occurred. <laughs> 
I saw the great importance of individual differences, and this led me fully to discuss the results of unconscious selection by man, which depends on the preservation of all the more or less valuable individuals, and on the destruction of the worst. I saw also that the preservation, in a state of nature, of any occasional deviation of structure, such as a monstrosity, would be a rare event, and that, if at first preserved, it would generally be lost by subsequent intercrossing with ordinary individuals. Nevertheless, until reading an able and valuable article in the North British Review, 1867, I did not appreciate how rarely single variations, whether slight or strongly marked, could be perpetuated. The author takes the case of a pair of animals, producing during their lifetime two hundred offspring, of which, from various causes of destruction, only two, on an average, survive to procreate their kind. This is rather an extreme estimate for most of the higher animals, but by no means so for many of the lower organisms. He then shows that if a single individual were born, which varied in some manner, giving it twice as good a chance of life as that of the other individuals, yet the chances would be strongly against its survival. Supposing it to survive and to breed, and that half its young inherited the favourable variation, still, as the reviewer goes on to show, the young would have only a slightly better chance of surviving and breeding, and this chance would go on decreasing in the succeeding generations. The justice of these remarks cannot, I think, be disputed. If, for instance, a bird of some kind could procure its food more easily by having its beak curved, and if one were born with its beak strongly curved, and which consequently flourished, nevertheless there would be a very poor chance of this one individual perpetuating its kind to the exclusion of the common form. But there can hardly be a doubt judging by what we see taking place under domestication, that this result would follow from the preservation, during many generations, of a large number of individuals with more or less strongly curved beaks, and from the destruction of a still larger number with the straightest beaks. It should not, however, be overlooked that certain rather strongly marked variations which no one would rank as mere individual differences, frequently recur owing to a similar organization being similarly acted on, of which fact numerous instances could be given with our domestic productions. In such cases, if the varying individual did not actually transmit to its offspring its newly acquired character, it would undoubtedly transmit to them as long as the existing conditions remained the same, a still stronger tendency to vary in the same manner. There can also be little doubt that the tendency to vary in the same manner has often been so strong that all the individuals of the same species have been similarly modified without the aid of any form of selection. Or only a third fifth or tenth part of the individuals may have been thus affected, of which fact several instances could be given. Thus Graber estimates that about one-fifth of the guillemots in the Faroe Islands consist of a variety so well marked that it was formerly ranked as a distinct species under the name of Urea lacrimans. In cases of this kind, if the variation were of a beneficial nature, the original form would soon be supplanted by the modified form, through the survival of the fittest. To the effects of intercrossing in eliminating variations of all kinds, I shall have to recur, but it may be here remarked that most animals and plants keep to their proper homes, and do not needlessly wander about, 
we see this even with migratory birds, which almost always return to the same spot. Consequently, each newly formed variety would generally be at first local, as seems to be the common rule with varieties in a state of nature, so that similarly modified individuals would soon exist in a small body together, and would often breed together. If the new variety were successful in its battle for life, it would slowly spread from a central district, competing with and conquering the unchanged individuals on the margins of an ever-increasing circle. It may be worth while to give another and more complex illustration of the action of natural selection. Certain plants excrete sweet juice, apparently for the sake of eliminating something injurious from the sap. This is effected, for instance, by glands at the base of the stipules in some leguminosae and at the backs of the leaves of the common laurel. This juice, though small in quantity, is greedily sought by insects, but their visits do not in any way benefit the plant. Now, let us assume that the juice or nectar was excreted from the inside of the flowers of a certain number of plants of any species. Insects, in seeking the nectar, would get dusted with pollen, and would often transport it from one flower to another. The flowers of two distinct individuals of the same species would thus get crossed, and the act of crossing, as can be fully proved, gives rise to vigorous seedlings, which consequently would have the best chance of flourishing and surviving. The plants which produced flowers with the largest glands or nectaries, excreting most nectar, would oftenest be visited by insects, and would oftenest be crossed, and so, in the long run, would gain the upper hand and form a local variety. The flowers also, which had their stamens and pistils, placed, in relation to the size and habits of the particular insect which visited them, so as to favour, in any degree, the transportal of the pollen, would likewise be favoured. We might have taken the case of insects visiting flowers for the sake of collecting pollen instead of nectar, and as pollen is formed for the sole purpose of fertilisation, its destruction appears to be a simple loss to the plant. Yet if a little pollen were carried, at first occasionally and then habitually, by the pollen-devouring insects from flower to flower, and a cross thus effected, although nine-tenths of the pollen were destroyed, it might still be a great gain to the plant to be thus robbed. And the individuals which produced more and more pollen and had larger anthers, would be selected. When our plant, by the above process long continued, had been rendered highly attractive to insects, they would, unintentionally on their part, regularly carry pollen from flower to flower, and that they do this effectually I could easily show by many striking facts. I will give only one, as likewise illustrating one step in the separation of the sexes of plants. Some holly trees bear only male flowers, which have four stamens, producing a rather small quantity of pollen, and a rudimentary pistil. Other holly trees bear only female flowers. These have a full-sized pistil, and four stamens with shriveled anthers, in which not a grain of pollen can be detected. Having found a female tree, exactly sixty yards from a male tree, I put the stigmas of twenty flowers, taken from different branches, under the microscope, and on all, without exception, there were a few pollen grains, and on some a profusion. As the wind had set for several days from the female to the male tree, the pollen could not thus have been carried. 
the weather had been cold and boisterous, and therefore not favourable to bees. Nevertheless, every female flower which I examined had been effectually fertilised by the bees, which had flown from tree to tree in search of nectar. But to return to our imaginary case, as soon as the plant had been rendered so highly attractive to insects that pollen was regularly carried from flower to flower, another process might commence. No naturalist doubts the advantage of what has been called the physiological division of labour. Hence we may believe that it would be advantageous to a plant to produce stamens alone in one flower or on one whole plant and pistils alone in another flower or on another plant. In plants under culture and placed under new conditions of life, sometimes the male organs and sometimes the female organs become more or less impotent. Now if we suppose this to occur in ever so slight a degree under nature, then, as pollen is already carried regularly from flower to flower, and as a more complete separation of the sexes of our plant would be advantageous on the principle of the division of labour, individuals with this tendency more and more increased would be continually favoured or selected, until at last a complete separation of the sexes might be effected. It would take up too much space to show the various steps, through dimorphism and other means, by which the separation of the sexes in plants of various kinds is apparently now in progress, but I may add that some of the species of holly in North America are, according to Asa Gray, in an exactly intermediate condition, or, as he expresses it, are more or less dioecially polygamous. Let us now turn to the nectar-feeding insects. We may suppose the plant of which we have been slowly increasing the nectar by continued selection to be a common plant, and that certain insects depended in part on its nectar for food. I could give many facts showing how anxious bees are to save time. For instance, their habit of cutting holes and sucking the nectar at the bases of certain flowers, which with a very little more trouble they can enter by the mouth. Bearing such facts in mind, it may be believed that under certain circumstances individual differences in the curvature or length of the proboscis, etc., too slight to be appreciated by us, might benefit a bee or other insect, so that certain individuals would be able to obtain their food more quickly than others, and thus the communities to which they belonged would flourish, and throw off many swarms, inheriting the same peculiarities. The tubes of the corolla of the common red or incarnate clovers, trifolium pratense and incarnatum, do not, on a hasty glance, appear to differ in length. Yet the hive bee can easily suck the nectar out of the incarnate clover, but not out of the common red clover, which is visited by humble bees alone. So that whole fields of the red clover offer in vain an abundant supply of precious nectar to the hive bee. That this nectar is much liked by the hive bee is certain, for I have repeatedly seen, but only in the autumn, many hive bees sucking the flowers through holes bitten in the base of the tube by humble bees. The difference in the length of the corolla in the two kinds of clover, which determines the visits of the hive bee, must be very trifling for I have been assured that when red clover has been mown, the flowers of the second crop are somewhat smaller, and that these are visited by many hive bees. I do not know whether this statement is accurate, nor whether another published statement can be trusted, namely that the Ligurian bee, which is generally considered a mere variety of the common hive bee, 
and which freely crosses with it, is able to reach and suck the nectar of the red clover. Thus, in a country where this kind of clover abounded, it might be a great advantage to the hive bee to have a slightly longer or differently constructed proboscis. On the other hand, as the fertility of this clover absolutely depends on bees visiting the flowers, if humble bees were to become rare in any country, it might be a great advantage to the plant to have a shorter or more deeply divided corolla, so that the hive bees should be enabled to suck its flowers. Thus I can understand how a flower and a bee might slowly become, either simultaneously or one after the other, modified and adapted to each other, in the most perfect manner, by the continued preservation of all the individuals which presented slight deviations of structure mutually favourable to each other. I am well aware that this doctrine of natural selection, exemplified in the above imaginary instances, is open to the same objections which were first urged against Sir Charles Lyell's noble views on the modern changes of the earth, as illustrative of geology, but we now seldom hear the agencies which we still see at work, spoken of as trifling and insignificant, when used in explaining the excavation of the deepest valleys, or the formation of long lines of inland cliffs. Natural selection acts only by the preservation and accumulation of small inherited modifications, each profitable to the preserved being and as modern geology has almost banished such views as the excavation of a great valley by a single diluvial wave, so will natural selection banish the belief of the continued creation of new organic beings, or of any great and sudden modification in their structure. End of section 1 of chapter 4This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or the Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life. Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin. Chapter Number Four. Natural Selection, or the Survival of the Fittest. Section 2 of 3 On the Intercrossing of Individuals I must here introduce a short digression. In the case of animals and plants with separated sexes, it is of course obvious that two individuals must always with the exception of the curious and not well understood cases of parthenogenesis, unite for each birth. But in the case of hermaphrodites, this is far from obvious. Nevertheless, there is reason to believe that with all hermaphrodites, two individuals, either occasionally or habitually, concur for the reproduction of their kind. This view was long ago doubtfully suggested by Sprengel, Knight, and Kohlreuter. We shall presently see its importance, but I must here treat the subject with extreme brevity, though I have the materials prepared for an ample discussion. All vertebrate animals, all insects, and some other large groups of animals, pair for each birth. Modern research has much diminished the number of supposed hermaphrodites, and of real hermaphrodites a large number pair, that is, two individuals regularly unite for reproduction, which is all that concerns us. But still there are many hermaphrodite animals which certainly do not habitually pair, and a vast majority of plants are hermaphrodites. What reason, it may be asked, 
is there for supposing, in these cases, that two individuals ever concur in reproduction. As it is impossible here to enter on details, I must trust to some general considerations alone. In the first place, I have collected so large a body of facts, and made so many experiments, showing, in accordance with the almost universal belief of breeders, that with animals and plants, a cross between different varieties, or between individuals of the same variety, but of another strain, gives vigour and fertility to the offspring, and on the other hand, that close interbreeding diminishes vigour and fertility. That these facts alone incline me to believe that it is a general law of nature that no organic being fertilises itself for a perpetuity of generations, but that a cross with another individual is occasionally, perhaps at long intervals of time, indispensable. On the belief that this is a law of nature, we can, I think, understand several large classes of facts, such as the following, which on any other view are inexplicable. Every hybridizer knows how unfavourable exposure to wet is to the fertilisation of a flower. Yet what a multitude of flowers have their anthers and stigmas fully exposed to the weather. If an occasional cross be indispensable, notwithstanding that the plant's own anthers and pistil stand so near each other as almost to ensure self-fertilization, the fullest freedom for the entrance of pollen from another individual will explain the above state of exposure of the organs. Many flowers, on the other hand, have their organs of fructification closely enclosed, as in the great papillionaceous or pea family. But these almost invariably present beautiful and curious adaptations in relation to the visits of insects. So necessary are the visits of bees to many papillionaceous flowers that their fertility is greatly diminished if these visits be prevented. Now it is scarcely possible for insects to fly from flower to flower and not to carry pollen from one to the other, to the great good of the plant. Insects act like a camel-hair pencil, and it is sufficient to ensure fertilization just to touch with the same brush the anthers of one flower and then the stigma of another but it must not be supposed that bees would thus produce a multitude of hybrids between distinct species. For if a plant's own pollen and that from another species are placed on the same stigma, the former is so prepotent that it invariably and completely destroys, as has been shown by Gartner, the influence of the foreign pollen. When the stamens of a flower suddenly spring towards the pistil, or slowly move one after the other towards it, the contrivance seems adapted solely to ensure self-fertilization, and no doubt it is useful for this end. But the agency of insects is often required to cause the stamens to spring forward, as Kohlreuter has shown to be the case with the barberry and in this very genus, which seems to have a special contrivance for self-fertilization, it is well known that, if closely allied forms or varieties are planted near each other, it is hardly possible to raise pure seedlings, so largely do they naturally cross. In numerous other cases, far from self-fertilization being favoured, there are special contrivances which effectually prevent the stigma receiving pollen from its own flower, as I could show from the works of Sprengel and others, as well as from my own observations. For instance, in Lobelia fulgens, there is a really beautiful and elaborate contrivance by which all the infinitely numerous pollen granules are swept out of the conjoined anthers of each flower, before the stigma 
of that individual flower is ready to receive them. And as this flower is never visited, at least in my garden, by insects, it never gets a seed, though by placing pollen from one flower on the stigma of another, I raise plenty of seedlings. Another species of lobelia, which is visited by bees, seeds freely in my garden. In very many other cases, though there is no special mechanical contrivance to prevent the stigma receiving pollen from the same flower, yet, as Sprengel and more recently Hildebrand and others have shown, and as I can confirm, either the anthers burst before the stigma is ready for fertilization, or the stigma is ready before the pollen of that flower is ready, so that these so-named dichogamous plants have in fact separated sexes, and must habitually be crossed. So it is with the reciprocally dimorphic and trimorphic plants previously alluded to. How strange are these facts! How strange that the pollen and stigmatic surface of the same flower, though placed so close together, as if for the very purpose of self-fertilization, should be in so many cases mutually useless to each other. How simply are these facts explained, on the view of an occasional cross with a distinct individual being advantageous, or indispensable. If several varieties of the cabbage, radish, onion, and of some other plants, be allowed to seed near each other, a large majority of the seedlings thus raised turn out, as I found, mongrels. For instance, I raised 233 seedling cabbages from some plants of different varieties growing near each other and of these only seventy-eight were true to their kind, and some even of these were not perfectly true. Yet the pistil of each cabbage flower is surrounded not only by its own six stamens, but by those of the many other flowers on the same plant, and the pollen of each flower readily gets on its stigma without insect agency for I have found that plants carefully protected from insects produce the full number of pods. How, then, comes it that such a vast number of the seedlings are mongrelized? It must arise from the pollen of a distinct variety, having a prepotent effect over the flower's own pollen, and that this is part of the general law of good being derived from the intercrossing of distinct individuals of the same species. When distinct species are crossed, the case is reversed, for a plant's own pollen is always prepotent over foreign pollen. But to this subject we shall return in a future chapter. In the case of a large tree, covered with innumerable flowers, it may be objected that pollen could seldom be carried from tree to tree, and at most only from flower to flower on the same tree. And flowers on the same tree can be considered as distinct individuals only in a limited sense. I believe this objection to be valid, but that nature has largely provided against it by giving to trees a strong tendency to bear flowers with separated sexes. When the sexes are separated, although the male and female flowers may be produced on the same tree, pollen must be regularly carried from flower to flower, and this will give a better chance of pollen being occasionally carried from tree to tree. That trees belonging to all orders have their sexes more often separated than other plants, I find to be the case in this country, and at my request Dr. Hooker tabulated the trees of New Zealand, and Dr. Asa Gray those of the United States, and the result was as I anticipated. On the other hand, Dr. Hooker informs me that the rule does not hold good in Australia, but if most of the Australian trees are dichogamous, 
the same result will follow as if they bore flowers with separated sexes. I have made these few remarks on trees simply to call attention to the subject. Turning for a brief space to animals, various terrestrial species are hermaphrodites, such as the land mollusca and earthworms, but these all pair. As yet I have not found a single terrestrial animal which can fertilize itself. This remarkable fact, which offers so strong a contrast with terrestrial plants, is intelligible on the view of an occasional cross being indispensable. For owing to the nature of the fertilizing element, there are no means, analogous to the action of insects and of the wind with plants, by which an occasional cross could be effected with terrestrial animals without the concurrence of two individuals. Of aquatic animals there are many self-fertilizing hermaphrodites, but here the currents of water offer an obvious means for an occasional cross. As in the case of flowers, I have as yet failed, after consultation with one of the highest authorities, namely Professor Huxley, to discover a single hermaphrodite animal with the organs of reproduction so perfectly enclosed that access from without, and the occasional influence of a distinct individual, can be shown to be physically impossible. Cirripedes long appeared to me to present, under this point of view, a case of great difficulty, but I have been enabled, by a fortunate chance, to prove that two individuals, though both are self-fertilizing hermaphrodites, do sometimes cross. It must have struck most naturalists as a strange anomaly that, both with animals and plants, some species of the same family, and even of the same genus, though agreeing closely with each other in their whole organization, are hermaphrodites, and some unisexual. But if, in fact, all hermaphrodites do occasionally intercross, the difference between them and unisexual species is, as far as function is concerned, very small. From these several considerations, and from the many special facts which I have collected, but which I am unable here to give, it appears that with animals and plants, an occasional intercross between distinct individuals is a very general, if not universal, law of nature. Circumstances favourable for the production of new forms through natural selection. This is an extremely intricate subject. A great amount of variability, under which term individual differences are always included, will evidently be favourable. A large number of individuals, by giving a better chance within any given period for the appearance of profitable variations, will compensate for a lesser amount of variability in each individual, and is, I believe, a highly important element of success. Though nature grants long periods of time for the work of natural selection, she does not grant an indefinite period. For as all organic beings are striving to seize on each place in the economy of nature, if any one species does not become modified and improved in a corresponding degree with its competitors, it will be exterminated. Unless favourable variations be inherited by some, at least, of the offspring, nothing can be affected by natural selection. The tendency to reversion may often check or prevent the work, but as this tendency has not prevented man from forming by selection numerous domestic races, why should it prevail against natural selection? In the case of methodical selection, a breeder selects for some definite object, 
and if the individuals be allowed freely to intercross, his work will completely fail. But when many men, without intending to alter the breed, have a nearly common standard of perfection, and all try to procure and breed from the best animals, improvement surely but slowly follows from this unconscious process of selection, notwithstanding that there is no separation of selected individuals. Thus it will be under nature. For within a confined area, with some place in the natural polity not perfectly occupied, all the individuals varying in the right direction, though in different degrees, will tend to be preserved. But if the area be large, its several districts will almost certainly present different conditions of life, and then, if the same species undergoes modification in different districts, the newly formed varieties will intercross on the confines of each. But we shall see in the sixth chapter that intermediate varieties, inhabiting intermediate districts, will in the long run generally be supplanted by one of the adjoining varieties. Intercrossing will chiefly affect those animals which unite for each birth and wander much, and which do not breed at a very quick rate. Hence with animals of this nature, for instance birds, Varieties will generally be confined to separate countries, and this I find to be the case. With hermaphrodite organisms which cross only occasionally, and likewise with animals which unite for each birth but which wander little, and can increase at a rapid rate, a new and improved variety might be quickly formed on any one spot, and might there maintain itself in a body and afterward spread, so that the individuals of the new variety would chiefly cross together. On this principle, nurserymen always prefer saving seed from a large body of plants, as the chance of intercrossing is thus lessened. Even with animals which unite for each birth, and which do not propagate rapidly, we must not assume that free intercrossing would always eliminate the effects of natural selection, for I can bring forward a considerable body of facts showing that within the same area two varieties of the same animal may long remain distinct, from haunting different stations, from breeding at slightly different seasons, or from the individuals of each variety preferring to pair together. Intercrossing plays a very important part in nature by keeping the individuals of the same species, or of the same variety, true and uniform in character. It will obviously thus act far more efficiently with those animals which unite for each birth, but, as already stated, we have reason to believe that occasional intercrosses take place with all animals and plants. Even if these take place only at long intervals of time, the young thus produced will gain so much in vigour and fertility over the offspring from long-continued self-fertilisation that they will have a much better chance of surviving and propagating their kind. And thus, in the long run, the influence of crosses, even at rare intervals, will be great. With respect to organic beings extremely low in the scale, which do not propagate sexually, nor conjugate, and which cannot possibly intercross, uniformity of character can be retained by them under the same conditions of life, only through the principle of inheritance, and through natural selection, which will destroy any individuals departing from the proper type. If the conditions of life change, and the form undergoes modification, uniformity of character can be given to the modified offspring, solely by natural selection, preserving similar favourable variations. <laughs>
Isolation also is an important element in the modification of species through natural selection. In a confined or isolated area, if not very large, the organic and inorganic conditions of life will generally be almost uniform, so that natural selection will tend to modify all the varying individuals of the same species in the same manner. Intercrossing with the inhabitants of the surrounding districts will also be thus prevented. Moritz Wagner has lately published an interesting essay on this subject, and has shown that the service rendered by isolation in preventing crosses between newly formed varieties is probably greater even than I supposed. But from reasons already assigned, I can by no means agree with this naturalist that migration and isolation are necessary elements for the formation of new species. The importance of isolation is likewise great in preventing, after any physical change in the conditions, such as of climate, elevation of the land, etc., the immigration of better adapted organisms, and thus new places in the natural economy of the district will be left open to be filled up by the modification of the old inhabitants. Lastly, isolation will give time for a new variety to be improved at a slow rate, and this may sometimes be of much importance. If, however, an isolated area be very small, either from being surrounded by barriers, or from having very peculiar physical conditions, the total number of the inhabitants will be small, and this will retard the production of new species through natural selection by decreasing the chances of favourable variations arising. The mere lapse of time by itself does nothing, either for or against natural selection. I state this because it has been erroneously asserted that the element of time has been assumed by me to play an all-important part in modifying species, as if all the forms of life were necessarily undergoing change through some innate law. Lapse of time is only so far important, and its importance in this respect is great, that it gives a better chance of beneficial variations arising and of their being selected, accumulated and fixed. It likewise tends to increase the direct action of the physical conditions of life in relation to the constitution of each organism. If we turn to nature to test the truth of these remarks and look at any small isolated area such as an oceanic island, although the number of the species inhabiting it is small, as we shall see in our chapter on geographic distribution, yet of these species a very large proportion are endemic, that is, have been produced there and nowhere else in the world. Hence an oceanic island at first sight seems to have been highly favourable for the production of new species. But we may thus deceive ourselves, for to ascertain whether a small isolated area, or a large open area like a continent, has been most favourable for the production of new organic forms, we ought to take the comparison within equal times, and this we are incapable of doing. Although isolation is of great importance in the production of new species, on the whole I am inclined to believe that largeness of area is still more important, especially for the production of species which shall prove capable of enduring for a long period and of spreading widely. Throughout a great and open area, not only will there be a better chance of favourable variations, arising from the large number of individuals of the same species there supported, but the conditions of life are much more complex from the large number of already existing species. 
and if some of these many species become modified and improved, others will have to be improved in a corresponding degree, or they will be exterminated. Each new form also, as soon as it has been much improved, will be able to spread over the open and continuous area, and will thus come into competition with many other forms. Moreover, great areas, though now continuous, will often, owing to former oscillations of level, have existed in a broken condition, so that the good effects of isolation will generally, to a certain extent, have concurred. Finally, I conclude that, although small isolated areas have been in some respects highly favourable for the production of new species, yet that the course of modification will generally have been more rapid in large areas, and what is more important, that the new forms produced on large areas, which already have been victorious over many competitors, will be those that will spread most widely, and will give rise to the greatest number of new varieties and species. They will thus play a more important part in the changing history of the organic world. In accordance with this view, we can perhaps understand some facts which will be again alluded to in our chapter on geographical distribution. For instance, the fact of the productions of the smaller continent of Australia now yielding before those of the larger Europeo-Asiatic area. Thus also it is that continental productions have everywhere become so largely naturalised on islands. On a small island the race for life will have been less severe, and there will have been less modification and less extermination. Hence we can understand how it is that the flora of Madeira, according to Oswald here, resembles to a certain extent the extinct tertiary flora of Europe. All fresh water basins taken together make a small area compared with that of the sea or of the land. Consequently, the competition between fresh water productions will have been less severe than elsewhere. New forms will have been more slowly produced, and old forms more slowly exterminated. And it is in freshwater basins that we find seven genera of gonoid fishes, remnants of a once preponderant order. And in freshwater we find some of the most anomalous forms now known in the world, as the Ornithorhynchus and Lepidosiren, which, like fossils, connect to a certain extent orders at present widely separated in the natural scale. These anomalous forms may be called living fossils. They have endured to the present day from having inhabited a confined area, and from having been exposed to less varied and therefore less severe competition. To sum up, as far as the extreme intricacy of the subject permits, the circumstances favourable and unfavourable for the production of new species through natural selection. I conclude that for terrestrial productions, a large continental area, which has undergone many oscillations of level, will have been the most favourable for the production of many new forms of life fitted to endure for a long time and to spread widely. While the area existed as a continent, the inhabitants will have been numerous in individuals and kinds, and will have been subjected to severe competition. When converted by subsistence into large separate islands, there will still have existed many individuals of the same species on each island intercrossing on the confines of the range of each new species will have been checked. After physical changes of any kind, immigration will have been prevented, 
so that new places in the polity of each island will have had to be filled up by the modification of the old inhabitants, and time will have been allowed for the varieties in each to become well modified and perfected. When, by renewed elevation, the islands were reconverted into a continental area, there will again have been very severe competition. The most favoured or improved varieties will have been enabled to spread. There will have been much extinction of the less improved forms, and the relative proportional numbers of the various inhabitants of the reunited continent will again have been changed and again there will have been a fair field for natural selection to improve still further the inhabitants, and thus to produce new species. That natural selection generally act with extreme slowness, I fully admit. It can only act when there are places in the natural polity of a district which can be better occupied by the modification of some of its existing inhabitants. The occurrence of such places will often depend on physical changes, which generally take place very slowly, and on the immigration of better adapted forms being prevented. As some few of the old inhabitants become modified, the mutual relations of others will often be disturbed, and this will create new places, ready to be filled up by better adapted forms. But all this will take place very slowly. Although all the individuals of the same species differ in some slight degree from each other, it would often be long before differences of the right nature in various parts of the organization might occur. The result would often be greatly retarded by free intercrossing. Many will exclaim that these several causes are amply sufficient to neutralize the power of natural selection. I do not believe so, but I do believe that natural selection will generally act very slowly, only at long intervals of time, and only on a few of the inhabitants of the same region. I further believe that these slow, intermittent results accord well with what geology tells us of the rate and manner at which the inhabitants of the world have changed. Slow though the process of selection may be, if feeble man can do much by artificial selection, I can see no limit to the amount of change, to the beauty and complexity of the co-adaptations between all organic beings, one with another, and with their physical conditions of life, which may have been effected in the long course of time through nature's power of selection, that is, by the survival of the fittest. Extinction caused by natural selection this subject will be more fully discussed in our chapter on geology, but it must here be alluded to from being intimately connected with natural selection. Natural selection acts solely through the preservation of variations in some way advantageous, which consequently endure. Owing to the high geometrical rate of increase of all organic beings, each area is already fully stocked with inhabitants, and it follows from this that as the favoured forms increase in number, so generally will the less favoured decrease and become rare. Rarity, as geology tells us, is the precursor to extinction. We can see that any form which is represented by few individuals will run a good chance of utter extinction during great fluctuations in the nature or the seasons, or from a temporary increase in the number of its enemies. But we may go further than this, for as new forms are produced, unless we admit that specific forms can go on indefinitely increasing in number, <coughs> 
many old forms must become extinct. That the number of specific forms has not indefinitely increased, geology plainly tells us, and we shall presently attempt to show why it is that the number of species throughout the world has not become immeasurably great. We have seen that the species which are most numerous in individuals have the best chance of producing favourable variations within any given period. We have evidence of this in the fact stated in the second chapter, showing that it is the common and diffused or dominant species which offer the greatest number of recorded varieties. Hence, rare species will be less quickly modified or improved within any given period. They will consequently be beaten in the race for life by the modified and improved descendants of the commoner species. From these several considerations, I think it inevitably follows that as new species in the course of time are formed through natural selection, others will become rarer and rarer and finally extinct. The forms which stand in closest competition with those undergoing modification and improvement will naturally suffer most. And we have seen in the chapter on the struggle for existence that it is the most closely allied forms, varieties of the same species and species of the same genus or related genera, which, from having nearly the same structure, constitution and habits, generally come into the severest competition with each other. Consequently, each new variety or species during the progress of its formation, will generally press hardest on its nearest kindred and tend to exterminate them. We see the same process of extermination among our domesticated productions through the selection of improved forms by man. Many curious instances could be given showing how quickly new breeds of cattle, sheep, and other animals, and varieties of flowers, take the place of older and inferior kinds. In Yorkshire it is historically known that the ancient black cattle were displaced by the longhorns, and that these were swept away by the shorthorns, I quote the words of an agricultural writer, as if by some murderous pestilence. Divergence of character. The principle which I have designated by this term is of high importance and explains, as I believe, several important facts. In the first place, varieties, even strongly marked ones, though having somewhat of the character of species, as is shown by the hopeless doubts in many cases how to rank them, yet certainly differ far less from each other than do good and distinct species. Nevertheless, according to my view, varieties are species in the process of formation, and are, as I have called them, incipient species. How, then, does the lesser difference between varieties become augmented into the greater difference between species? That this does habitually happen, we must infer from most of the innumerable species throughout nature, presenting well-marked differences, whereas varieties, the supposed prototypes and parents of future well-marked species, present slight and ill-defined differences. Mere chance, as we may call it, might cause one variety to differ in some character from its parents, and the offspring of this variety again to differ from its parent in the very same character and in a greater degree. But this alone would never account for so habitual and large a degree of difference as that between the species of the same genus. Section 
As has always been my practice, I have sought light on this head from our domestic productions. We shall here find something analogous. It will be admitted that the production of races so different as Shorthorn and Hereford cattle, race and cart horses, the several breeds of pigeons, etc., could never have been affected by the mere chance accumulation of similar variations during many successive generations. In practice, a fancier is, for instance, struck by a pigeon having a slightly shorter beak. Another fancier is struck by a pigeon having a rather longer beak, and on the acknowledged principle that fanciers do not and will not admire a medium standard, but like extremes, they both go on, as has actually occurred with the subbreeds of the tumbler pigeon, choosing and breeding from birds with longer and longer beaks, or with shorter and shorter beaks. Again, we may suppose that at an early period of history, the men of one nation or district required swifter horses, while those of another required stronger and bulkier horses. The early differences would be very slight, but in the course of time, from the continued selection of swifter horses in the one case, and of stronger ones in the other, the differences would become greater, and would be noted as forming two sub-breeds. Ultimately, after the lapse of centuries, these sub-breeds would become converted into two well-established and distinct breeds. As the differences became greater, the inferior animals, with intermediate characters, being neither very swift nor very strong, would not have been used for breeding, and will thus have tended to disappear. Here, then, we see in man's productions the action of what may be called the principle of divergence, causing differences, at first barely appreciable, steadily to increase, and the breeds to diverge in character, both from each other and from their common parent. But how, it may be asked, can any analogous principle apply in nature? I believe it can and does apply most efficiently, though it was a long time before I saw how, from the simple circumstance that the more diversified the descendants from any one species become, in structure, constitution, and habits, by so much will they be better enabled to seize on many and widely diversified places in the polity of nature, and so be enabled to increase in numbers. We can clearly discern this in the case of animals with simple habits. Take the case of a carnivorous quadruped, of which the number that can be supported in any country has long ago arrived at its full average. If its natural power of increase be allowed to act, it can succeed in increasing, the country not undergoing any change in conditions, only by its varying descendants seizing on places at present occupied by other animals. Some of them, for instance, being enabled to feed on new kinds of prey, either dead or alive, some inhabiting new stations, climbing trees, frequenting water, and some perhaps becoming less carnivorous. The more diversified in habits and structure the descendants of our carnivorous animals become, the more places they will be enabled to occupy. What applies to one animal will apply throughout all time to all animals, that is, if they vary, for otherwise natural selection can effect nothing. So it will be with plants. It has been experimentally proved that if a plot of ground be sown with one species of grass, and a similar plot be sown with several distinct genera of grasses,
a greater number of plants and a greater weight of dry herbage can be raised in the latter than in the former case. The same has been found to hold good when one variety and several mixed varieties of wheat have been sown on equal spaces of ground. Hence, if any one species of grass were to go on varying, and the varieties were continually selected, which differed from each other in the same manner, though in a very slight degree, as do the distinct species and genera of grasses, a greater number of individual plants of this species, including its modified descendants, would succeed in living on the same piece of ground. And we know that each species and each variety of grass is annually sowing almost countless seeds, and is thus striving, as it may be said, to the utmost to increase in number. Consequently, in the course of many thousand generations, the most distinct varieties of any one species of grass would have the best chance of succeeding and of increasing in numbers, and thus of supplanting the less distinct varieties. And varieties, when rendered very distinct from each other, take the rank of species. The truth of the principle that the greatest amount of life can be supported by great diversification of structure is seen under many natural circumstances. In an extremely small area, especially if freely open to immigration, and where the contest between individual and individual must be very severe, we always find great diversity in its inhabitants. For instance, I found that a piece of turf, three feet by four in size, which had been exposed for many years to exactly the same conditions, supported twenty species of plants, and these belonged to eighteen genera, and to eight orders, which shows how much these plants differed from each other. So it is with the plants and insects on small and uniform islets, also in small ponds of fresh water. Farmers find that they can raise more food by a rotation of plants belonging to the most different orders. Nature follows what may be called a simultaneous rotation. Most of the animals and plants which live close around any small piece of ground could live on it, supposing its nature not to be in any way peculiar, and may be said to be striving to the utmost to live there. But it is seen that where they come into closest competition, the advantages of diversification of structure, with the accompanying differences of habit and constitution, determine that the inhabitants, which thus jostle each other most closely, shall, as a general rule, belong to what we call different genera and orders. The same principle is seen in the naturalization of plants through man's agency in foreign lands. It might have been expected that the plants which would succeed in becoming naturalized in any land would generally have been closely allied to the indigenes, for these are commonly looked at as especially created and adapted for their own country. It might also perhaps have been expected that naturalized plants would have belonged to a few groups more especially adapted to certain stations in their own homes. But the case is very different. And Alphonse de Candolle has well remarked, in his great and admirable work, that flora's gain by naturalization proportionally with the number of the native genera and species, far more in new genera than in new species. To give a single instance, in the last edition of Dr. Asa Gray's Manual of the Flora of the Northern United States, 
260 naturalized plants are enumerated, and these belong to 162 genera. We thus see that these naturalized plants are of a highly diversified nature. They differ, moreover, to a large extent, from the indigenes, for out of the 162 naturalized genera, no less than 100 genera are not there indigenous, and thus a large proportional addition is made to the genera now living in the United States. By considering the nature of the plants or animals which have, in any country, struggled successfully with the indigenes, and have there become naturalized, we may gain some crude idea in what manner some of the natives would have had to be modified in order to gain an advantage over their compatriots, and we may at least infer that diversification of structure amounting to new generic differences would be profitable to them. The advantage of diversification of structure in the inhabitants of the same region is, in fact, the same as that of the physiological division of labour in the organs of the same individual body, a subject so well elucidated by Milne Edwards. No physiologist doubts that a stomach, by being adapted to digest vegetable matter alone, or flesh alone, draws most nutriment from these substances. So in the general economy of any land, the more widely and perfectly the animals and plants are diversified for different habits of life, so will a greater number of individuals be capable of their supporting themselves. A set of animals, with their organization but little diversified, could hardly compete with a set more perfectly diversified in structure. It may be doubted, for instance, whether the Australian marsupials, which are divided into groups differing but little from each other, and feebly representing, as Mr. Waterhouse and others have remarked, our carnivorous, ruminant and rodent mammals, could successfully compete with these well-developed orders. In the Australian animals we see the process of diversification in an early and incomplete stage of development. End of section 2 of chapter 4This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or The Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life. Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin. Chapter Number Four. Natural Selection, or the Survival of the Fittest. Section 3 of 3 The probable effects of the action of natural selection, through divergence of character and extinction, on the descendants of a common ancestor. After the foregoing discussion, which has been much compressed, we may assume that the modified descendants of any one species will succeed so much the better as they become more diversified in structure, and are thus enabled to encroach on places occupied by other beings. Now let us see how this principle of benefit being derived from divergence of character, combined with the principles of natural selection and of extinction, tends to act. The accompanying diagram will aid us in understanding this rather perplexing subject. Let A to L represent the species of a genus large in its own country, 
These species are supposed to resemble each other in unequal degrees, as is so generally the case in nature, and is represented in the diagram by the letters standing at unequal distances. I have said a large genus, because as we saw in the second chapter, on an average more species vary in large genera than in small genera, and so the varying species of the large genera present a greater number of varieties. We have also seen that the species which are the commonest and most widely diffused vary more than do the rare and restricted species. Let A be a common, widely diffused and varying species, belonging to a genus large in its own country. The branching and diverging dotted lines of unequal lengths proceeding from A may represent its varying offspring. The variations are supposed to be extremely slight, but of the most diversified nature. They are not supposed all to appear simultaneously, but often after long intervals of time nor are they all supposed to endure for equal periods. Only those variations which are in some way profitable will be preserved or naturally selected. And here the importance of the principle of benefit derived from divergence of character comes in. For this will generally lead to the most different or divergent variations, represented by the outer dotted lines, being preserved and accumulated by natural selection. When a dotted line reaches one of the horizontal lines, and is there marked by a small numbered letter, a sufficient amount of variation is supposed to have been accumulated to form it into a fairly well-marked variety, such as would be thought worthy of record in a systematic work. The intervals between the horizontal lines in the diagram may represent each a thousand or more generations. After a thousand generations, species A is supposed to have produced two fairly well-marked varieties, namely A1 and M1. These two varieties will generally still be exposed to the same conditions which made their parents variable and the tendency to variability is in itself hereditary. Consequently, they will likewise tend to vary, and commonly in nearly the same manner as did their parents. Moreover, these two varieties, being only slightly modified forms, will tend to inherit those advantages which made their parent, A, more numerous than most of the other inhabitants of the same country. They will also partake of those more general advantages which made the genus to which the parent species belonged a large genus in its own country. And all these circumstances are favourable to the production of new varieties. If, then, these two varieties be variable, the most divergent of their variations will generally be preserved during the next thousand generations. And after this interval, variety A1 is supposed in the diagram to have produced variety A2, which will, owing to the principle of divergence, differ more from A than did variety A1. Variety M1 is supposed to have produced two varieties, namely M2 and S2, differing from each other, and more considerably from their common parent, A. We may continue the process by similar steps for any length of time. Some of the varieties, after each thousand generations, producing only a single variety, but in a more and more modified condition some producing two or three varieties, and some failing to produce any. 
Thus the varieties or modified descendants of the common parent A will generally go on increasing in number and diverging in character. In the diagram, the process is represented up to the ten-thousandth generation, and under a condensed and simplified form, up to the fourteen-thousandth generation. But I must here remark that I do not suppose that the process ever goes on so regularly as is represented in the diagram, though in itself made somewhat irregular, nor that it goes on continuously. It is far more probable that each form remains for long periods unaltered, and then again undergoes modification. Nor do I suppose that the most divergent varieties are invariably preserved. A medium form may often long endure, and may or may not produce more than one modified descendant for natural selection will always act according to the nature of the places which are either unoccupied or not perfectly occupied by other beings. And this will depend on infinitely complex relations. But as a general rule, the more diversified in structure the descendants from any one species can be rendered, the more places they will be enabled to seize on, and the more their modified progeny will increase. In our diagram, the line of succession is broken at regular intervals by small numbered letters marking the successive forms which have become sufficiently distinct to be recorded as varieties. But these breaks are imaginary, and might have been inserted anywhere, after intervals long enough to allow the accumulation of a considerable amount of divergent variation. As all the modified descendants from a common and widely diffused species, belonging to a large genus, will tend to partake of the same advantages which made their parent successful in life, they will generally go on multiplying in number, as well as diverging in character. This is represented in the diagram by the several divergent branches proceeding from A. The modified offspring from the later and more highly improved branches in the lines of descent will, it is probable, often take the place of, and so destroy, the earlier and less improved branches. This is represented in the diagram by some of the lower branches not reaching to the upper horizontal lines. In some cases, no doubt, the process of modification will be confined to a single line of descent, and the number of modified descendants will not be increased, although the amount of divergent modification may have been augmented. This case would be represented in the diagram if all the lines proceeding from A were removed, excepting that from A1 to A10. In the same way, the English racehorse and English pointer have apparently both gone on slowly diverging in character from their original stocks, without either having given off any fresh branches or races. After ten thousand generations, Species A is supposed to have produced three forms, A10, F10, and M10, which, from having diverged in character during the successive generations, will have come to differ largely, but perhaps unequally, from each other and from their common parent. If we suppose the amount of change between each horizontal line in our diagram to be excessively small, these three forms may still be only well-marked varieties, but we have only to suppose the steps in the process of modification to be more numerous, or greater in amount, to convert these three forms into doubtful, or at least into well-defined species. Thus, the diagram illustrates the steps by which the small differences distinguishing varieties are 
are increased into the larger differences distinguishing species. By continuing the same process for a greater number of generations, as shown in the diagram in a condensed and simplified manner, we get eight species, marked by the letters between A14 and M14, all descended from A. Thus, as I believe, species are multiplied and genera are formed. In a large genus, it is probable that more than one species will vary. In the diagram, I have assumed that a second species, I, has produced, by analogous steps, after 10,000 generations, either two well-marked varieties, W10 and Z10, or two species, according to the amount of change supposed to be represented between the horizontal lines. After 14,000 generations, six new species, marked by the letters N14 to Z14, are supposed to have been produced. In any genus, the species which are already very different in character from each other will generally tend to produce the greatest number of modified descendants, for these will have the best chance of seizing on new and widely different places in the polity of nature. Hence, in the diagram, I have chosen the extreme species A and the nearly extreme species I as those which have largely varied and have given rise to new varieties and species. The other nine species, marked by capital letters, of our original genus may for long but unequal periods continue to transmit unaltered descendants, and this is shown in the diagram by the dotted lines unequally prolonged upwards. But during the process of modification represented in the diagram, another of our principles, namely that of extinction, will have played an important part. As in each fully stocked country, natural selection necessarily acts by the selected form having some advantage in the struggle for life over other forms, there will be a constant tendency in the improved descendants of any one species to supplant and exterminate in each stage of descent their predecessors and their original progenitor. For it should be remembered that the competition will generally be most severe between those forms which are most nearly related to each other in habits, constitution and structure. Hence all the intermediate forms between the earlier and later states that is between the less and more improved states of the same species, as well as the original parent species itself, will generally tend to become extinct. So it probably will be with many whole collateral lines of descent, which will be conquered by later and improved lines. If, however, the modified offspring of a species get into some distinct country, or become quickly adapted to some quite new station, in which offspring and progenitor do not come into competition, both may continue to exist. If, then, our diagram be assumed to represent a considerable amount of modification, species A and all the earlier varieties will have become extinct, being replaced by eight new species, a14 to M14, and species I will be replaced by six, N14 to Z14, new species. But we may go further than this. The original species of our genus were supposed to resemble each other in unequal degrees, as is so generally the case in nature. Species A being more nearly related to B, C, and D than to the other species, and species I more to G, H, K, and L than to the others. These two species, A and I, were also supposed to be very common 
and widely diffused species, so that they must originally have had some advantage over most of the other species of the genus. Their modified descendants, fourteen in number at the fourteen-thousandth generation, will probably have inherited some of the same advantages. They have also been modified and improved in a diversified manner at each stage of descent, so as to have become adapted to many related places in the natural economy of their country. It seems, therefore, extremely probable that they will have taken the places of, and thus exterminated, not only their parents, A and I, but likewise some of the original species which were most nearly related to their parents. Hence, very few of the original species will have transmitted offspring to the fourteen-thousandth generation. We may suppose that only one, F, of the two species, E and F, which were least closely related to the other nine original species, has transmitted descendants to this late stage of descent. The new species in our diagram, represented from the original eleven species, will now be fifteen in number. Owing to the divergent tendency of natural selection, the extreme amount of difference in character between species A14 and Z14 will be much greater than that between the most distinct of the original eleven species. The new species, moreover, will be allied to each other in a widely different manner. Of the eight descendants from A, the three marked A14, Q14, and P14, will be nearly related, having recently branched off from A10. B14 and F14, from having diverged at an earlier period from A5, will be in some degree distinct from the three first-named species. And lastly, O14, E14 and M14 will be nearly related one to the other, but, from having diverged at the first commencement of the process of modification, will be widely different from the other five species, and may constitute a subgenus or a distinct genus. The six descendants from I will form two subgenera or genera, but as the original species I differed largely from A, standing nearly at the extreme end of the original genus, the six descendants from I will, owing to inheritance alone, differ considerably from the eight descendants from A. The two groups, moreover, are supposed to have gone on diverging in different directions. The intermediate species also and this is a very important consideration, which connected the original species A and I, have all become, except F, extinct and have left no descendants. Hence the six new species descended from I and the eight descendants from A will have to be ranked as very distinct genera, or even as distinct subfamilies. Thus it is, as I believe, that two or more genera are produced by descent with modification from two or more species of the same genus, and the two or more parent species are supposed to be descended from some one species of an earlier genus. In our diagram this is indicated by the broken lines beneath the capital letters converging in sub-branches downwards towards a single point. This point represents a species, the supposed progenitor of our several new subgenera and genera. It is worth while to reflect for a moment on the character of the new species F14, 
which is supposed not to have diverged much in character, but to have retained the form of F, either unaltered or altered only in a slight degree. In this case, its affinities to the other fourteen new species will be of a curious and circuitous nature. Being descended from a form that stood between the parent species A and I, now supposed to be extinct and unknown, it will be in some degree intermediate in character between the two groups descended from these two species. But as these two groups have gone on diverging in character from the type of their parents, the new species F14 will not be directly intermediate between them, but rather between types of the two groups, and every naturalist will be able to call such cases before his mind. In the diagram, each horizontal line has hitherto been supposed to represent a thousand generations, but each may represent a million or more generations. It may also represent a section of the successive strata of the Earth's crust, including extinct remains. We shall, when we come to our chapter on geology, have to refer again to this subject, and I think we shall then see that the diagram throws light on the affinities of extinct beings, which, though generally belonging to the same orders, families or genera, with those now living, yet are often, in some degree, intermediate in character between existing groups. And we can understand this fact, for the extinct species lived at various remote epochs, when the branching lines of descent had diverged less. I see no reason to limit the process of modification, as now explained, to the formation of genera alone. If in the diagram we suppose the amount of change represented by each successive group of diverging dotted lines to be great, the forms marked A14 to P14, those marked B14 and F14, and those marked O14 to M14, will form three very distinct genera. We shall also have two very distinct genera descended from I, differing widely from the descendants of A. These two groups of genera will thus form two distinct families or orders, according to the amount of divergent modification supposed to be represented in the diagram. And the two new families or orders are descended from two species of the original genus, and these are supposed to be descended from some still more ancient and unknown form. We have seen that in each country it is the species belonging to the larger genera which oftenest present varieties or incipient species. This, indeed, might have been expected. For as natural selection acts through one form having some advantage over other forms in the struggle for existence, it will chiefly act on those which already have some advantage. And the largeness of any group shows that its species have inherited from a common ancestor some advantage in common. Hence the struggle for the production of new and modified descendants will mainly lie between the larger groups, which are all trying to increase in number. One large group will slowly conquer another large group, reduce its number, and thus lessen its chance of further variation and improvement. Within the same large group, the later and more highly perfected subgroups, from branching out and seizing on many new places in the polity of nature, will constantly tend to supplant and destroy the earlier and less improved subforms. Small and broken groups and subgroups will finally disappear. Looking to the future, 
we can predict that the groups of organic beings which are now large and triumphant, and which are least broken up, that is, which have as yet suffered least extinction, will, for a long period, continue to increase. But which groups will ultimately prevail, no man can predict. For we know that many groups, formerly most extensively developed, have now become extinct. Looking still more remotely to the future, we may predict that, owing to the continued and steady increase of the larger groups, a multitude of smaller groups will become utterly extinct, and leave no modified descendants, and consequently that, of the species living at any one period, extremely few will transmit descendants to a remote futurity. I shall have to return to this subject in the chapter on classification, but I may add that as, according to this view, extremely few of the more ancient species have transmitted descendants to the present day, and as all the descendants of the same species form a class, we can understand how it is that there exist so few classes in each main division of the animal and vegetable kingdoms. Although few of the most ancient species have left modified descendants, yet, at remote geological periods, the earth may have been almost as well peopled with species of many genera, families, orders and classes, as at the present day. On the degree to which organization tends to advance, Natural selection acts exclusively by the preservation and accumulation of variations which are beneficial under the organic and inorganic conditions to which each creature is exposed at all periods of life. The ultimate result is that each creature tends to become more and more improved in relation to its conditions. This improvement invariably leads to the gradual advancement of the organization of the greater number of living beings throughout the world. But here we enter on a very intricate subject, for naturalists have not defined to each other's satisfaction what is meant by an advance in organization. Among the vertebra, the degree of intellect and an approach in structure to man clearly come into play. It might be thought that the amount of change which the various parts and organs pass through in their development from embryo to maturity would suffice as a standard of comparison. But there are cases, as with certain parasitic crustaceans, in which several parts of the structure become less perfect, so that the mature animal cannot be called higher than its larva. Von Baer's standard seems the most widely applicable and the best, namely the amount of differentiation of the parts of the same organic being in the adult state, as I should be inclined to add, and their specialization for different functions, or, as Milne Edwards would express it, the completeness of the division of physiological labor. But we shall see how obscure this subject is if we look, for instance, to fishes, among which some naturalists rank those as highest, which, like the sharks, approach nearest to amphibians, while other naturalists rank the common bony or teleostean fishes as the highest, inasmuch as they are most strictly fish-like, and differ most from the other vertebrate classes, we see still more plainly the obscurity of the subject by turning to plants, among which the standard of intellect is of course quite excluded. And here some botanists rank those plants as highest, which have every organ, as sepals, petals, stamens and pistils, fully developed in each flower, whereas other botanists, probably with more truth, 
look at the plants which have their several organs much modified and reduced in number as the highest. If we take as the standard of high organization the amount of differentiation and specialization of the several organs in each being when adult, and this will include the advancement of the brain for intellectual purposes, natural selection clearly leads towards this standard. For all physiologists admit that the specialization of organs inasmuch as in this state they perform their functions better, is an advantage to each being, and hence the accumulation of variations tending towards specialization is within the scope of natural selection. On the other hand, we can see, bearing in mind that all organic beings are striving to increase at a high ratio, and to seize on every unoccupied or less well-occupied space in the economy of nature, that it is quite possible for natural selection gradually to fit a being to a situation in which several organs would be superfluous or useless. In such cases there would be retrogression in the scale of organization. Whether organization on the whole has actually advanced from the remotest geological periods to the present day will be more conveniently discussed in our chapter on geological succession. But it may be objected that if all organic beings thus tend to rise in the scale, how is it that throughout the world a multitude of the lowest forms still exist? And how is it that in each great class some forms are far more highly developed than others? Why have not the more highly developed forms everywhere supplanted and exterminated the lower? Lamarck, who believed in an innate and inevitable tendency towards perfection in all organic beings, seems to have felt this difficulty so strongly that he was led to suppose that new and simple forms are continually being produced by spontaneous generation. Science has not as yet proved the truth of this belief, whatever the future may reveal. On our theory, the continued existence of lowly organisms offers no difficulty, for natural selection, or the survival of the fittest, does not necessarily include progressive development. It only takes advantage of such variations as arise and are beneficial to each creature under its complex relations of life. And it may be asked what advantage, as far as we can see, would it be to an infusorian animalcule, to an intestinal worm, or even to an earthworm, to be highly organized. If it were no advantage, these forms would be left by natural selection unimproved or but little improved, and might remain for indefinite ages in their present lowly condition. And geology tells us that some of the lowest forms, as the infusoria and rhizopods, have remained for an enormous period in nearly their present state. But to suppose that most of the many now existing low forms have not in the least advanced since the first dawn of life would be extremely rash, for every naturalist who has dissected some of the beings now ranked as very low in the scale must have been struck with their really wondrous and beautiful organization. Nearly the same remarks are applicable if we look to the different grades of organization within the same great group, for instance, in the vertebrata, to the coexistence of mammals and fish, among mammalia, to the coexistence of man and the ornithorhynchus, among fishes, to the coexistence of the shark and the lancelet, Amphioxus, which latter fish, in the extreme simplicity of its structure, approaches the invertebrate classes. But mammals and fish hardly come into competition with each other. The advancement of the whole class of mammals, or of certain members of this class, to the highest grade would not lead to their taking the place of fishes.
physiologists believe that the brain must be bathed by warm blood to be highly active, and this requires aerial respiration, so that warm-blooded animals, when inhabiting the water, lie under a disadvantage in having to come continually to the surface to breathe. With fishes, members of the shark family would not tend to supplant the lancelet, for the lancelet, as I hear from Fritz Muller, has as sole companion and competitor on the barren sandy shore of South Brazil an anomalous annelid. The three lowest orders of mammals, namely marsupials, edentata, and rodents, coexist in South America in the same region with numerous monkeys, and probably interfere little with each other. Although organization on the whole may have advanced and be still advancing throughout the world, yet the scale will always represent many degrees of perfection, for the high advancement of certain whole classes, or of certain members of each class, does not at all necessarily lead to the extinction of those groups with which they do not enter into close competition. In some cases, as we shall hereafter see, lowly organized forms appear to have been preserved to the present day from inhabiting confined or peculiar stations, where they have been subjected to less severe competition, and where their scanty numbers have retarded the chance of favorable variations arising. Finally, I believe that many lowly organized forms now exist throughout the world from various causes. In some cases, variations or individual differences of a favorable nature may never have arisen for natural selection to act on and accumulate. In no case, probably, has time sufficed for the utmost possible amount of development. In some few cases, there has been what we must call retrogression of organization, but the main cause lies in the fact that under very simple conditions of life, a high organization would be of no service, possibly would be of actual disservice, as being of a more delicate nature and more liable to be put out of order and injured. Looking to the first dawn of life, when all organic beings, as we may believe, presented the simplest structure, how, it has been asked, could the first step in the advancement or differentiation of parts have arisen? Mr. Herbert Spencer would probably answer that, as soon as simple unicellular organisms came by growth or division to be compounded of several cells, or became attached to any supporting surface, his law that homologous units of any order become differentiated in proportion as their relations to incident forces become different, would come into action. But as we have no facts to guide us, speculation on the subject is almost useless. It is, however, an error to suppose that there would be no struggle for existence, and consequently no natural selection, until many forms had been produced. Variations in a single species inhabiting an isolated station might be beneficial, and thus the whole mass of individuals might be modified, or two distinct forms might arise. But, as I remarked towards the close of the introduction, no one ought to feel surprise at much remaining as yet unexplained on the origin of species, if we make due allowance for our profound ignorance on the mutual relations of the inhabitants of the world at the present time, and still more so during past ages. Convergence of Character Mr. H. C. Watson thinks that I have overrated the importance of divergence of character, in which, however, he apparently believes and that convergence, as it may be called, has likewise played a part. If two species belonging to two distinct, though allied, genera, had both produced a large number of new and divergent forms, 
it is conceivable that these might approach each other so closely that they would have all to be classed under the same genus, and thus the descendants of two distinct genera would converge into one. But it would in most cases be extremely rash to attribute to convergence a close and general similarity of structure in the modified descendants of widely distinct forms. The shape of a crystal is determined solely by the molecular forces, and it is not surprising that dissimilar substances should sometimes assume the same form. But with organic beings we should bear in mind that the form of each depends on an infinitude of complex relations, namely on the variations which have arisen, these being due to causes far too intricate to be followed out, on the nature of the variations which have been preserved or selected, and this depends on the surrounding physical conditions, and in a still higher degree on the surrounding organisms with which each being has come into competition, and lastly on inheritance, in itself a fluctuating element, from innumerable progenitors, all of which have had their forms determined through equally complex relations. It is incredible that the descendants of two organisms, which had originally differed in a marked manner, should ever afterwards converge so closely as to lead to a near approach to identity throughout their whole organization. If this had occurred, we should meet with the same form independently of genetic connection, recurring in widely separated geological formations, and the balance of evidence is opposed to any such admission. Mr. Watson has also objected that the continued action of natural selection, together with divergence of character, would tend to make an indefinite number of specific forms. As far as mere inorganic conditions are concerned, it seems probable that a sufficient number of species would soon become adapted to all considerable diversities of heat, moisture, etc. But I fully admit that the mutual relations of organic beings are more important, and as the number of species in any country goes on increasing, the organic conditions of life must become more and more complex. Consequently, there seems at first no limit to the amount of profitable diversification of structure, and therefore no limit to the number of species which might be produced. We do not know that even the most prolific area is fully stocked with specific forms. At the Cape of Good Hope and in Australia, which support such an astonishing number of species, many European plants have become naturalized. But geology shows us that from an early part of the tertiary period, the number of species of shells, and that from the middle part of this same period, the number of mammals, has not greatly or at all increased. What then checks an indefinite increase in the number of species? The amount of life, and I do not mean the number of specific forms, supported on an area must have a limit, depending so largely as it does on physical conditions. Therefore, if an area be inhabited by very many species, each or nearly each species will be represented by few individuals, and such species will be liable to extermination from accidental fluctuations in the nature of the seasons, or in the number of their enemies. The process of extermination in such cases would be rapid, whereas the production of new species must always be slow. Imagine the extreme case of as many species as individuals in England, and the first severe winter or very dry summer would exterminate thousands on thousands of species. Rare species, and each species will become rare if the number of species in any country becomes indefinitely increased, will, 
on the principle often explained, present within a given period few favourable variations. Consequently, the process of giving birth to new specific forms would thus be retarded. When any species becomes very rare, close interbreeding will help to exterminate it. Authors have thought that this comes into play in accounting for the deterioration of the aurochs in Lithuania, of red deer in Scotland, and of bears in Norway, etc. Lastly, and this I am inclined to think is the most important element, a dominant species, which has already beaten many competitors in its own home, will tend to spread and supplant many others. Alphonse de Candol has shown that those species which spread widely tend generally to spread very widely. Consequently, they will tend to supplant and exterminate several species in several areas, and thus check the inordinate increase of specific forms throughout the world. Dr. Hooker has recently shown that in the southeast corner of Australia, where, apparently, there are many invaders from different quarters of the globe, the endemic Australian species have been greatly reduced in number. How much weight to attribute to these several considerations I will not pretend to say, but conjointly they must limit in each country the tendency to an indefinite augmentation of specific forms. Summary of chapter If under changing conditions of life, organic beings present individual differences in almost every part of their structure, and this cannot be disputed, if there be, owing to their geometrical rate of increase, a severe struggle for life at some age, season or year, and this certainly cannot be disputed, then, considering the infinite complexity of the relations of all organic beings to each other and to their conditions of life, causing an infinite diversity in structure, constitution and habits, to be advantageous to them, it would be a most extraordinary fact if no variations had ever occurred useful to each being's own welfare in the same manner as so many variations have occurred useful to man. But if variations useful to any organic being ever do occur, assuredly individuals thus characterized will have the best chance of being preserved in the struggle for life. And from the strong principle of inheritance, these will tend to produce offspring similarly characterized. This principle of preservation, or the survival of the fittest, I have called natural selection. It leads to the improvement of each creature in relation to its organic and inorganic conditions of life, and consequently, in most cases, to what must be regarded as an advance in organization. Nevertheless, low and simple forms will long endure if well fitted for their simple conditions of life. Natural selection, on the principle of qualities being inherited at corresponding ages, can modify the egg, seed or young as easily as the adult. Among many animals, sexual selection will have given its aid to ordinary selection by assuring to the most vigorous and best adapted males the greatest number of offspring. Sexual selection will also give characters useful to the males alone in their struggles or rivalry with other males, and these characteristics will be transmitted to one sex or to both sexes according to the form of inheritance which prevails. Whether natural selection has really thus acted in adapting the various forms of life to their several conditions and stations 
must be judged by the general tenor and balance of evidence given in the following chapters. But we have already seen how it entails extinction, and how largely extinction has acted in the world's history, geology plainly declares. Natural selection also leads to divergence of character, for the more organic beings diverge in structure, habits and constitution, by so much the more can a large number be supported on the area, of which we see proof by looking to the inhabitants of any small spot, and to the productions naturalized in foreign lands. Therefore, during the modification of the descendants of any one species, and during the incessant struggle of all species to increase in numbers, the more diversified the descendants become, the better will be their chance of success in the battle for life. Thus the small differences distinguishing varieties of the same species steadily tend to increase, till they equal the greater differences between species of the same genus, or even of distinct genera. We have seen that it is the common, the widely diffused and widely ranging species, belonging to the larger genera within each class, which vary most, and these tend to transmit to their modified offspring that superiority which now makes them dominant in their own countries. Natural selection, as has just been remarked, leads to divergence of character and to much extinction of the less improved and intermediate forms of life. On these principles, the nature of the affinities and the generally well-defined distinctions between the innumerable organic beings in each class throughout the world may be explained. It is a truly wonderful fact, the wonder of which we are apt to overlook from familiarity, that all animals and plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other in groups, subordinate to groups, in the manner which we everywhere behold, namely, varieties of the same species most closely related, species of the same genus less closely and unequally related, forming sections and subgenera, species of distinct genera much less closely related, and genera related in different degrees, forming subfamilies, families, orders, subclasses and classes. The several subordinate groups in any class cannot be ranked in a single file, but seem clustered around points, and these round other points, and so on in almost endless cycles. If species had been independently created, no explanation would have been possible of this kind of classification but it is explained through inheritance and the complex action of natural selection, entailing extinction and divergence of character, as we have seen illustrated in the diagram. The affinities of all the beings of the same class have sometimes been represented by a great tree. I believe this simile largely speaks the truth. The green and budding twigs may represent existing species, and these produced during former years may represent the long succession of extinct species. At each period of growth, all the growing twigs have tried to branch out on all sides, and to overtop and kill the surrounding twigs and branches. In the same manner as species and groups of species, have at all times overmastered other species in the great battle for life. The limbs divided into great branches, and these into lesser and lesser branches, were themselves once, when the tree was young, budding twigs. And this connection of the former and present buds, by ramifying branches, may well represent the classification of all extinct and living species, species, 
in groups subordinate to groups. Of the many twigs which flourished when the tree was a mere bush, only two or three, now grown into great branches, yet survive and bear the other branches. So with the species which lived during long past geological periods, very few have left living and modified descendants. From the first growth of the tree, many a limb and branch has decayed and dropped off, and these fallen branches of various sizes may represent those whole orders, families and genera, which have now no living representatives, and which are known to us only in a fossil state. As we here and there see a thin, straggling branch, springing from a fork low down in a tree, and which by some chance has been favoured and is still alive on its summit, so we occasionally see an animal like the ornithorhynchus or lepidosiren, which in some small degree connects by its affinities two large branches of life, and which has apparently been saved from fatal competition by having inhabited a protected station. As buds give rise by growth to fresh buds, and these, if vigorous, branch out and overtop on all sides, many a feebler branch. So, by generation, I believe it has been with the great tree of life, which fills with its dead and broken branches the crust of the earth, and covers the surface with its ever-branching and beautiful ramifications. End of chapter 4「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.」Recorded by Rainer Oppenrein. « The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection » or « The Preservation of Favorite Races in the Struggle of Life » 6th London Edition by Charles Darwin » Chapter number 5 Laws of Variation Contents of this chapter include Effects of Change Conditions Use and Disuse Combined with Natural Selection Organs of Light and of Vision Acclimatization Correlated Variation Compensation and Economy of Growth False Correlations Multiple rudimentary and lowly organized structures variable. Parts developed in an unusual manner are highly variable, specific characters more variable than generic, secondary sexual characters variable. Species of the same genus vary in an analogous manner. Reversions to long-lost characters. Summary I have hitherto sometimes spoken as if the variations, so common and multiform with organic beings under domestication, and in a lesser degree with those under nature, were due to chance. This, of course, is a wholly incorrect expression, but it serves to acknowledge plainly our ignorance of the cause of each particular variation. Some authors believe it to be as much the function of the reproductive system to produce individual differences or slight deviations of structure as to make the child like its parents. But the fact of variations and monstrosities occurring much more frequently under domestication than under nature, and the greater variability of species having wide ranges than of those with restricted ranges, lead to the conclusion that variability is generally related to the conditions of life to which each species has been exposed during several successive generations. In the first chapter I attempted to show that changed conditions act in two ways, directly, on the whole organization or on certain parts alone, and indirectly, through the reproductive system. In all cases there are two factors, the nature of the organism, 
which is much the most important of the two, and the nature of the conditions. The direct action of changed conditions leads to definite or indefinite results. In the latter case, the organization seems to become plastic, and we have much fluctuating variability. In the former case, the nature of the organism is such that it yields readily, when subjected to certain conditions, and all, or nearly all, the individuals become modified in the same way. It is very difficult to decide how far changed conditions, such as of climate, food, etc., have acted in a definite manner. There is reason to believe that in the course of time the effects have been greater than can be proved by clear evidence. But we may safely conclude that the innumerable complex co-adaptations of structure, which we see throughout nature between various organic beings, cannot be attributed simply to such action. In the following cases, the conditions seem to have produced some slight definite effect. E. Forbes asserts that shells at the southern limit, and when living in shallow water, are more brightly colored than those of the same species of further north, or from a greater depth. But this certainly does not always hold good. Mr. Gould believes that birds of the same species are more brightly colored under a clear atmosphere than when living near the coast or on islands, and Wollaston is convinced that residence near the sea affects the colors of insects. Mokintendon gives a list of plants which, when growing near the seashore, have their leaves in some degree fleshy, though not elsewhere fleshy. These lightly varying organisms are interesting in as far as they present characters analogous to those possessed by the species which are confined to similar conditions. When a variation is of the slightest use to any being, we cannot tell how much to attribute to the accumulative action of natural selection, and how much to the definite action of the conditions of life. Thus, it is well known to furious that animals of the same species have thicker and better fur the further north they live. But who can tell how much of this difference may be due to the warmest clad individuals having been favored and preserved during many generations, and how much to the action of the severe climate? For it would appear that climate has some direct action on the hair of our domestic quadrupeds. Instances could be given of similar varieties being produced from the same species under external conditions of life, as different as can well be conceived, and, on the other hand, of the similar varieties being produced under apparently the same external conditions. Again, innumerable instances are known to every naturalist of species keeping true, or not varying at all, although living under the most opposite climates. Such considerations as these incline me to lay less weight on the direct action of the surrounding conditions than on a tendency to vary, due to causes of which we are quite ignorant. In one sense, the conditions of life may be said not only to cause variability, either directly or indirectly, but likewise to include natural selection, for the conditions determine whether this or that variety shall survive. But when man is the selecting agent, we clearly see that the two elements of change are distinct. Variability is in some manner excited, but it is the will of man which accumulates the variations in certain direction, and it is this latter agency which answers to the survival of the fittest under nature. Subchapter Effects of the increased use and disuse of parts as controlled by natural selection. From the facts alluded to in the first chapter, I think there can be no doubt that the use in our domestic animals has strengthened and enlarged certain parts, and disused diminished them and that such modifications are inherited. Under free nature, we have no standard of comparison 
by which to judge of the effects of long continued use or disuse, for we know not the parent forms. But many animals possess structures which can be best explained by the effects of disuse. As Professor Owen has remarked, there is no greater anomaly in nature than a bird that cannot fly. Yet there are several in this state. The logger-headed duck in South America can only flap along the surface of the water, and has its wings in nearly the same condition as a domestic Aylesbury duck. It is a remarkable fact that the younger birds, according to Mr. Cunningham, can fly, while the adults have lost this power. As the larger, ground-feeding birds seldom take flight except to escape danger, it is probable that the nearly wingless condition of several birds now inhabiting, or which lately inhabited several oceanic islands, tenanted by no beasts of prey, has been caused by this use. The ostrich, indeed, inhabits continents, and is exposed to danger from which it cannot escape a flight, but it can defend itself by kicking its enemies as efficiently as many quadrupeds. We may believe that the progenitor of the ostrich genus had habits like those of the bustard, and that, as the size and weight of its body were increased during successive generations, its legs were used more, and its wings less, until they became incapable of flight. Kirby has remarked, and I have observed the same fact, that the anterior tarsi, or feet, of many male dung-feeding beetles are often broken off. He examined seven T specimens in his own collection, and not one had even a relic left. In the Unites Apollos, the tarsi are so habitually lost that the insect has been described as not having them. In some other genera they are present, but in a rudimentary condition. In the Antiochus, or sacred beetle, of the Egyptians, they are totally deficient. The evidence that accidental mutilations can be inherited is at present not decisive. But the remarkable cases observed by Brown Sackhart in guinea pigs of the inherited effects of operations should make us cautious in denying this tendency. Hence, it will perhaps be safest to look at the entire absence of the anterior tarsi in Antiochus, and their rudimentary condition in some other genera, not at cases of inherited mutilations, but as due to the effects of long-continued disuse. For as many dung-feeding beetles are generally found with their tarsi lost, this must happen early in life. Therefore, the tarsi cannot be of much importance or be much used by these insects. In some cases, we might easily put down to disuse modifications of structure, which are wholly or mainly due to natural selection. Mr. Wollaston has discovered the remarkable fact the two hundred beetles, out of the five hundred and fifty species, but more are not known, inhabiting Madeira, are so far deficient in wings that they cannot fly, and that, of the twenty-nine endemic genera, no less than twenty-three have all their species in this condition. Several facts, namely, that beetles in many parts of the world are very frequently blown to sea and perish that the beetles in Madeira, as observed by Mr. Wollaston, lie much concealed until the wind lulls and the sun shines, that the proportion of wingless beetles is larger on the exposed deserters than in Madeira itself, and especially the extraordinary fact, so strongly insisted on by Mr. Wollaston, that certain large groups of beetles, elsewhere excessively numerous, which absolutely require the use of their wings, are here almost entirely absent. These several considerations make me believe that the wingless condition of so many Madeira beetles is mainly due to the action of natural selection, combined probably with this use. For, during many successive generations, each individual beetle, which flew least, either from its wings having been ever so little less perfectly developed, 
or from indolent habit, will have had the best chance of surviving from not being blown out to sea. And, on the other hand, those beetles which most readily took to flight would oftenest have been blown to sea, and thus destroyed. The insects in Madeira, which are not ground feeders, and which, as certain flower-feeding coleoptera and lepidoptera, must habitually use their wings to gain their subsistence, have, as Mr. Wollaston suspects, their wings not at all reduced, but even enlarged. This is quite compatible with the action of natural selection. For, when a new insect first arrives on the island, the tendency of natural selection to enlarge or to reduce the wings would depend on whether a greater number of individuals were saved by successfully battling with the winds, or by giving up the attempt and rarely or never flying. As with marinas shipwrecked near a coast, it would have been better for the good swimmers if they had been able to swim still further, whereas it would have been better for the bad swimmers if they had not been able to swim at all and had stuck to the wreck. The eyes of moles and some burrowing rodents are rudimentary in size, and in some cases are quite covered by skin and fur. This state of the eyes is probably due to gradual reduction from disuse, but aided perhaps by natural selection. In South America, a burrowing rodent, the tucutucu, or stenomus, is even more subterranean in its habits than the mole, and I was assured by a Spaniard, who had often caught them, that they were frequently blind. One which I kept alive was certainly in this condition, the cause, as appeared on dissection, having been inflammation of the nictitating membrane. As frequent inflammation of the eyes must be injurious to any animal, and as eyes are certainly not necessary to animals having subterranean habits, a reduction in their size, with the adhesion of the eyelids and growth of fur over them, might, in such case, be an advantage, and if so, natural selection would aid the effects of disuse. It is well known that several animals, belonging to the most different classes, which inhabit the caves of Carniola and Kentucky, are blind. In some of the crabs, the footstalk for the eye remains, though the eye is gone. The stand for the telescope is there, though the telescope with its glasses has been lost. As it is difficult to imagine that eyes, though useless, could be in any way injurious to animals living in darkness, their loss may be attributed to disuse. In one of the blind animals, namely the cave rat, Neotoma, two of which were captured by Professor Silliman, at above half a mile distance from the mouth of the cave, and therefore not in the profoundest depth, the eyes were lustrous and of large size, and these animals, as I am informed by Professor Silliman, having been exposed for about a month to graduated light, acquired a dim perception of objects. It is difficult to imagine conditions of life more similar than deep limestone caverns under a nearly similar climate, though that, in accordance with the old view of the blind animals having been separately created for the American and European caverns, very close similarity in their organization and affinities might have been expected. This is certainly not the case if we look at the two whole faunas. With respect to the insects alone, Chiot has remarked, We are accordingly prevented from considering the entire phenomenon in any other light than something purely local, and the similarity which is exhibited in a few forms between the mammoth cave in Kentucky and the caverns in Carniola, otherwise than as a very plain expression of that analogy which subsists generally between the fauna of Europe and North America. On my view, we must suppose that American animals, having in most cases ordinary powers of vision, slowly migrated by successive generations 
from the outer world into the deeper and deeper recesses of the Kentucky caves, as did European animals into the caves of Europe. We have some evidence of this gradation of habit, for, as Giot remarks, we accordingly look upon the subterranean faunas as small ramifications which have penetrated into the earth from the geographically limited faunas of the adjacent tracts, at which as they extended themselves into darkness, have been accommodated to surrounding circumstances. Animals, not far remote from ordinary forms, prepare the transition from light to darkness. Next follow those that are constructed for twilight, and, last of all, those destined for total darkness, and whose formation is quite peculiar. These remarks of Chiot's, it should be understood, apply not to the same, but to distinct species. By the time that an animal had reached, after numberless generations, the deepest recesses, this youth will on this view have more or less perfectly obliterated its eyes, and natural selection will often have effected other changes, such as an increase in the length of the antenna or palpi, as a compensation for blindness. Notwithstanding such modifications, we might expect still to see in the cave animals of America affinities to the other inhabitants of that continent, and in those of Europe to the inhabitants of the European continent. And this is the case with some of the American cave animals, as I hear from Professor Dana. And some of the European cave insects are very closely allied to those of the surrounding country. It would be difficult to give any rational explanation of the affinities of the blind cave animals to the other inhabitants of the two continents on the ordinary view of their independent creation. That several of the inhabitants of the caves of the old and the new worlds should be closely related, we might expect from the well-known relationship of most of their other productions. As a blind species of Patusia is found in abundance on shady rocks far from caves, the loss of vision in the cave species of this one genus has probably had no relation to its dark habitation, for it is natural that an insect already deprived of vision should readily become adapted to dark caverns. An other blind genus, Anophthalmus, offers this remarkable peculiarity, that the species, as Mr. Murray observes, have not as yet been found anywhere except in caves. Yet those which inhabit the several caves of Europe and America are distinct. But it is possible that the progenitors of these several species, while they were furnished with eyes, may formerly have ranged over both continents, and then have become extinct, excepting in their present secluded abodes. Far from feeling surprised that some of the cave animals should be very anomalous, as Agassiz has remarked in regard to the blind fish, the Amliopsis, and as it is the case with the blind Proteus, with reference to the reptiles of Europe, I am only surprised that more wrecks of ancient life have not been preserved owing to the less severe competition to which the scanty inhabitants of these dark abodes will have been exposed. Subchapter Acclimatization Habit is hereditary with plants, as in the period of flowering, in the time of sleep, and the amount of rain requisite for seeds to germinate, etc., and this leads me to say a few words on acclimatization, as it is extremely common for distinct species belonging to the same genus to inhabit hot and cold countries. If it be true that all the species of the same genus are descended from a single parent form, acclimatization must be readily effected during a long course of descent. It is notorious that each species is adapted to the climate of its own home. Species from an arctic 
or even from a temperate region, cannot endure a tropical climate, or conversely. So again, many succulent plants cannot endure a damp climate. But the degree of adaption of species to the climates under which they live is often overrated. We may infer this from our frequently inability to predict whether or not an imported plant will endure our climate, and from the number of plants and animals brought from different countries which are here perfectly healthy. We have reason to believe that species in a state of nature are closely limited in their ranges by the competition of other organic beings quite as much as, or more than, by adaption to the particular climates. But whether or not this adaption is in most cases very close, we have evidence with some few plants of their becoming, to a certain extent, naturally habituated to different temperatures, that is, they become acclimatized. Thus the pines and rhododendrons, raised from seed, collected by Dr. Hooker, from the same species growing at different heights on the Himalayas, were found to possess in this country different constitutional powers of resisting cold. Mr. Thwaites informs me that he has observed similar facts in Ceylon. Analogous observations have been made by Mr. H. C. Watson on European species of plants brought from the Azores to England. And I could give other cases. In regard to animals, several authentic instances could be adduced of species having largely extended within historical times their range from warmer to colder latitudes, and conversely. But we do not positively know that these animals were strictly adapted to their native climate, though in all ordinary cases we assume such to be the case. Nor do we know that they have subsequently become specially acclimatized to their new homes, so as to be better fitted for them than they were at first. As we may infer that our domestic animals were originally chosen by uncivilized men because they were useful, and because they bred readily under confinement, and not because they were subsequently found capable of far extended transportation, the common and extraordinary capacity in our domestic animals of not only withstanding the most different climates, but of being perfectly fertile, a far severer test, under them, may be used as an argument that large proportion of other animals, now in a state of nature, could easily be brought to bear widely different climates. We must not, however, push the foregoing argument too far, on account of the probable origin of some of our domestic animals from several wild stocks. The blood, for instance, of a tropical and arctic wolf may perhaps be mingled in our domestic breeds. The rat and mouse cannot be considered as domestic animals, but they have been transported by men to many parts of the world, and now have a far wider range than any other rodent. For they live under the cold climate of Faroe, in the north, and the Falklands in the south, and on many an island in the torrid zones. Hence, adaptation to any special climate may be looked at as a quality readily grafted on an innate wide flexibility of constitution, common to most animals. On this view, the capacity of enduring the most different climates by man himself and by his domestic animals and the fact of the extinct elephant and rhinoceros having formerly endured a glacial climate, whereas the living species are now all tropical or subtropical in their habits, ought not to be looked at as anomalies, but as examples of a very common flexibility of constitution, brought under peculiar circumstances into action. How much of the acclimatization of species to any peculiar climate, 
is due to mere habit, and how much to the natural selection of varieties having different innate constitutions, and how much to both means combined, is an obscure question. That habit or custom has some influence, I must believe, both from analogy and from the incessant advice given in agricultural works, even in the ancient encyclopedias of China, to be very cautious in transporting animals from one district to another. As it is not likely that man should have succeeded in selecting so many breeds and sub-breeds with constitutions specially fitted for their own districts, the result must, I think, to be due to habit. On the other hand, natural selection would inevitably tend to preserve those individuals which were born with constitutions best adapted to any country which they inhabited. In treatises on many kinds of cultivated plants, certain varieties are said to withstand certain climates better than others. This is strikingly shown in works on fruit trees published in the United States, in which certain varieties are habitually recommended for the northern and others for the southern states. And as most of these varieties are of recent origin, they cannot owe the constitutional differences to habit. The case of the Jerusalem artichoke, which is never propagated in England by seed, and of which, consequently, new varieties have not been produced, has even been advanced as proving that acclimatization cannot be effected, for it is now as tender as ever it was. The case also of the kidney bean has been often cited for a similar purpose, and with much greater weight. But until someone will sow, during a score of generations, his kidney beans so early that a very large proportion are destroyed by frost, and then collect seed from the few survivors, with care to prevent accidental crosses, and then again get seed from these seedlings, with the same precautions, the experiment cannot be said to have been tried. Nor let it be supposed the differences in the constitution of seedling kidney beans never appear, for an account has been published how much more hardy some seedlings are than others. And of this fact I have myself observed striking instances. On the whole, we may conclude that habit, or use and disuse, have, in some cases, played a considerable part in the modification of the constitution and structure, but that the effects have often been largely combined with and sometimes overmastered by the natural selection of innate variations. Subchapter Correlated Variation I mean by this expression that the whole organization is so tied together during its growth and development that when slight variations in any one part occur and are accumulated through natural selection, other parts become modified. This is a very important subject, most imperfectly understood, and no doubt wholly different classes of facts may be here easily confounded together. We shall presently see that simple inheritance often gives the false appearance of correlation. One of the most obvious real cases is that variations of structure arising in the young or larvae naturally tend to affect the structure of the mature animal. The several parts which are homologous and which, at an early embryonic period, are identical in structure and which are necessarily exposed to similar conditions, seem eminently liable to vary in a like manner. We see this in the right and the left sides of the body, varying in the same manner in the front and the hind legs, and even in the jaws and limbs, varying together, for the lower jaw is believed 
by some anatomists, to be homologous with the limbs. These tendencies, I do not doubt, may be mastered more or less completely by natural selection. Thus, a family of stags once existed with an antler only on one side, and if this had been of any great use to the breed, it might, probably, have been rendered permanent by natural selection. Homologous parts, as has been remarked by some authors, tend to cohere. This is often seen in monstrous plants, and nothing is more common than the union of homologous parts in normal structures, as in the union of the petals into a tube. Hard parts seem to affect the form of the adjoining soft parts. It is believed by some authors that with birds the diversity in the shape of the pelvis causes the remarkable diversity in the shape of the kidneys. Others believe that the shade of the pelvis in the human mother influences by pressure the shape of the head of the child. In snakes, according to Schlegel, the shape of the body and the manner of swallowing determine the position and form of several of the most important viscera. The nature of the bond is frequently quite obscure. M. S. Geoffrey St. Hilaire has forcibly remarked that certain malconformations frequently, and that others rarely coexist, without our being able to assign any reason. What can be more singular than the relation in cats between complete whiteness and blue eyes with deafness, or between the tortoise shell color and the female sex, or in pigeons between the feathered feet and skin betwixt the outer toes, or between the presence of more or less down on the young pigeon when first hatched, with the future color of its plumage, or again the relation between the hair and the teeth in the naked Turkish dog, though here, no doubt, homology comes into play. With respect to this latter case of correlation, I think it can hardly be accidental that the two orders of mammals, which are most abnormal in their dermal covering, viz. cetacea, whales, and indentata, armadillos, scaly ant-eaters, etc., are likewise on the whole the most abnormal in their teeth. But there are so many exceptions to this rule, as Mr. Mirward has remarked, that it has little value. I know of no case better adapted to show the importance of the laws of correlation and variation, independently of utility, and therefore of natural selection, than that of the difference between the outer and inner flows in some compositus and ambivalurous plants. Everybody is familiar with the difference between the ray and central florets of, for instance, the daisy, and this difference is often accompanied with a partial or complete abortion of the reproductive organs. But in some of these plants the seeds also differ in shape and sculpture, these differences have sometimes been attributed to the pressure of the involucra on the florets, or to the mutual pressure, and the shape of the seeds in the ray florets of some composite countenances this idea. But with the umbilifery it is by no means, as Dr. Hooker informs me, the species with the densest heads which most frequently differ in their inner and outer flowers. It might have been thought that the development of the ray petals by drawing nourishment from the reproductive organs causes their abortion. But this can hardly be the sole case, for in some composite the seeds of the outer and inner florets differ, without any difference in the corolla. Possibly these several differences may be connected with the different flow of nutriment towards the central and external flowers. We know, at least, that with irregular flowers those nearest to the axis are most subject to peloria, that is, to become abnormally symmetrical. I may add 
as an instance of this fact, and as a striking case of correlation, that in many pelagoniums the two upper petals in the central flower of the truss often lose their patches of darker color. And when this occurs, the adherent nectary is quite aborted, the central flower thus becoming pyloric or regular. When the color is absent from only one of the two upper petals, the nectary is not quite aborted, but is much shortened. With respect to the development of the corolla, Sprengel's idea that the ray florets serve to attract insects, whose agency is highly advantageous, or necessary for the fertilization of these plants, is highly probable. And if so, natural selection may have come into play. But, with respect to the seeds, it seems impossible that their differences in shape, which are not always correlated with any difference in the corolla, can be in any way beneficial. Yet, in the umbellifery, these differences are of such apparent importance, the seeds being sometimes orthospermous in the exterior flowers and coleospermous in the central flowers, that the elder de Condole founded his main divisions in the order on such characters. Hence, modification of structure, viewed by systematists, as of high value, may be wholly due to the laws of variation and correlation, without being, as far as we can judge, of the slightest service to the species. We may often falsely attribute to the correlated variation structures which are common to whole groups of species, and which, in truth, are simply due to inheritance. For an ancient progenitor may have acquired through natural selection, some one modification in structure, and, after thousands of generations, some other and independent modification. And these two modifications, having been transmitted to a whole group of descendants with diverse habits, would naturally be sought to be, in some necessary manner, correlated. Some other correlations are apparently due to the manner in which natural selection can alone act. For instance, Alf de Condole has remarked that winged seeds are never found in fruits which do not open. I should explain this rule by the impossibility of seeds gradually becoming winged through natural selection, unless the capsules were open. For in this case alone could the seeds which were a little better adapted to be wafted by the wind, gain an advantage over others less well fitted for wide dispersal. Subchapter Compensation and Economy of Growth The elder Geoffrey and Goethe propounded, at about the same time, their law of compensation or balancement of growth, or, as Goethe expressed it, in order to spend on one side, nature is forced to economize on the other side. I think this holds true to a certain extent with our domestic productions. If nourishment flows to one part or organ in excess, it rarely flows, at least in excess, to another part. Thus it is difficult to get a cow to give much milk and to fatten readily. The same varieties of the cabbage do not yield abundant and nutritious foliage and copious supply of oil-bearing seeds. When the seeds in our fruits become atrophied, gains largely in size and quality. In our poultry, a large tuft of feathers on the head is generally accompanied by a diminished comb, and a large beard by diminished battles. With species in a state of nature, it can hardly be maintained that the law is of a universal application. But many good observers, more especially botanists, believe in this truth. I will not, however, here give any instances, for I see hardly any way of distinguishing between the effects on the one hand, of a part being largely developed through natural selection, 
and another and adjoining part being reduced by the same process or by disuse, and, on the other hand, the actual withdrawal of nutriment from one part owing to the excess of growth in another and adjoining part. I suspect also that some of the cases of compensation which have been advanced, and likewise some other facts, may be merged under a more general principle, namely, that natural selection is continually trying to economize in every part of the organization. If, under changed conditions of life, a structure, before useful, becomes less useful, its diminution will be favored, for it will profit the individual not to have its nutriment wasted in building up a useless structure. I can thus only understand the fact with which I was much struck when examining Seripides, and of which many other instances could be given, namely, that when a Seripide is parasitic within an other Seripide and is thus protected, it loses more or less completely its own shell or carapacy. This is the case with the male Ibla, and in a truly extraordinary manner with the Proteopolis. For the carapacy in all other Seripides consists of the three highly important anterior segments of the head enormously developed and furnished with great nerves and muscles. But in the parasitic and protected Proteopolis, the whole anterior part of the head is reduced to the merest rudiment attached to the bases of the prehensile antennae. Now, the saving of a large and complex structure, when rendered superfluous, would be a decided advantage to each successive individual of the species. For, in the struggle of life to which every animal is exposed, each would have a better chance of supporting itself, by less nutriment being wasted. Thus, as I believe, Natural selection will tend in the long run to reduce any part of the organization as soon as it becomes, through changed habits, superfluous, without by any means causing some other part to be largely developed in a corresponding degree. And conversely, that natural selection may perfectly well succeed in largely developing an organ without requiring as a necessary compensation the reduction of some adjoining part. Subchapter Multiple, rudimentary and lowly organized structures are variable. It seems to be a rule, as remarked by Is Geoffrey St. Hilaire, both with varieties and species, that when any part or organ is repeated many times in the same individual, as the vertebrae in snakes and the stamens in polyandrous flowers, the number is variable, whereas the number of the same part or organ, when it occurs in lesser numbers, is constant. The same author, as well as some botanists, have further remarked that multiple parts are extremely liable to vary in structure, as vegetative repetition, to use Professor Owen's expression, is a sign of low organization. The foregoing statements accord with the common opinion of naturalists that beings which stand low in the scale of nature are more variable than those which are higher. I presume that lowness here means that the several parts of the organization have been but little specialized for particular functions and as long as the same part has to perform diversified work, we can perhaps see why it should remain variable, that is, why natural selection would not have preserved or rejected each little deviation to form so carefully as when the part has to serve for some one special purpose. In the same way as a knife, which has to cut all sorts of things, may be of almost any shape, whilst the tool for some particular purpose must be of some particular shape. Natural selection, it should never be forgotten, can act solely through 
and for the advantage of each being. Rudimentary parts, as is generally admitted, are apt to be highly variable. We shall have to recur to the subject, and I will here only add that their variability seems to result from their uselessness, and, consequently, from natural selection, having had no power to check deviations in their structure. Subchapter A part developed in any species in an extraordinary degree or manner, in comparison with the same part in an allied species, tends to be highly variable. Several years ago I was much struck by a remark to the above effect made by Mr. Waterhouse. Professor Owen, also, seems to have come to a nearly similar conclusion. It is hopeless to attempt to convince any one of the truths of the above proposition without giving the long array of facts which I have collected, and which cannot possibly be here introduced. I can only state my conviction that it is a rule of high generality. I am aware of several causes of error, but I hope that I have made due allowances for them. I should be understood that the rule by no means applies to any part, however unusually developed, unless it be unusually developed in one species or in a few species, in comparison with the same part in many closely allied species. Thus, the wing of the bat is a most abnormal structure in the class of mammals. But the rule would not apply here, because the whole group of bats possesses wings. It could apply only if some one species had wings developed in a remarkable manner in comparison with the other species of the same genus. The rule applies very strongly in the case of secondary sexual characters, when displayed in any unusual manner. The term, secondary sexual characters, used by Hunter, relates to characters which are attached to one sex, but are not directly connected with the act of reproduction. The rule applies to males and females, but more rarely to females as they seldom offer remarkable secondary sexual characters. The rule, being so plainly applicable in the case of secondary sexual characters, may be due to the great variability of these characters, whether or not displayed in any unusual manner, of which fact I think there can be little doubt. But that our rule is not confined to secondary sexual characters, is clearly shown in the case of hermaphrodite cirripedes. I particularly attended to Mr. Waterhouse's remark, whilst investigating this order, and I am fully convinced that the rule almost always holds good. I shall, in a future work, give a list of all the more remarkable cases. I will here give only one, as it illustrates the rule in its largest application. The opercular valves of the seal cirripedes, rock barnacles, are, in every sense of the word, very important structures, and they differ extremely little even in a distinct genera. But in the several species of one genus, perogoma, these valves present a marvelous amount of diversification. The homologous valves in the different species being sometimes wholly unlike in shape, and the amount of variation in the individuals of the same species is so great that it is no exaggeration to state that the varieties of the same species differ more from each other and the characters derived from these important organs than do the species belonging to other distinct genera. As with the birds, the individuals of the same species, inhabiting the same country, vary extremely little. I have particularly attended to them, and the rule certainly seems to hold good in this class. <laughs>
I cannot make out that it applies to plants, and this would have seriously shaken my belief in its truth, had not the great variability in plants made it particularly difficult to compare their relative degree of variability. When we see any part or organ developed in a remarkable degree or manner in a species, the fair presumption is that it is of high importance to that species. Nevertheless, it is in this case eminently liable to variation. Why should this be so? On the view that each species has been independently created with all its parts as we now see them, I can see no explanation. But on the view that groups of species are descended from some other species and have been modified through natural selection, I think we can obtain some light. First, let me make some preliminary remarks. If, in our domestic animals, any part of the whole animal be neglected, and no selection be applied, that part, for instance, the comb and the dorking fowl, or the whole breed will cease to have a uniform character, and the breed may be said to be degenerating. In the rudimentary organs, and in those which have been but little specialized for any particular purpose, and perhaps in polymorphic groups, we can see a nearly parallel case. For in such cases, natural selection either has not or cannot come into full play, and thus the organization is left in a fluctuating condition. But what here more particularly concerns us is that those points in our domestic animals, which at the present time are undergoing rapid change by continued selection, are also eminently liable to variation. Look at the individuals on the same breed of the pigeon, and see what a prodigious amount of difference there is in the beak of tumblers, in the beak and rattle of carriers, in the carriage and tail of fantails, etc. These being the points now mainly attended to by English fanciers. Even in the same sub-breed, as in that of the short-faced tumbler, it is notoriously difficult to breed nearly perfect birds, many departing widely from the standard. There may truly be said to be a constant struggle going on between, on the one hand, the tendency to reversion to a less perfect state, as well as an innate tendency to new variations, and, on the other hand, the power of steady selection to keep the breed true. In the long run, selection gains the day, and we do not expect to fail so completely as to breed a bird as coarse as a common tumbler pigeon from a good short-faced strain. But as long as selection is rapidly going on, much variability in the parts undergoing modification may always be expected. Now let us turn to nature. When a part has been developed in an extraordinary manner in any one species, compared with the other species of the same genus, we may conclude that this part has undergone an extraordinary amount of modification since the period when several species branched off from the common progenitor of the genus. This period will seldom be remote in any extreme degree, as species rarely endure for more than one geological period. An extraordinary amount of modification implies an unusually large and long-continued amount of variability, which has continually been accumulated by natural selection for the benefit of the species. But, as the variability of the extraordinary developed part or organ has been so great and long continued, with a period not excessively remote, we might, as a general rule, still expect to find more variability 
in such parts than in other parts of the organization which have remained for a much longer period nearly constant. And this, I am convinced, is the case, that the struggle between natural selection on the one hand and the tendency to reversion and variability on the other hand will in the course of time cease, and that the most abnormally developed organs may be made constant, I see no reason to doubt. Hence, when an organ, however abnormal it may be, has been transmitted in approximately the same condition to many modified descendants, as in the case of the wing of the bat, it must have existed, according to our theory, for an immense period in nearly the same state, and thus it has come not to be more variable than any other structure. It is only in those cases in which the modification has been comparatively recent and extraordinarily great that we ought to find that generative variability, as it may be called, still present in a high degree. For in this case, the variability will seldom as yet have been fixed by the continued selection of the individuals varying in the required manner and degree, and by the continued rejection of those tending to revert to a former and less modified condition. Subchapter Specific Characters more variable than generic characters. The principle discussed under the last heading may be applied to our present subject. It is notorious that specific characters are more variable than generic. To explain by a simple example what is meant. If in a large genus of plants some species had blue flowers and some had red, the color would be only a specific character, and no one would be surprised at any one of the blue species varying into red, or conversely. But if all the species had blue flowers, the color would become a generic character, and its variation would be a more unusual circumstance. I have chosen this example because the explanation which most naturalists would advance is not here applicable, namely, that specific characters are more variable than generic, because they are taken from parts of less physiological importance than those commonly used for classic genera. I believe this explanation is partly, yet not indirectly true. I shall, however, have to return to this point in the chapter on classification. It would be almost superfluous to adduce evidence in support of the statement that ordinary specific characters are more variable than generic. But with respect to important characters, I have repeatedly noticed in works on natural history that when an author remarks with surprise that some important origin or part, which is generally very constant throughout a large group of species, differs considerably in closely allied species. It is often variable in the individuals of the same species. And this fact shows that a character, which is generally of generic value, when it sinks in value and becomes only of specific value, often becomes variable, though its physiological importance may remain the same. Something of the same kind applies to monstrosities. At least is Geoffrey saint Hilaire apparently entertains no doubt that the more an origin normally differs in the different species of the same group, the more subject it is to anomalies in the individuals. On the ordinary view of each species having been independently created, why should that part of the structure which differs from the same part in other independently created species of the same genus, be more variable than those parts which are closely alike in the several species. 
I do not see that any explanation can be given, but on the view that species are only strongly marked and fixed varieties, we might expect often to find them still continuing to vary in those parts of their structure which have varied within a moderately recent period, and which have thus come to differ. Or to state the case in another manner, the points in which all the species of a genus resemble each other, and in which they differ from allied genera, we called generic characters, and these characters have been attributed to inheritance from a common progenitor, for it can rarely have happened that natural selection will have modified several distinct species, fitted to more or less widely different habits, in exactly the same manner. And as these so-called generic characters have been inherited from before the period where the several species first branched off from the common progenitor, and subsequently have not varied or come to differ in any degree, or only in a slight degree, it is not probable that they should vary at the present day. On the other hand, the points in which species differ from other species of the same genus are called specific characters, and that these specific characters have varied and come to differ since the period when the species branched off from a common progenitor, it is probable that they should still often be in some degree variable, at least more variable than those parts of the organization which have, for a very long period, remained constant. Subchapter Secondary sexual characters variable I think it will be admitted by naturalists, without my entering on details, that secondary sexual characters are highly variable. It will also be admitted that species of the same group differ from each other more widely in their secondary sexual characters than other parts of their organization. Compare, for instance, the amount of difference between the males of gallinaceous birds in which secondary sexual characters are strongly displayed with the amount of difference between the females. The cause of the original variability of these characters is not manifest, but we can see why they should not have been rendered as constant and uniform as others, for they are accumulated by sexual selection, which is less rigid in its action than ordinary selection, as it does not entail death, but only gives fewer offspring to the less favored males. Whatever the cause may be of the variability of secondary sexual characters, as they are highly variable, sexual selection will have had a wide scope for action, and may thus have succeeded in giving to the species of the same group a greater amount of difference in these than in other respects. It is a remarkable fact that the secondary differences between the two sexes of the same species are generally displayed in the very same parts of the organization in which the species of the same genus differ from each other. Of this fact I will give, in illustration, the first two instances which happen to stand on my list. And, as the differences in these cases are of a very unusual nature, the relation can hardly be accidental. The same number of joints in the tarsi is a character common to very large groups of beetles. But, in the engidae, as Westwood has remarked, the number varies greatly, and the number likewise differs in the two sexes of the same species. Again, in the fossorial Hymenoptera, the neuration of the wings is a character of the highest importance, because common to large groups. But in certain genera, the neuration differs in the different species, and likewise in the two sexes of the same species. Sir J. Lubbock has recently remarked that several minute crustaceans offer excellent illustration of this law. In Pontella, 
For instance, the sexual characters are afforded mainly by the anterior antenna and by the fifth pair of legs. The specific differences also are principally given by these organs. This relation has a clear meaning on my view. I look at all the species of the same genus as having as certainly descended from the same progenitor as have the two sexes of any one species. Consequently, whatever part of the structure of the common progenitor or of its early descendants became variable, variations of this part would, it is highly probable, be taken advantage of by natural and sexual selection in order to fit the several places in the economy of nature and likewise to fit the two sexes of the same species to each other or to fit the males to struggle with other males for the possession of the females. Finally, then, I conclude that the greater variability of specific characters or those which distinguish species from species than of generic characters or those which are possessed by all the species that the frequent extreme variability of any part which is developed in a species in an extraordinary manner in comparison with the same part in its congeners and the slight degree of variability in a part however extraordinarily it may be developed if it be common to a whole group of species that the great variability of secondary sexual characters and the great difference in closely allied species that secondary sexual and ordinary specific differences are generally displayed in the same parts of the organization are all principles closely connected together all being mainly due to the species of the same group being the descendants of a common progenitor from whom they have inherited much in common to parts which have recently and largely varied being more likely still to go on varying than parts which have long been inherited and have not varied to natural selection having more or less completely according to the lapse of time overmastered the tendency to reversion and to further variability to sexual selection being less rigid than ordinary selection and to variations in the same parts having been accumulated by natural and sexual selection and thus having been adapted for secondary sexual and for ordinary purposes subchapter distinct species present analogous variations so that a variety of one species often assumes a character proper to an allied species or reverts to some of the characters of an early progenitor. These propositions will be most readily understood by looking to our domestic races. The most distinct breeds of the pigeon, in countries widely apart, present sub-varieties with reversed feathers on the head and with feathers on the feet, characters not possessed by the aboriginal rock pigeon. These, then, are analogous variations in two or more distinct races. The frequent presence of fourteen or even sixteen tail feathers in the powder may be considered as a variation representing the normal structure of another race, the fantail. I presume that no one will doubt that all such analogous variations are due to the several races of the pigeon having inherited from a common parent the same constitution and tendency to variation when acted on by similar unknown influences. In the vegetable kingdom we have a case of analogous variation in the enlarged stems or as commonly called roots of the Swedish turnip and rutabaga, plants which several botanists rank as varieties produced by cultivation from a common parent.
If this be not so, the case will then be one of analogous variation in two so-called distinct species. And to these a third may be added, namely, the common turnip. According to the ordinary view of each species having been independently created, we should have to attribute this similarity in the enlarged stems of these three plants not to the vera causa of community of descent and a consequent tendency to vary in a like manner, but to three separate yet closely related acts of creation. Many similar cases of analogous variation have been observed by Norden and the great Gord family and by various authors in our cereals. Similar cases occurring with insects under natural conditions have lately been discussed with much ability by Mr. Walsh, who has grouped them under his law of equable variability. With pigeons, however, we have another case, namely the occasional appearance in all the breeds of slightly blue birds with two black bars on the wings, white loins, a bar at the end of the tail, with the outer feathers externally etched near the bases with white. As all these marks are characteristic of the parent rock pigeon, I presume that no one will doubt that this is a case of reversion, and not of a new yet analogous variation appearing in the several breeds. We may, I think, confidently come to this conclusion, because, as we have seen, these colored marks are eminently liable to appear in the crossed offspring of two distinct and differently colored breeds. And in this case, there is nothing in the external conditions of life to cause the reappearance of the slightly blue with the several marks, beyond the influence of the mere act of crossing on the laws of inheritance. No doubt, it is a very surprising fact that characters should reappear after having been lost for many, probably for hundreds of generations. But when a breed has been crossed only once by some other breed, the offspring occasionally show for many generations a tendency to revert in character to the foreign breed. Some say for a dozen or even a score of generations. After twelve generations, the proportion of blood, to use a common expression from one ancestor, is only one in 2048. And yet, as we see, it is generally believed that a tendency to reversion is retained by this remnant of foreign blood. In a breed which has not been crossed, but in which both parents have lost some character, which the progenitor possessed the tendency, whether strong or weak, to reproduce the lost character, might, as was formerly remarked, for all that we can see, to the contrary, be transmitted for almost any number of generations. When a character, which has been lost in a breed, reappears after a great number of generations, the most probable hypothesis is, not that one individual suddenly takes after an ancestor removed by some hundred generations, but that in each successive generation the character in question has been lying latent and at last under unknown favorable conditions is developed. With the bar pigeon, for instance, which very rarely produces a blue bird, it is probable that there is a latent tendency in each generation to produce blue plumage. The abstract improbability of such a tendency being transmitted through a vast number of generations is not greater than that of quite useless or rudimentary organs being similarly transmitted. A mere tendency to produce a rudiment is indeed sometimes thus inherited. As all the species of the same genus are supposed to be descended from a common progenitor, it might be expected that they would occasionally vary 
in an analogous manner, so that the varieties of two or more species would resemble each other, or that a variety of one species would resemble in certain characters an other and distinct species, this other species being, according to our view, only a well-marked and permanent variety. But characters exclusively, due to analogous variation, would probably be of an unimportant nature. For the preservation of all functionally important characters will have been determined through natural selection, in accordance with the different habits of the species. It might further be expected that the species of the same genus would occasionally exhibit reversions to long-lost characters. As, however, we do not know the common ancestor of any natural group, we cannot distinguish between reversionary and analogous characters. If, for instance, we did not know that the parent rock pigeon was not feather-footed or turn-crowned, we could not have told whether such characters in our domestic breeds were reversions or only analogous variations. But we might have inferred that the blue color was a case of reversion from the number of the markings, which are correlated with this tint, and which would not probably have all appeared together from simple variation. More especially, we might have inferred this from the blue color and the several marks so often appearing when differently colored breeds are crossed. Hence, although under nature it must generally be left doubtful what cases are reversions to formerly existing characters and what are new but analogous variations, yet we ought, in our theory, sometimes to find the varying offspring of a species assuming characters which are already present in other members of the same group. And this, undoubtedly, is the case. The difficulty in distinguishing variable species is largely due to the varieties mocking, as it were, other species of the same genus. A considerable catalogue, also, could be given in forms of intermediate between two other forms, which themselves can only doubtfully be ranked as species. And this shows, unless all these closely allied forms be considered as independently created species, that they have in varying assumed some of the characters of the others. But the best evidence of analogous variations is afforded by parts or organs which are generally constant in character. But which occasionally varies so as to resemble, in some degree, the same part or organ in an allied species. I have collected a long list of such cases, but here, as before, I lie under the great disadvantage of not being able to give them. I can only repeat that such cases certainly occur, and seem to me very remarkable. I will, however, give one curious and complex case, not indeed as affecting any important character, but from occurring in several species of the same genus, partly under domestication and partly under nature. It is a case almost certainly of reversion. The ass sometimes has very distinct transverse bars on its legs, like those of the legs of a zebra. It has been asserted these are plainness in the foal, and from inquiries which I have made, I believe this to be true. The stripe on the shoulder is sometimes double, and is very variable in length and outline. A white ass, but not an albino, has been described without either spinal or shoulder stripe, and these stripes are sometimes very obscure, or actually quite lost in dark-colored aces. The co-line of Pallas is said to have been seen with a double shoulder stripe. Mr. Blight has seen a species man of the Hemionus with a distinct shoulder stripe, though it properly has none. And I have been informed by Colonel Poole that foals of this species 
are generally striped on the legs and faintly on the shoulder. The quagga, so, so plainly bared like a zebra over the body, is without bars on the legs. But Dr. Gray has figured one specimen with very distinct zebra-like bars on the hooks. With respect to the horse, I have collected cases in England of the spinal stripe in horses of the most distinct breeds and of all colors. Transverse bars on the legs are not rare in duns, mouse duns, and in one instance in a chestnut. A faint shoulder stripe may sometimes be seen in duns, and I have seen a trace in a bay horse. My son made a careful examination and sketch for me of a dun Belgian cart horse with a double stripe on each shoulder and with leg stripes. I have myself seen a dun Devonshire pony and a small dun Welsh pony has been carefully described to me both with three parallel stripes on each shoulder. In the northwest part of India the Kativar breed of horses is so generally striped that, as I hear from Colonel Poole, who examined the breeds for the Indian government, a horse without stripes is not considered as purely bred. The spine is always striped, the legs are generally bared, and the shoulder stripe, which is sometimes double and sometimes treble, is common. The side of the face, moreover, is sometimes striped. The stripes are often plainest in the foal, and sometimes quite disappear in old horses. Colonel Poole has seen both grey and bay cativar horses striped when first foaled. I have also reason to suspect, from information given me by Mr. W. W. Edwards, that with the English race horse the spinal stripe is much commoner in the foal than in the full-grown animal. I have myself recently bred a foal from a bay mare, offspring of a Turkoman horse and a Flemish mare, by a bay English racehorse. This foal, when a week old, was marked on its hinder quarters and on its forehead with numerous very narrow, dark, zebra-like bars, and its legs were feebly striped. All the stripes soon disappeared completely. Without here entering on further details, I may state that I have collected cases of leg and shoulder stripes in horses of very different breeds in various countries, from Britain to eastern China, and from Norway in the north to the Malay archipelago in the south. In all parts of the world, these stripes occur far oftenest in duns and mouse duns. By the term dun, a large range of color is included, from one between brown and black to a close approach to cream color. I am aware that Colonel Hamilton Smith, who has written on this subject, believes that the several breeds of the horse are descended from several aboriginal species, one of which, the dun, was striped, and that the above described appearances are all due to ancient crosses with the dun stock. But this view may be safely rejected, for it is highly improbable that the heavy Belgian cart horse, Welsh ponies, Norwegian cobs, the lanky cattivar race, etc., inhabiting the most distant parts of the world, should have all have been crossed with one supposed aboriginal stock. Now let us turn to the effects of crossing the several species of the horse genus. Roland asserts that the common mule from the ass and horse is particularly apt to have bars on its legs. According to Mr. Goss, in certain parts of the United States, about nine out of ten mules have striped legs. I once saw a mule with its legs so much striped that anyone might have thought it was a hybrid zebra. And Mr. W. C. Martin, in his excellent treatise on the horse, has given a figure of a similar mule. In four colored drawings, which I have seen, of hybrids between the ass and zebra, the legs were much more plainly barred 
than the rest of the body, and in one of them there was a double shoulder stripe. In Lord Morton's famous hybrid from a chestnut mare and male quagga, the hybrid and even the pure offspring subsequently produced from the same mare by a black Arabian sire, were much more plainly bared across the legs than is even the pure quagga. Lastly, and this is another most remarkable case, a hybrid has been figured by Dr. Gray, and he informs me that he knows of a second case, from the ass and the harmonious. And this hybrid, though the ass only occasionally has stripes on his legs, and the harmonious has none, and has not even a shoulder stripe, nevertheless had all four legs bared and had three short shoulder stripes, like those on the Dun Devonshire and the Welsh ponies, and even had some zebra-like stripes on the side of its face. With respect to this last fact, I was so convinced that not even a stripe of color appears from what is commonly called chance, that I was led solely from the occurrence of the face stripes on this hybrid from the ass and harmonious to ask Colonel Poole whether such face stripes ever occurred in the eminently striped cativar breed of horses, and was, as we have seen, answered in the affirmative. What now are we to say to these several facts? We see several distinct species of the horse genus becoming, by simple variation, striped on the legs like a zebra or striped on the shoulders like an ass. In the horse we see this tendency strong whenever a dun tint appears, a tint which approaches to that of the general coloring of the other species of the genus. The appearance of the stripes is not accompanied by any chance of form or by any other new character. We see this tendency to become striped most strongly displayed in hybrids from between several of the most distinct species. Now observe the case of the several breeds of pigeons. They are descended from a pigeon, including two or three subspecies or geographical races of a bluish color with certain bars and other marks. And when any breed assumes by simple variation a bluish tint, these bars and other marks invariably reappear, but without any other change of form or character. When the oldest and truest breeds of various colors are crossed, we see a strong tendency for the blue tint and bars and marks to reappear in the mongrels. I have stated that the most probable hypothesis to account for the reappearance of very ancient characters is that there is a tendency in the young of each successive generation to produce the long-lost character, and that this tendency from unknown causes sometimes prevails. And we have just seen that in several species of the horse genus the stripes are either plainer or appear more commonly in the young than in the old. Call the breeds of pigeons, some of which have bred true for centuries species, and how exactly parallel is the case with that of the species of the horse genus. For myself, I venture confidently to look back thousands on thousands of generations, and I see an animal striped like a zebra, but perhaps otherwise very differently constructed. The common parent of our domestic horse whether or not it be descendant from one or more wild stocks, of the ass, the harmonious, quagga, and zebra. He who believes that each equine species was independently created will, I presume, assert that each species has been created with the tendency to vary, both under nature and under domestication. In this particular manner, so as often to become striped like the other species of the genus, and that each has been created with a strong tendency 
when crossed with species inhabiting distant quarters of the world, to produce hybrids resembling their stripes, not their own parents, but other species of the genus. To admit this view is, as it seems to me, to reject a real for an unreal, or at least for an unknown cause. It makes the works of God a mere mockery and deception. I would almost as soon believe with the old and ignorant cosmogonics that fossil shells had never lived, but had been created in stone so as to mock the shells now living on the seashore. Subchapter Summary Our ignorance of the laws of variation is profound. Not in one case out of a hundred can we pretend to assign any reason why this or that part has varied. But whenever we have the means of instituting a comparison, the same laws appear to have acted in producing the lesser differences between varieties of the same species and the greater differences between species of the same genus. Changed conditions generally induce mere fluctuating variability, but sometimes they cause direct and definite effects, and these may become strongly marked in the course of time, though we have not sufficient evidence on this head. Habit in producing constitutional peculiarities and use in strengthening and disuse in weakening and diminishing organs appear in many cases to have been potent in their effects. Homologous parts tend to vary in the same manner and homologous parts tend to cohere. Modification in hard parts, and in external parts, sometimes affect softer and internal parts. When one part is largely developed, perhaps it tends to draw nourishment from the adjoining parts, and every part of the structure which can be saved without detriment will be saved. Changes of structure at an early age may affect parts subsequently developed, and many cases of correlated variation, the nature of which we are unable to understand, undoubtedly occur. Multiple parts are variable in number and in structure, perhaps arising from such parts not having been closely specialized for any particular function, so that their modifications have not been closely checked by natural selection. It follows probably from this same cause that organic beings, low in the scale, are more variable than those standing higher in the scale, and which have their whole organization more specialized. Rudimentary organs, from being useless, are not regulated by natural selection, and hence are variable. Specific characters, that is, the characters which have come to differ since the several species of the same genus branched off from a common parent, are more variable than generic characters, or those which have long been inherited and have not differed within the same period. In these remarks we have referred to special parts or organs being still variable, because they have recently varied and thus come to differ. But we have also seen in the second chapter that the same principle applies to the whole individual. For in a district where many species of a genus are found, that is, where there has been much former variation and differentiation, or where the manufactory of new specific forms has been actively at work, in that district and among these species, we now find, on an average, most varieties. Secondary sexual characters are highly variable, and such characters differ much in the species of the same group. Variability in the same part of the organization has generally been taken advantage of in giving secondary sexual differences to the two sexes of the same species, and specific differences to the several species of the same genus. Any part or organ developed in an extraordinary size or in an extraordinary manner 
in comparison with the same part or organ in the allied species, must have gone through an extraordinary amount of modification since the genus arose. And thus we can understand why it should often still be variable in a much higher degree than other parts. For variation is a long-continued and slow process, and natural selection will, in such cases, not as yet have had time to overcome the tendency to further variability and to reversion to a less modified state. But when a species with an extraordinarily developed organ has become the parent of many modified descendants, which, on our view, must be a very slow process, requiring a long lapse of time. In this case, natural selection has succeeded in giving a fixed character to the organ, in however extraordinary a manner it may have been developed. Species inheriting nearly the same constitution from a common parent and exposed to similar influences naturally tend to present analogous variations, or these same species may occasionally revert to some of the characters of the ancient progenitors. Although new and important modifications may not arise from reversion and analogous variation, such modifications will add to the beautiful and harmonious diversity of nature. Whatever the cause may be, of each slight difference between the offspring and their parents, and a cause for each must exist, we have reason to believe that it is the steady accumulation of beneficial differences which has given rise to all the more important modifications of structure in relation to the habits of each species. End of chapter 5 Laws of Variation